गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग जिमित सर यस सर सर गुड मॉर्निंग स्टार्ट कर लाइव कर We are waiting for Dr. Nitesh Patel. He has joined, but he has left again. Mm, okay, sir. I'm holding it. And have you talked? And have you talked with Dr. Jay Prakash? Ah, uh, no, sir. I'm not phone banned. I have just switched off. Okay. 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 Okay.
and Dr. Mustafa Rangwala uh, from Ahmedabad and Dr. Jay Prakash Sai from Hyderabad. They will be taking care of the session. So I welcome our resting chairperson here and over to you, Dr. Mustafa sir, for the proceedings of this session. Um, yes. Hello. Good morning, all of you. I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Should we start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can we have the slides for the? Uh, yes. I don't have the slides right now with me for the day. Introduction of the speaker. So, good morning, all of you. How is it? I thank Diakon and the great Bansi Sabu, who is responsible for the Diakon labor here. It's such a career. And on the second, we begin with the topic of none other than Dr. Sabyas said. But Richard T. Sen is going to talk about the bone marrow, interact with the stem cells, and the topic for the lecture is biomarkers or stem cells in diabetes. As far as diabetes, Mellitus is concerned, you know, it's an ongoing advancement in the diabetic research. And of late, we have found that diabetes mellitus makes an impact on the bone marrow. And from the biomarkers of the same cells, we will be able to know about diabetic complications which occur in a diabetic patient. The changes in the myeloid cells, etc., are responsible for the inflammation of the vessels and even atherosclerotic plaques, and how to that help a pharmacological mod modulation of the genetic cells will develop in diabetes complications and its course that will be discussed by Dr. Sabita Sen. Now, a brief introduction of the Dr. Sabita Sen. He happens to be an associate professor, Division of Endocrinology Diabetes, Department of Medicine, George Washington University and Associate Professor, Anatomy and Cell Biology, George Washington University. He has obtained his medical degree from Canada University that obtained the MRCP Ireland and UK specialist in endocrinology from UK and Ireland. He obtained continued his doctoral degree training at National University of Ireland on gene therapy cells. He completed medical and research endocrinology fellowship from National Institute of Health USA. He's certified in internal medicine and endocrinology and is the associate professor of medicine at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. His laboratory currently has four externally funded grants from organizations such as A and H.K. and he has published more than 25 papers in reputed journals and has been serving as an editorial board member of reputable journals such as Metabolic Syndrome and stem cell search therapy. Who better Dr. Sabhi to be able to talk on the topic? Over to Dr. Sabhi please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir, perfect. Perfect, sir. Okay, awesome. Uh, let me try to share my screen. And can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Awesome. Okay. So uh, 
thank you for the kind introduction and can thank you for having me to for inviting me to give the talk uh it's almost 10:30 in the at night in washington dc right now so i'm not in a suit and a tie but uh, i'll try to do the best i can uh so i'm actually a professor in the in department now um uh, and i've moved from anatomy to biochemistry uh and i'm going to give you a journey through of the stem cells in diabetes uh this is several years of work uh so uh a quick introduction of uh, my talk today uh i'm primarily going to talk about endothelial progenitor cells uh these are uh, blood derived stem cells and we are going to talk about their role in as a regenerative tool and also particularly as a biomarker in diabetes so uh just uh, endothelial progenitor cells as the name suggests these are progenitor or stem cells obtained from mononuclear fraction in the blood uh to put it simply it's essentially from the white blood cell fraction of the whole blood uh then we sort cd34 positive cells by magnetic bead so you get a specific type of cells these also have the vascular marks like vegf uh these are usually in the bone marrow and as you can see uh hemopoietic stem cells over a period of time depending on the need of the tissue which is undergoing uh, ischemia these mobilize come to the peripheral blood and then get recruited for uh, vascular regeneration uh so initially they would look like circular cells but over a period of time they change into a cobble shaped uh, endothelial cell now these have a, a produce a slew of uh, growth factors uh and these have uh, the growth factors that are produced obviously gives a, a anti apoptotic and pro proliferative edge uh when transplanted these also can move from one compartment of the body to another depending on the need for the body to regenerate so these are essentially uh, could be a very useful tool for cell wound regeneration for in situations of heart attack and stroke which plague our patients all the time so uh, as i said uh, morphologically they look like uh, a Uh, circular cells at day zero if you start to culture them over a period of time they would come together to form a so called organelle or organoid which is essentially what we call a colony formation unit and that essentially tells you that they can form future blood vessels or a, another organelle so uh, various investigators have shown that these mobilize as i told you and can subsequently uh, assimilate with the host endothelial cell line in a single layer as is the endothelium uh, over a period of time uh, so these are the red cells which are the endothelial progenitors they assimilate with the vascular endothelial cells and this is nothing new this has been in the in our realm of medical literature way from way back in almost 13 year but 17 years now and these cells truly have been used in various uh, forms of regeneration people have tried it to particularly use for remodeling of the heart following ischemia uh, as has been multiple other cellular therapies so uh, these are the various human trials um, i work with dr blosoro uh, who uh, has done multiple studies and if you look at these studies these are particularly mostly in patients with angina critical limb ischemia and so on and though there was a fraction of patients with diabetes these were primarily non diabetic patients however now uh, as you all know that diabetes is becoming a worldwide time bomb and there has been also studies using these cells as a biomarker from way back in 2009 2004 7 and 16 
where people have shown that not only in humans with type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes and in animal models, these cells have an impairment in diabetes. So why don't we use these cells as a biomarker uh, for uh, therapeutic challenges and therapy that we put to our patients? And that's important because we always talk about long-term vascular protective effect of cells. And we all know that we need to manage our patients with cardiovascular risk um, in the prospective. So the question is, what medications do we use? And do they have cardiovascular benefit at a cellular level beyond the serum-based evidence? And for long-term and predictable endothelial function, uh, we and uh, certain other laboratories around the world have proposed certain cell-based assays and CD34 seems to be the most investigated cell type. So we look at the cell number, we look at the colony formation use units as we talked about, gene expression of these cells and migration of these cells so that it can move from the bone marrow to the peripheral uh, tissue site, which is undergoing uh, vascular ischemia or ischemia. Now the other standard methods that we use on a day-to-day -day clinical practice is blood pressure, pulse, lipid profile, fasting insulin, adipokines such as adiponectin particularly is very, seems to be quite important to note vascular uh, or endothelial health, inflammatory cytokines, and I'm going to introduce the last portion of it also today uh, briefly, which is the arterial stiffness measures. And um, I keep talking about the colony formation unit because that has been shown in large clinical trials that it has an inverse proportional to inversely proportional to Framingham risk score. So higher the risk score, lower the colony formation units. And these are not unknown, these were in the literature, as I said, almost 17 years back. It's just that we have not focused on a cellular outcome measure for diabetes, as we have done for various other endocrine diseases, including thyroid cancer and so on and so forth. And also brachial reactivity. So this has a directly po a positive correlation with uh, brachial reactivity and endothelial progenitor cell. What do we mean by brachial reactivity? In other terms, we talk about flow-mediated dilatation. Uh, this is essentially how dilated your vessels can be in response to a hyperemic pressure, which means you inflate the cuff, you produce a, a, a intermittent occlusion, and then quick release, which essentially causes a friction between the two layers of the blood vessel releasing nitric oxide, which subsequently leads to dilatation. And we have known for a while that this dilatation is impaired in diabetes to a, quite a large extent. So in normal patients with non-diabetic patients, it would be up to 14, 15 uh, based on millimeter of, per minute, whereas in diabetes, it's almost half of it so, and the question is, the medications and the intervention that we throw at our patients, does it make any impact on this vascular function or vascular reactivity as we call it? The other uh, modality that has been looked at very recently in so-called in this paper, which has non-invasive estimation of aortic stiffness, this was published in hypertension fairly recently uh, in 2019, as you can see, the gold standard would be to put in a catheter and look at the aortic health, so-called. But you can get very, very similar uh, information if you look at the velocity of the blood at the carotid and the femoral and look at the differentiation of it. And this seems to have a good agreement with the gold standard of invasive aortic pulse pressure, which we normally call the pulse wave uh, velocity. And this has been recommended in clinical trials in daily practice. And this also can be used 
to assess certain patients and has what we call in the United States a CPT code, which means you can actually bill patients against that. Uh, this has been shown that in patients with heart disease, if you have a higher stiffness, that directly leads to increased blood pressure and causes kidney damage and of course back pressure on the, to the heart as well. And it looks like a, a, a machine like this. It's not a cumbersome machine, fairly simple with a software. It actually can be fairly handy to use. And we have shown and others have shown that there is a direct correlation of stiffness with biophysical parameters and blood biochemistry in type two diabetes. So let's now look at some of the medications that we use. Uh, let's start with linagliptin. This is already published. I'm going to go through some of the data that we generated. Uh, so this was done in a so-called vascularly compromised diabetes patient, which has known CKD. As you know, in linagliptin is a drug which does not need to be uh, dose reduced and can be used almost in all stages of CKD. The patients were at baseline with metformin and or placebo uh, or insulin or pl and the placebo, or they got linagliptin. This was a short uh, study for 12 weeks. And we showed this is not uh, unusual that it had some HbA1c reduction. If you look at CD34 cells that had CD184 positive, which indicates its uh, response to SDF1 alpha, so that it shows it's also its mobility. There's a sharp rise within six weeks, as you can see, though it comes down, but never really goes to as low as the placebo. But this rise is kind of important. And this has been, we have been seeing this with other medications as well, that there's a sudden positive response if it actually has to work. Uh, we also see a clear uh, improvement in cellular migration in SDF1 alpha, uh, in a Boyden chamber. And we also see certain changes in gene expression between visit last visit or visit three between the placebo and linagliptin. So this is for gene expression of PCAM on the CD34 cells. This is for VEGF, which is a vascular growth factor. And uh, this is von Willebrand's factor, which is a clotting factor also indicates endothelial health. And as you can see, these gene changes are in a fairly relatively short period literally three months. And as you know, in clinical practice, we hardly see dramatic serum-based changes with these medications, whether they are going to work or not. And this is for the first time we have shown that these actually show a gene changes in a patients with CKD. And as was mentioned in the arterial stiffness, that's where the linagliptin seems to have a direct effect with a much more improvement compared to the placebo in both uh, two measurements that we do with arterial stiffness, which is called augmentation index, and the pulse wave velocity, which is the gold standard. So uh, the highlights of this study would be that the patients with diabetes with CKD had shown some cellular benefit within a short period of time, but obviously longer studies needs to be done to see how a cohort actually responds to it. But the point is you can actually use a cellular method along with non-invasive methods like arterial stiffness in a CKD population to show changes in a relatively short period. Let's look at another set, uh, medication. And I'm sure you have heard in this uh, conference and various others that sodium glucose transporters are the one of the best drugs to use in heart failure and so on. Um, and there are various studies to show that it shows improved myocardial structure, reduced myocardial preload and afterload and so on and renal function improvements as well. And there are studies such as CANVAS, CANVAS-R, MPAREG, which indicates that there is uh, improvement in cardiovascular function with pre-existing CVD uh, abnormalities or defects. So let's see how it pans out in, at a cellular level. Now, before I go further, I should mention that not all SGNT2s are similar. 
The basic difference between empagliflozin and canagliflozin is its receptor affinity. In other words, empagliflozin would have much more SGLT2 affinity uh, compared to say canagliflozin, which has much less affinity for two versus one. This is a difference ratio of 2,500, whereas 250. So on the other hand, remember SGLT2 does not exist in heart and kid in heart and trachea and small intestine. It's the SGLT2 is primarily in the kidney. So if you're looking for a cardiovascular heart effect, should you be choosing a more uh, SGLT2, which has more one effect than the other, though SGLT2 is the primary effect even in canagliflozin. But there are some certain, obviously some certain subtle differences between various uh, molecules. So we did, we used a canagliflozin for our study. A again, this was not a sh long study as would be most clinical trials. Uh, this was a four month study and these were designed short time point studies to be more effective changes to see more effective change at a cellular level rather than a serum level. So if we see a serum level difference even in this period, that's great, but we are hoping to see more a cellular level change. So then there was 15 patients in placebo group and 15 in canagliflozin group and within two months, as you can see, there's a sharp drop in blood pressure. And these p-values that we have shown here is over a period of time. This is not based on either visit two or visit three. There's the entire continuum taken into account. Uh, there was statistical significant difference of systolic blood pressure and also uh, diastolic diff, uh, blood pressure. Uh, what was very interesting was adiponectin. Adiponectin, there was a statistically significant increase of canadally frozen compared to placebo. As you can see, it's steadily rising, whereas adiponectin actually drops. Even the first two months, it was almost parallel to each other. Again, IL-6, though, this not, did, did not reach a statistical difference between the, taking the whole time point into account. There was a clear drop at visit three between placebo and canagliflozin, showing that there was less inflammation with canagliflozin. Migration, uh, similar to linagliptin, there was an in increase, though this does not reach a statistical difference. Uh, CXCR4 did reach a statistical difference. This says DF1 alpha or chemotactic agent receptor. So it actually does respond, the cells respond better with canagliflozin for migration purposes. If you look at the gene expression, I'm not going to go through all of them, but clearly there's an improvement in VEGF, KDR, um, the active of uh, NOS or endothelial nitric oxide synthase and PCAM across the board almost. Um, and you can see certain differences. As I told you before, there seems to be some quick changes in certain genes, not not in all of them, but as you can see, VEGF receptor, which is KDR, shows a very strong uh, upregulation in canagliflozin. Uh, this is a urinary exosome. We wanted to go beyond protein urea changes because protein urea, we did not see a difference between placebo and canagliflozin. So we looked at the exosomes, urinary exosomes. Though none of these actually reached a statistical difference in 16 weeks, but you can see that there is a trend in almost all the parameters that we looked at, such as nephrine, podocalexin. These are podocyte-based exosomes. There was a decrease with canagliflozin in almost all of the parameters, more so with nephrine and podocalexin. So again, this is another modality that we are researching further, whether urine-based exosomes, which are again a fairly non-invasive study, could give you a better indicator in patients with nephropathy who don't always show a difference in urine protein level changes. So canagliflozin compared to lina showed a clear improvement of blood pressure within two months, robust adiponectin rise and decrease in IL-6 within four months, which we did not see in, in linagliptin. Migratory improvements were very similar to both. 
though I would say the migration differences were also a bit more pronounced in linagliptin. But remember, linagliptin was a, in a sicker population. It was in a CKD population, which was not the case in canagliflozin cohort. So you have to keep that into my, into account as well. So our uh, canagliflozin paper has already been published as an abstract. We have also, it's under review at cardiovascular diabetology. So take home messages uh, are that these cells could be used as a robust biomarker for diabetic medications. And you know, this way you can individualize a medicine to a particular patient who has the inclination to know well, whether this medication is actually going to work for me. So uh, the cells are actually important in that way. And it also gives you an assurance of long-term benefit. And this is my uh, place of research, my team, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sargay I think this has shown us a new horizon towards precision medicine as far as genetic biomarkers in diabetes is sending SGLT to inhibitors are... Sir, can you, sir, can you uh, speak loudly, sir? Dr. Mustafa, sir, can you speak a little loudly, sir? Okay. I think I his connection now? is not great because his photo is also not coming, Jimmy. So... You can take over. No, no. Hello. Am I yes, audible Mustafa, now? Mustafa, your voice is not coming clearly. Neither your photo is coming clearly. Okay. No issue. Now you can start. Hello, sir. Am I audible voice. now? Yes, you are audible. And now you please. Okay. So this was great, Dr. Savia Chachi. You have shown us a new horizon, horizon as, far as far as genetic biomarkers in diabetes, diabetes is concerned. And SGLT2 inhibitors are going to show us a new era in this field. Thank Do you. Do we have any questions or we take questions at the end, Bansi? At the end, end sir. Now because both the talks are different. So if any question yeah. is there. And it's late night also for Sebi at you, as you know, so he can be. Bansi, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. even I am there. Bansi, even I am in US. Yes, thank you. So, I, I don't see any questions as far as Dr. Sen is concerned, I think. But this is the new issue, you know, for the Indians to understand for the stem cells and that may be the reason why we may not have many questions. It's just yeah. not about stem cells. Any, any blood derived cells. Pain, cells you know? No, there are somebody asking. Dr. Mustafa, somebody is asking. Yes, please. Let's see. Okay. I don't see the screen, Bansi. Okay, no issue. So, if you don't have any questions, then we can invite. As Viral has joined already? Yes, sir. Yes, Viral, yeah, Viral has joined, but my co chair is not there. No issue. Because in okay. India, it's early morning, so we don't know, you know. So you can introduce Dr. Viral Shah. Yeah, yeah, sure. And if Sabia Sati, if you can stay for a few more minutes, it will be great. So after sure. that, we can help you more. I'll go off the video. Thank, that's okay. Thank you, Dr. Sen. And now Thank we are you. moving forward for another uh, lecture in this session that is by Dr. Viral Shah. And he is going to talk on new advancement in CGM. Dr. Viral Shah, welcome. He is an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics and Director of Bone Metabolism and Diabetes Laboratory at Barbara Davis Center for Diabetes, University of Colorado, Denver. His research focuses on clinical trials of diabetes technologies to improve glycemic control and translational research to understand the effect of diabetes on bone in type 1 diabetes. He has been a principal investigator on number of clinical trials in type 1 diabetes. 
He has published over 20 research articles, including original article invited reviews and editorials in book chapters. And he has served on various leadership roles such as communication director of Diabetes Technology Interest Group for the ADA in 2018-20, steering committee member of the type one diabetes exchange clinical registry and ACE ASAP writing committee. Dr. Viral Shah, the dais is all yours. All right, thank you. Um, before, Viral, uh, before Viral says anything, Mustafa, I think Dr. Mustafa, I need to add something for Viral. I've had the honor of sure. listening to Viral a few times and I'm, I think it's one of the lectures to watch out for and with his, you know, his eloquency and his, you know, making things so simplistically, I think I'm a big fan of Viral, wherever I've heard him. Thank you. Thank and you, Dr. Mustafa. It's a viral for... phenomenon all over the world. Yeah, I uh, kind of a joke Viral. around that I'm not responsible for this coronavirus, so don't blame <laughs> me. Um, <laughs> And thank you, uh, Dr. Mithun, for your kind words. I uh, appreciate that. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, and thank you, Dr. Sabu, as always, uh, putting up like a great conference, great contents. And I hope all the audience have enjoyed the talk, uh, many talks on day one and probably you will enjoy that done day two as well. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, all right. So I'm from Denver. Um, slightly luckier than Dr. Sen because it's a 9 p.m., not 11, uh, because it's a two-hour difference from east to Midwest. Um, so here are my disclosure uh, for today's talk, uh, not probably relevant. Um, what I'm gonna talk today is briefly touch on the historical aspect. And then I will speak about what are the currently available CGMs. And again, I'm more familiar with the US market. Uh, so probably it's quite possible that I may not have mentioned about some CGMs which may be available in Europe or other countries. And then I will speak uh, just briefly about the future, what future look like. Um, so many of you may have seen this slide um, published by me and Satish uh, way back in 2014. Um, and we know that now it's almost 100th anniversary for discovery of insulin by Banting and Best uh, in 1921. Um, and with that insulin discovery, you know, um, yes, it saved a lot of lives of people with diabetes. And at the time, it was more of like insulin dependent diabetes uh, or juvenile diabetes. We call them as type one diabetes right now. But we wanted something um, to quantify glucose so that we can uh, improve the insulin um, delivery system or insulin injections or insulin doses adequately to improve the glycemic control. Now we all learn in a medical school, probably I'm gonna uh, have you guys recall a little bit about the Benedict test, right? When we used to do that, take a urine in a, a test tubes, put a Benedict reaction in that, uh, shake it very well and kind of a warm it up and then it will change in the color. And based on the color, you can just say roughly that this is what the glucose look like. Uh, this is how uh, first 20 years of uh, diabetes management was after the discovery of insulin. The first urine test kit where you just dip that in a urine and it will change the color, which will make life simple at the time was somewhere like an invented in 1945. So it took almost like 25 years to have the first urine dip test, which we don't do nowadays, right? Um, and uh, it took another 20, years to have our first glucose test strip made by the dextro um, streaks in 1965. And when we talk about the glucose test strip, you might be like thinking in your mind that this is with the glucose meter. Now remember that the meter were not invented first, the test strips were invented first. What they used to do is that take out a large drop of blood, put on the top of that, uh, wait for about a minute or two, wash out the blood and then look at the color change. 
um, that was 1965, the first uh, glucose test strip was. And then it was paid with the glucose meter in 1970. So it took another like 30 years to move from a urine glucose to, to glucose meter based uh, glucose monitoring. And then 1999 was a first professional CGM by Medtronic, CGMS. And this is, I think, the word that a lot of people are using. So now remember that the CGMS is kind of a trademark terminology of Medtronic, not all CGM or CGMS system. And they used to, I think they used to call it the CGM gold. I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, something like that. Um, 1999, so another like 20, 30 years to have some kind of a CGM which was not successful at the time because of a lot of other issues. And the 2001 was the first real time continuous glucose monitor, Gluco watch. And very interesting concept, right? You just have a watch. Um, it's a totally non-invasive and based on Roman spectroscopy and some other thermal principle, it will measure the interstitial glucose reflect into you know a small screen. Uh, so you can see here, hopefully you can see my cursor here, but um, that's a watch. And again, you would think that, wow, this is kind of like very innovative, but it didn't uh, pick up the market at the time because of, again, a lot of other issues with this technology. But anyway, uh, in, in a short, 1921 to 2001, almost 80 years plus, we did not have a really best way of estimating glucose translating that into kind of a clinical perspective so that the clinicians and the patient can manage their diabetes better. And now within that 20 years from a 2001 to 2021 now, um, huge change in the way that we are managing diabetes. There is a remarkable improvement in CGM technologies um, in last, particularly one decade, I would say, you know, 10 years has changed everything. This is a famous cartoon. I just took it from a pin wrist. Um, many of you have seen this probably. And they say that the three apples have changed the world. Of course, the Eves, Apple, Newtons, and the Steve Jobs Apple iPhone that every one of us nowadays have an Apple iPhone. And, and it has become a kind of like our part of our organ. You know, People cannot live without iPhones or smartphones in, in general. Similarly, I would put that kind of analog analogy into the CGM is that the CGM has changed the world of diabetes, the diabetes management. Think about the A1C from a DCCT to now, uh, we have focused on A1Cs. We have managed our patients based on the A1Cs and we judged them based on the A1C values, unfortunately, where A1C cannot tell you that how you reached the success. It just can tell you that, you know, it's a success or an, an unsuccess but there are multiple limitations to the A1C. And I'm sure that there are many talks during this Diacare conference has been devoted into the concept of beyond A1C, CGM-based matrix in the management of diabetes, for example, time in range, um, glucose management indicator, GMI, and those kind of a things uh, has come up because of CGM. And CGM can tell us uh, very much details of how we are achieving to that kind of a long-term glycemic control that we surrogately measure with the A1C. Um, not only that, it also provides a 24 by seven snapshot so that um, it can give you really broad view of how the patient is managing diabetes and uh, how we can improve that uh, over time. And also it makes life easy. Um, this is kind of like a finger of someone with type one diabetes having diabetes for 40, 50 years. You know, if you have to poke six times or seven times a day to keep your A1C under seven for 50 years, think about that, how you're gonna, your finger is gonna look like, right? Um, so this is all has changed because of the CGM. So I call this is kind of like a fourth, uh, short of like, uh, like an apple that has changed the world of um, uh, diabetes. Um, so now I'm gonna switch the gear and talk about what CGM technologies are currently available in the market. Um, and broadly, I would divide them uh, into three categories. Number one is the real-time CGM. When I say real-time, it's more about the real-time display rather than the real-time chemical process that is happening within the interstitial fluid. So real-time display, you have a Medtronic systems where the Medtronic Guardian connect 
um, they have a standalone Guardian Connect CGM or the same CGM can, can, can be connected to the insulin pump. They're on pump, which is called a 670G um, in the US market. It's also, I think it's the same name in the Europe market and the India. And now they have a 770G where the pump is slightly different, where they have a Bluetooth within the pump. Um, so that in future iteration, you have to just change the software rather than changing the entire hardware, which is a pump here. Um, and I think in Europe also, there is a 780G, which um, uses the same transmitter with some modification. The another CGM in the US market, which uh, is um, not widely penetrated in the Indian market is the Dexcom. The Dexcom has a three different generation, G4, G5, G6. G4 is available in India, now G5 and G6 is in the US. And we mostly use the G6 nowadays because G4 and G5 are going to be um, phased out over time. Um, again, the standalone CGM, it's only CGM company, so um, they don't manufacture pump, but their CGM can be incorporated uh, or, or partnered with different pumps uh, or different manufacturers that makes the insulin pump, and then you can have a hybrid closed loop system. The um, third one in the real-time display CGM is the Eversense. The Eversense is the only implantable CGM approved by the FDA in the U.S., it's also in the Europe, but in the Europe, it's a 180 days approval, meaning by that six month in US, it's only for a three months at this moment of time. And they are doing a study called as promise study to extend the duration up to 180 days so that the patient has to have only two procedures in a year and then you're done. So just the two pricks, kind of a small nicks inside your skin and um, you will have a continuous glucose monitoring for the entire year, beautiful concept. Um, the second category of CGMs are the intermittently scanned CGM or flash glucose monitoring system, which is a very widely popular throughout the world, including the India. Uh, and famously, um, it's the Libre system, Libre 1 and Libre 2. I'm not sure which generation is available in India, but uh, you can dis differentiate different generation of Libre by their color of scanner. So if it's a gray scanner, then it's a professional version. If it's a black, that's a Libre one. If it's a blue, um, it's a Libre two. And uh, I was just like asking them that, why do you have a different colors? And it's a very funny answer, but they are like, okay, our engineering team decided like, because it has a Bluetooth, we wanted to have a blue color off the scanner. Uh, anyway, uh, so the Libre two is a blue color scanner. Um, now, remember that it, it is also a real-time CGM in a way that it, it does um, calculate glucose value from an interstitial fluid every minute, uh, while other CGMs are doing every five minutes. It's not that they are not doing it every minute. They do it, but then they aggregate the value for that five minutes versus that flash is showing you every minute value. Um, uh, but the display is not a real time. So when I say real time CGM versus the flash CGM, it's mainly about the display function rather than the interstitial glucose uh, process. Then the professional CGM, what it means, or you can call it a blinded CGM, meaning by that you put the CGM in, in your clinic, um, then the patient would use it for a week or two, come back to your clinic, then you download that CGM in your computer um, and then interpret that glucose values and then make some changes in the, in the management of the patients, either changing the medication, changing the dose of insulin, something like that. Um, I think iPro2 was available in India and very widely used before, but again, the cost was prohibitive, but with the Freestyle, I think uh, Freestyle has captured the market uh, in many parts of the world, including India. So I think the Freestyle is commonly used. Um, the Dexcom Pro has just recently available uh, in 2019 in US. Um, Dexcom was only the real time before, but they also now moved into the uh, professional CGM market as well. And this is a good modality for patients with type two diabetes where uh, particularly there's those who are on a less intensive insulin regimen or oral medication where you can just use the professional CGM once in a two months or three months or six months, get the idea, kind of a snapshot of their glucose profile and then make some kind of a meaningful adjustment into their insulin therapy or intensify the insulin therapy or other medications, oral medication. 
Um, each CGM has their own pros and cons. Um, uh, this is my slide that I just give it to the patients because when they have a questions about like, okay, which is best for me? Now, trust me, no matter what CGM has, whatever kind of a like, you know, um, best features, but it's never going to be for everybody because we all are unique. Uh, we have unique needs. And so um, this is kind of a table that I just give it to the patient, give them a time, give them a brochures and let them decide what CGM is going to be best for them. Um, and I will just give you an example. Like for example, the patient with type one or type two diabetes hates the alerts because he cannot get a good sleep at night. It just like keeps beeping. Then I would say Libre is the best system for that patient. Or when there is a issue of a cost, then again, the Libre is the cost effective. Uh, let's say now uh, the patient who is blind totally, uh, I see a few blind patients with type one diabetes or Wolfram syndrome, it's called as Didmore syndrome, diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus and optic atrophy, where the patients are blind. Um, now for those patients, they cannot see anything, right? So the Dexcom is the best because it can integrate with the Apple Siri. So you have to just ask the Siri, hey Siri, what's my glucose? And then Siri will tell you that your glucose is 120 and sugar is flat or it's going up or it's going down. Um, and it really helps a lot of patients. And we published our paper just a few months back that uh, Dexcom Siri feature is really helpful in a blind patients with type one diabetes or different kind of a diabetes. Now the patients who want some kind of a connection with the pump, then the Libre or Eversense are not going to be the good um, CGM for them because both of those kind of a CGMs are not connected with the pump at this moment. Now they do have a landscape where they are going to be uh, integrated with different insulin pumps uh, to have a hybrid closed loop system. But at this moment, it will be Dexcom versus the Medtronic CGM. And each one has their own pro pros and cons. So you provide all the information to the patient and then patient will decide what is the best for them uh, depending on their needs. Uh, but you, the uh, classification that I showed you here, like a real time or a flash or a professional, this is way of classifying the CGM by us. This is not how the FDA looks at. For an FDA perspective, first thing is that whether it's a medical device or not. Now you will be surprised that plastic tongue spatula to examine your throat is considered as a medical device in the US by the US FDA. And it has to go through the US FDA approval. So a lot of things are considered as a medical devices and um, the CGM of course is a medical device. Then they have a lot of different classification based on that. Uh, uh, we have to see that which pathway it fits into and CGM fits into the chemistry or toxicology. So FDA has different divisions. They review the application. And the CGM goes into that uh, chemistry and the toxicology division. And then they divide them into different class, class one, class two, and class three device. For example, tongue spatula that I gave you an example is a class one device where probably there are no much risk, a uh, very low risk device. Um, class two is kind of like where the benefits are far, far, far than the risk. And the class three device are considered as a high risk. And just to give you an example, glucose meters are considered as a class two device uh, versus the insulin pumps are considered as a class three device. Before um, last year, 2019, all CGMs were considered under class three, actually. That means there is a potential risk. Um, and then risk was mainly because you are administering insulin based on those numbers, which may makes you um, uh, hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic. And that's why it, it, it was considered as a high risk category. However, FDA was very clear that we wanted to put um, the CGM into the class two category provided that they meet the accuracy standard. Now the accuracy can be defined in multiple ways. The MARD, I think you have heard this kind of a term in many conferences, it's called a mean absolute relative difference. MARD, it's one way of uh, looking at the CGM accuracy. Lower the number, the, it is better. But the FDA doesn't look at the only MARD. It looks into the accuracy into different zones. Um, the accuracy within the normal glycemic range, hypoglycemic, hyperglycemic, and how much values are within that plus or minus 15% or plus or minus 15 if it's less than 100. And based on that accuracy standard, 
uh, FDA is willing to allow the CGM into these class two category called as interoperable CGM or ICGM. Now there are many, many benefits to the ICGM, which is beyond um, the discussion for this talk, but this category is very exciting. And those who want to know more can read this article it was written by again, um, Satish uh, from my institution um, last year, 2018, sorry, um, end of 2018. Uh, beautifully, nice written edit editorial. Um, it is kind of like a new era when the Dexcom G6 got an approval under the class two, which is ICGM category, interoperable CGM category. It opened up like a new uh, avenues for a lot of different companies to collaborate and move our direction of the future research into kind of a fast pace. Um, now Freestyle Libre 2 is also ICGM, um, just uh, for your information and Eversense is getting the ICGM uh, in a future generation, hopefully. Uh, Medtronic is also working in that direction. So all the CGM companies are moving into that direction. And of course the CGM accuracy has ch uh, changed over time, right? This was the first one I talked that in my first slide, 2001, the Gluco watch. Look at the MARD, the MARD, again, remember that part, higher it's bad, lower it's good, 22%. That means I would not rely on that CGM, it's just the crap. Versus all the CGM which are currently available. Now this slide, my slide is actually one year old. So these numbers have changed a little bit, but all the CGMs are in the range of about 9% MARD. That's really good, uh, one digit MARD. Uh, that means all CGMs are really kind of equal in terms of accuracy. Um, and they are very reliable um, to manage the diabetes. Now, what about the future? What does the future look like? So I'm gonna just give you a very conceptual idea about the future and all the companies that I mentioned earlier are working in the same direction in a, their own way um, to meet this kind of a concept of future. The future should be no calibration, which currently G6, Libre, they do not require calibration at all. And the Medtronic ever since are moving in that direction um, of eliminating calibration. They should have a replaced claim, meaning by that you can do an insulin without doing a confirmatory glucose reading from your uh, capillary or a glucose meter, which again, Dexcom, G6, Libre are approved for that. Um, smaller and smaller devices so that the more patients can use that. Um, the longer lasting, um, the concept is that the smaller device, but that can last for a really long period of time. That means it's a, it's a really valuable asset for many patients. They don't need to change it multiple times. It's a convenience for them. Um, and again, uh, most companies will try to combine the sensor and transmitter and everything into one single piece. Like for example, Libre, it's just one piece. Use that and throw it. That's a disposable, right? Uh, but other CGMs are not at this moment. The Dexcom has a separate sensor, separate transmitter. Eversense has a separate transmitter sensor. Same thing with the Medtronic. So those things will change in future where you will have just one small disc disposable. Um, and then you just use that one time um, and, and uh, it will last for a longer period of time. Also cost effectiveness. That's where the companies are moving to make it a very cheap um, cost effective so that everyone with diabetes can afford it, whether it's type one or type two. Interoperable, where I mentioned about the concept of ICGM by the FDA, meaning by that, once you get the ICGM category, your system can be combined to any other um, FDA approved interoperable devices without going through a different kind of like a clinical trial and FDA approval process, which will speed up the process of getting a newer technology to the patients at, you know, at faster. And it will be also cost effective because the companies don't have to spend millions and millions of dollars in doing a clinical trial and getting an a, uh, approval by the FDA. And also the future is about like combining the pump and CGM, everything into like a one disc, small disc, uh, wearable patch, um, and that will deliver you insulin. It will also sense the glucose values. Everything will be transmitted to your iPhone or a smartphone, and then you can operate everything through that phone. Um, so that, that's, that's how I think the future direction is moving. And I'm just showing you this one slide about different companies. And they are, again, they all have one kind of like a common goal of making it smaller, longer, um, that can deliver both, you know, those kind of things that I, I showed you, that, those concept of future CGM but they each one has that kind of a different technical ways to reach that uh, goal. 
Now, again, the Medtronic, as we know that they have a kind of a 670G hybrid closed loop system right now. They are planning to change their sensor that is under clinical trial. The sensor will be longer lasting. It will be factory calibrated, uh, would probably not require calibration. And then they are planning to have a one site where it can deliver the insulin and it also can sense the glucose value. So it is called as duo. That means combined of sensor and the infusion set. But then you still will have a separate pump. Uh, but then in future, it will be everything uh, in one patch. Uh, similarly, the Dexcom right now, it's uh, doing a clinical trial with the G7. G7 is going to be like a, a size of a single dime, um, small coin, uh, very thin. Uh, again, sensor, transmitter, everything will be in like a one patch. You just use that like a Libre right now and then throw them. We know that the Libre 3 got the CU mark or CE mark, sorry. Uh, that's an European um, analogs to the FDA. Um, it's very small actually disc and uh, as good accuracy as uh, you can think of. Um, and we are really excited that we should get that in US as well in future. Um, and uh, Eversense also has a lot of things in a pipeline. They wanna have one sensor that can last for the entire year, a smaller sensor. And also they are planning to have uh, something kind of customizable, meaning by that you can turn off the alerts, you can turn on the alerts, it can be a flash versus real time um, and those kind of a things so that the patients with type two diabetes who does not require much alerts like type one diabetes can use that without alerts versus type one where you sometimes need those kind of an alerts when your glucose is really low. Um, and it, it will be kind of a customizable for type one versus type two in the future. Not only that, uh, the future is about uh, gamification of our health. Uh, what I mean by that, we all use the game nowadays, right? We, we call it like we used to learn by doing and now we learn by playing. Um, I hardly see anybody who don't play games uh, in, in their phone when you are actually traveling, which we are not traveling due to this corona pandemic. But whenever I travel and I'm sitting at the airport, you see that all these people are sitting and then just like playing something, right? Um, so millions of, it's, it's a billion dollar industry. Uh, a lot of billions of dollars are spent in game. Then why not to use the game for health? So this concept is that, um, and this isn't just the one example of the Metronic uh, inner circle where um, you make your group, like you make a WhatsApp group. Here it's your group of people with type one diabetes or type two diabetes, and you make your target, okay. Um, I'm going to now achieve my time in range of about 80%. Okay. And let's see who is going to achieve that. And whosoever achieves that will earn some kind of a points. Now the points can be used for various things where it can give you, let's say, for example, Amazon gift card um, uh, so that uh, you can buy something from that. So it's a monetary compensation versus it can be just the emotional uh, or uh, or kind of a social um, context where it can say, oh, you did the best out of those 50 individuals in your group, you know, something like that. Those things really helps because uh, competition helps overall, right? Um, and I think the gamification of this um, health in management of type 1 diabetes, I feel like it's going to be very exciting in future. Um, and and uh, hopefully we'll have some clinical trial as well to demonstrate that it, it works very well. With that, I'm gonna um, just conclude my talk um, that the current generation CGM systems are very accurate, uh, very good. Um, the future again looks even brighter than today. And the focus is moving towards a smart, small system and integrated system with the pumps and other kind of a smart pens so that life uh, of people with type one and type two diabetes will be easier in improving their glycemic control. With that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for listening to this talk and your kind attention and happy to take some questions. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Virill. Incidentally, you are talking from Colorado and I am chairing from Chicago. We are just separated by Iowa and Nebraska. And right? one hour of time, yes. <laughs> ah, yeah. It's 11.30 here and maybe you are we are Midwest too, following EST. Yeah. Anyway, so I think with this, we are ending a futuristic session where we talked about precision medicine and 
stem cells as marker of diabetes. And Dr. Viraj Shah gave us an insight in how future is going to be with CGM and various small devices. So this was a wonderful session where we are talking in 2020 of the way life would be in 2021 or maybe 22. Any questions? I don't see any questions on the chat box. Which is good and bad, right? So let good means begin. that I and um, Dr. Sen can probably free early. <laughs> uh, right, because you're talking of future and we are still living in present or maybe in India we are living in past, if not present. Well, I'll be right? happy to take a questions even for a present situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So let me begin so with it. We, we, we so one question not... to... Yes, sorry. Go ahead, Bansi, go. Go ahead, go yeah. ahead. So, you know, now, just now in India, we have uh, Libre, which is available also, along with Libre Pro. The problem with Libre is it's very costly in compared to the Pro, which is available to our country. I mean, the cost is almost two and a half times. And we could not have any extra advantage with using Libre for our patients, with except that the patient can continuously they can monitor their glucose level. But at the same time, when we are not able to empower them, and what as they have to do with the whatever the sugar report which they are they are seeing, uh, I don't find any real advantage of getting the real time CGM for our patients. I mean, and one side the cost is high, and the other time other side it's a real time CGM. So instead of that, the pro is better. Even for our Medtronic uh, product, also we had used for a lot of our patients the pro, and now we were using. And we are more comfortable with Libre Pro. So the cost is one issue. But uh, the other thing which I want to ask you that if the future of this uh, continuous glucose monitoring is all the time is real time, where uh, the pro has to be there. I mean, where you will place that which are type of the patient they should be using the professional continuous glucose monitoring and which are the patient who should be on continuous glucose monitoring real time. Yeah, no, great comment and question. I think I do agree with you 100% um, that the cost plays a major role in deciding about the CGM use. And for Indian situation, makes sense that Libre Pro should be the one that should be used more frequently because of the cost issue. But again, uh, think about that 95% uh, of patients that we see are type 2 diabetes patients. And uh, Type 2 diabetes on oral medication would probably not require real time. So in that situation, Libre Pro, Libre Pro once in a three months or maybe once in a three to four months. Um, I think the cost I heard is about 1,200 rupees um, for a Libre Pro. Um, so I think 1,200 rupees in about three to six months is a very reasonable in my mind. So I think Libre Pro makes sense to be utilized more commonly in India. Now, when should we use professional versus this kind of a real-time CGM? Uh, and I will try to simplify that by saying that whenever you use the intensification of insulin therapy for, to manage diabetes, whether it's a type 1 diabetes, which is 100% of the patients are on intensive insulin therapy, or type 2 diabetes on a multiple daily injection or insulin pump, the advantages are more with real-time continuous glucose monitors. Now, again, I do understand the cost constraint, uh, but the benefits are more with the real time. That's a 5% of your probably 5 to 10% of Indian population that you see. More, uh, again, I may be wrong. I'm just uh, probably making up this data. But the 90% of your type 2 diabetes patients who are just on a basal insulin or just the oral medication, you don't need real time. In that case, the professional CGM is, I think, uh, really good where you can get a glucose snapshot and make some changes in the management. Now, remember one thing is that the major factor in type two diabetes management is the clinical inertia. It takes even a year to two years to change the medication. And this is uh, common everywhere, whether it's in India or US, we are not doing much better than India in terms of you know, A1C. If you look at the T1D exchange registry or SWEET registry, where we are comparing A1C across all developed and developing countries, they are not different. So um, the clinical inertia part, uh, I think the A1C adds that kind of a clinical inertia because you don't know the detailed glucose profile. 
So you are a little bit hesitant in changing the insulin dose or probably you know, advancing the therapies. But with the CGM, I think we can reduce that inertia of optimizing insulin therapy or initiating insulin earlier in patients with type 2 diabetes. So I think I feel that the Libre Pro is the answer for India at this moment. And once you have a more cost-effective CGMs, then you can use the real time. Um, and majority of type 2s can do OK on a professional CGMs. Bansi, I would just like to add one thing that earlier when HbA1c came, we were also, patients were also finding that very costly as compared to the routine FBS, PPBS types. So don't you think that over a period of time in certain patients who are facing complications of brittleness, CGMS is going to be get gradually get more accepted? Yeah, I think I agree with you, Dr. Mustafa. I think Bansi is talking to someone, but... Um... Um, that's, that's gonna be, you know, it, you have to just wait for a time and then, um, things will change, uh, more acceptance. Uh, also the company wants to do their marketing. They want to be, you know, uh, be in the game. And so I think they will also reduce the cost. There will be more competitions and it will become more widespread. So can I have a question? Does time allow? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Please, yeah, please, please. Go ahead, go ahead. Hi, uh, good, good morning, good evening to all. Sorry, I missed your talk, but I just heard your answer about CGM in type 2 diabetes. Uh, could you tell me the evidence for doing a CGM in type 2 diabetic patients on oral hypoglycemic agents? You said that HbA1c does not take the inertia away doing a CGM. I don't think doing a CGM will take the inertia away. So type 2 diabetic up to basal insulin. Then show me the evidence for CGM. If type 2 diabetic is on basal bolus, I can, I can buy it. But up, up to up to OHA plus even a basal insulin, evidence of CGM, no matter whichever CGM you do, on outcomes or on glycemic control. Thank you. Now, sure, Dr. Mukherjee, and I, I appreciate that question. I think it's a, it's a very good question. And you are absolutely right that we do not have any clinical evidences of using CGM to improve glycemic outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes on oral medication. However, uh, Bob Vigreski, I think he's one of the speaker, um, has published uh, a couple of articles around the professional CGM. And he wrote a really beautiful review on professional CGMs for type 2 diabetes. Um, now, the evidence is uh, versus our clinical practice. It's two different things, right? Um, and evidence is you're talking about the values around the mean, meaning by that you collect all hundreds of people, average them together. But now remember that average doesn't tell you any, you know, everything. That's the A1C actually, your average. There are people who are outside that boundary. So in a clinical practice by using the CGM, even though you don't have a clinical evidences, I can guarantee you that it will help you and your patients to see where they are and probably improve their glycemic control. And again, it's up to the patients and doctor how to um, intensify that, right? If you are hesitant to initiate insulin, no matter whether you are doing SMBG or CGM, probably it's not going to help. But if you are not afraid of using insulin early, and now you have a CGM data, I think you will start insulin early. So again, there are no evidences right now, but it doesn't mean that it cannot be useful either. Thank you. Finally, if I may ask a question. And uh, JJ Dao was there and Kalyanda is there. While I was in UK, we used to have a strategy of a three day or a one day CGMS. Um, I think if that, I think uh, Sugar Beets has been launched in US or is about to be launched, which has a uh, one day CGMS. And, you know, I think I've heard in the pipeline it's about to be launched. And type 2 diabetic patients have less glycemic variability than type 1. Uh, is that something that may? be a cost effective or get us the a decent amount of answer to our problems as 4.7 point may not give us the data. Right. Again, that's a great question, Dr. Mithun. And the, the answer to that ultimately, the cost I think does not depend on three days versus seven days. Like think about that the IPRO, IPRO was a three day and still it's a three days, right? And that was the first professional CGM available in the US, Europe, and even in India. The cost was even higher than the Libre, which is 14 day system because the cost depends on multiple things that how they manufacture the life of the sensor, the chemicals inside that, the piece of the plastic and all these things. 
And now think about that the Bluetooth is a costlier than the NFC, which is near field, near field communication. So you have an Apple iPhone and then you do Apple Pay. You just touch that to the screen and it will pay your money, right? It uses the NFC. Now the NFC is a less costlier than the Bluetooth. So Libre uses NFC. That's why they are slightly cost effective than Dexcom or um, iPro, which is a Medtronic version because it's a Bluetooth. And again, you, it depends on how good Bluetooth is. So range in my slide, I showed you like, for example, the Dexcom G6 has a range of about six feet. That's pretty long distance, right? Now for that, you need a really good quality of Bluetooth. It will add the cost. So again, the cost depends on a multiple things. So I don't think that it will be depending on the day. Coming back to your answer, the three days of data is good versus 14 days of data. We don't know that in a type two diabetes population because the correlation of CGM based data to the A1C has been decided mostly in a type one diabetes population. That, ca that came from a replaced BG study data that came from um, um, that uh, racial differences in CGM by Rich Bergenstel and one more study. All studies have been conducted in type one with, I think there is a one arm of very small type two so we don't know that. And you are absolutely right that having a less glycemic variability, it is quite possible that the three days of data may be good. Again, I, I don't know that part, but somebody needs to do that study. Um, I think with this, it's better to conclude because we definitely run short in time. We have the whole day ahead of us. Thanks, Dr. Virel Shah and talk. Thanks, Dr. Sen, for a wonderful exposition of the subjects coming to you. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for having us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. We had a wonderful morning session here. And I thank to our reporter, Dr. Nilas Patel, who though he initially joined. And very, very thankful to our team chairperson, Dr. Mustafa Rangwala, who has conducted the session very well. And thanks to our both the wonderful international speakers for their excellent talk. And uh, move forward, we are coming to the next symposium of the day, that is DPP4 symposium. And we all know they have now become the integral part of our type 2 diabetes management. And to start this proceedings of the session, I would like to invite our reporter, Dr. Sushil Patel. He is a diabetologist from Vadodara. And I would like to invite him and to, the, to start the session and invite our chairperson and take the proceedings of the session. Over to you, Dr. Sushil Patel. Thank you, Jimit Bhai. And uh, thank you to Dr. Bansi Sabu, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it was a wonderful session by our international speaker. And now we are moving forward to DPP for Inhibitor Symposium. For that, we have the eminent speakers from the country. And uh, uh, we have the eminent and uh, learned chairperson also from the Gujarat. So I would like to invite Dr. Bhavesh Patel, diabetologist from the Modasa, and Dr. Diran Patel, diabetologist from the Surat to chair the session and uh, uh, introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Sushil. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you, Dr. Bansi Sabu, sir, for giving me an opportunity to share the beautiful session on this DPP4 symposia. And today we think that DPP-4 inhibitor drugs in the field of diabetology, as you are aware that every guideline says that early and intensive treatment is a key role of diabetes management in Indian diabetic phenotype. Sorry to interrupt you, my call is coming, that's why. Uh, but right now, today's era of diabetes management always says that intensive and early treatment of diabetes will improve the further mortality and morbidity. And for that, every guideline also suggests that the early initial combination therapy will work to reduce the further mortality and morbidity. And for today's our first talk, I would like to invite Dr. K.K. Gangopadhyay from Kolkata. 
He is a renowned endocrinologist and has practiced extensively in India and abroad. After finishing his MD in medicine in India, the Gangopadhyay went to complete his MRCP from London and CGST in diabetes and endocrinology. He worked for 12 years in UK, of which the last two years were a consultant in diabetes in University Hospital from Birmingham. He has won many awards in UK for papers and presentation, including Owen Ward Award, Stephen Whitaker Prize, Nasi Prize, Society of Endocrinology Prize. And he has published over 40 papers, including international journals like British Medical Journal, Lancet, Diabetes Endocrinology, and Clinical Endocrinology and Clinical Medicine. He has been an investigator in multiple international trials. He has been the scientific secretary for Diabetes India and ITACOM, and he has been an overseas invited speaker to several countries, including Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Qatar, and Nepal. I welcome you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, sir. Now, I would like to share my screen, if I may. Okay, I hope my slide is visible. Yes, your slide is visible. Okay, so thank you, Chairperson, sir, once again. Now, I put uh, my timer on here so that uh, moment 20 minutes are up, it will, um, a loud bleep will come in. So I will stop then and there, whichever slide I am on. So that will make uh, the job of the moderators easy. Now, Dr. Vansi Sabu has given a very high um, you know, a lot of words in this topic. So you can see the topic is in front of you. But actually, if you simplify it, the basic question is, Sir, aap konsa DPP4 inhibitor likhte ho? Because this is one of the common questions asked in CMEs. Whenever I'm speaking on DPP4 inhibitors, one person will always ask, you have talked about DPP4, just tell me which one you are writing or which one you would write. Just one. So, I think it's a very good way to put this as a topic as well. So whenever this question is asked, I ask the question back. I said, who is the best opening batsman? Because currently a series is going on between India and Australia. So when I ask this, the automatic question is, is it a test match? Is it a 50-50 match? Is it a uh, T20 match? Because if it's a test match, then Gavaskar has got a bigger circle. That means he's a better uh, opening batsman than the other two. If it's a T20, then say what? If it's a T50, then Tendulkar. So it depends on what match you're talking about. So I'm going to put all these five most commonly used um, uh, DPP4 inhibitors, and I'm going to put circles on top of them. The bigger the circle, the better it is as compared to others. So there's no ambiguity, ladies and gentlemen, and this is purely, solely, and wholly my view, viewpoint only. You may, you may differ from me, uh, of course, um, uh, but this is my viewpoint only based on the evidence which I'm going to cite. So DPP-4 inhibition. So if you look at the DPP-4 inhibition, so the citagliptin has got a maximum uh, DPP-4 inhibition of about 97%. Will that even achieve 95% on twice daily dosage? Um, 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 and I think the uh, linagliptin is about 80%. But I think anything over 70% does the trick and more than 80% definitely does the trick. So overall, uh, and if you look at uh, tenindigliptin, um, it loses its, um, um, its DPP-4 uh, inhibition at close to 24 hours. It is the least amongst the lot. So if you look at DPP-4 um, inhibition, uh, this is wrong, not selectivity, it's inhibition, I would think um, um, tenindigliptin has a sm smaller circle and Sita Vilda has got the bigger circle and Lina coming just after that. So now, newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes with marked hyperglycemia. I noted the chairperson sir talking about newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. So I put forward this question to two audiences in a CME in Kolkata and in Hyderabad. So if we have 52-year-old male executive, frequent traveler, meaning therefore that erratic lifestyle, erratic food habits, prone to hypoglycemia, therefore, newly diagnosed diabetes, he does not have much in way of osmotic symptoms, only one kilogram of weight loss. So if anybody is having osmotic symptoms, catabolic state, insulin is the answer full stop. But short of that, 
Have you got any evidence with other agents? So HB1C 10% passing to 50. So I offered these sort of choices, SU metformin, DPP4 metformin and insulin. And I think uh, the, the white uh, bar is from Hyderabad and the yellow one is from Kolkata. Majority of the, uh, of the physicians and doctors present in the meeting opted for DPP4 metformin combination, which is becoming more commoner as the initial choice because there is much less hypoglycemia. And if you look at the evidence, albeit uh, open level arms of patients who have got HB1C 10% or above, with the DPP4 metformin combination, you can achieve a very sharp and marked drop, not sharp, marked drop in um, uh, the HB1C. So this looks too good to be true, but this is duplicated in almost all the DPP4 inhibitors. I don't have much data with tenilegriptin, but this, these are the others which show marked drop, drop in HB1C. So if you look at newly diagnosed diabetes with marked hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, Apart from tenil gliptin, all the gliptins share the same size bubble, meaning that they are all equal in re reducing the DPP for uh, reducing the HB1C. Ramadan, um, best test for an agent to prove that it does not cause much in way of hypoglycemia. Maximal studies is with bildagliptin. You can see the number of studies. The number of patients is higher with citagliptin, and uh, most of the cases. They're compared with sulfonuria, showing that the hypoglycemia overall is less as compared to sulfonuria in a Ramadan setting. So I think the maximal evidence, therefore, is with Sita and Vilda. I put a bigger circle for Vilda because of number of studies are more. So QTC. So we know that QTC prolongation leads to dorsal dysphonies and multiple drugs have been discontinued um, in the last decade due to this QTC effect. Now, mind you, they were not discontinued straight away. They have been used for quite a few months or years and killed several people before the authorities came to know that these drugs were the one which was causing the QTC prolongation. So it was only then that uh, this guidance had come into place, mandating all the anti-diabetic um, uh, um, agent producing um, um, companies that first you prove that it is QTC safe, then you say, uh, then you uh, launch, then you, you'll be able to market it. it. There's no point marketing it and then getting data that QTC is prolonged and you're killing people, then stopping the drug. First prove it. So in that proof, where uh, patients are compared with moxifloxacin, where, where the, the agent is compared with moxifloxacin, which causes QTC prolongation. So if I go back, so there are three groups. One is the drug at the therapeutic dose. One is supratherapeutic dose. And one is moxifloxacin and one is placebo. Why you need a supratherapeutic? If by mistake, I take double the dose. If I've got CKD and the drug builds up, if I am prone to hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia itself causes QTC prolongation. If I'm more prone to um, hypoglycemia, the drug at the therapeutic uh, level itself might cause QTC prolongation. So therefore, you need a supra-therapeutic dose. There is no place for this argument. No, it does not cause at the usual therapeutic dose. It only causes at supra-therapeutic. No, that is incorrect. Because you need to prove its safety at supra-therapeutic level as well for the reasons I have mentioned to you. So here, if you see in the tenilocriptin arm, the moxifloxacin, the outer confidence interval, if it crosses 10, it's unsafe. So in the in the 10 elegant, in 160, it all of it crossed 10. And in the 40 milligram, actually in the females, it did cross 10. So therefore, they will find it difficult um, in the USA to, to, to counter this because they, when, you, when you're planning for a CBOT, they will also ask for this. But all the other DPP4 inhibitors have had studies with the QTC at anywhere between five to 10, 20 times the dose in case of linagliptin, it was 100 milligram, that is 20 times the dose, and still it did not cause any QTC prolongation. However, I put a bigger circle uh, for linagliptin because with the Sita and Vilda, the data is not that crystal clear. There were one or two areas where there was slight, slight QTC prolongation after a certain interval, but with linagliptin, it seems to be a clean slate. 
So overall, all the DPP4 inhibitors, barring tenaniglipine, seems not to cause acute in trouble. With the CVOT data, we are all um, used to seeing this, and I'm not going to bore you with this. I've just included omariglipin. This is MI, this is stroke, this is MI and stroke, and this is CV death. So you see, all of them are quite close to the midline. And the four main ones, if you look, um, um, uh, the TCOS and the Carmelina um, um, on the right and Sevatimian and Examine on the left. Now, if you look, they are all in the midline. So overall, DPP-4 inhibitors are CV neutral. Uh, as compared to Carmelina and TCOS, I think the TCOS had 100% patients with CVD, whereas Carmelina, in this case, Linagliptin, 57% with CVD, and you have got higher patients, higher number of patients with EGFR less than 60. However, heart failure at baseline, the number of patients were more, and the total number of patients was more with the TCOS, and TCOS had patients from India, whereas Carmelina did not. This was the basic difference. So if I put DPP-4 inhibitors and CITA and CVOT, I think CITA and LINA have the same size bubble because they show neutrality. Heart failure. Now, if you compare all of them together, if you make a meta-analysis and a forest plot, the seva is the outlier, but all of them are in the center. Otherwise, even if you take out omariglyptin, it stays in the center. So as I said, saxagliptin, a 27% increase in heart failure. But if you look at the others, TCOS, um, it's right in the center, and Carmelina is actually favoring uh, linagliptin, but numerically only, statistically not significant, meaning, therefore, that hospitalization to heart failure is not increased with citagliptin and linagliptin. We don't have a CV outcome data with linagliptin to say the same, and with saxagliptin, there is increase in heart failure. And this is the data with the linagliptin, and the upper one shows hospitalization in heart failures with no history of heart failure. The lines are almost kissing each other. And hospitalization in heart failure with history of heart failure at baseline, actually the lines are almost the same. In fact, numerically favoring the lungiptin. So assure, um, uh, assuring us of their safety. So I think I put equal size bubbles for lina and CITA in DPP-4 inhibitors and hospitalization due to heart failure. Now, inpatient use of DPP-4, I have been using uh, DPP-4 and inpatient. My first choice always remains basal bolus insulin, but there are patients where there is just mild hyperglycemia where I can manage with a DPP-4 and basal only, and I've done so successfully, but there is data to support it. So the two DPP-4 molecules which have got inpatient data is citagliptin, linagliptin, the majority studies and there is a smaller um, evidence with saxagliptin. Now, this is the data with cetagliptin, where you have 90, uh, 90 patients admitted to medicine and surgery, randomized to cetagliptin, cetagliptin plus basal and basal bolus, showing that the cetagliptin was safe, less hypoglycemia, and less amount of insulin needed. With linagliptin, now in the last year, we have got data coming up. This is the Lina search study, which is a real world data. And this is a good study, in my opinion, because they use patients um, uh, who were on linagliptin and basal insulin and compared it with basal bolus. Of course, the patients who were on linagliptin plus a basal insulin were allowed to have supplemental rapid acting insulin if the blood sugars went up. So it's not just they were giving lina and basal only and no other insulin was added. That isn't the case. But basal bolus mandated that they will be on a basal insulin and um, two or three times of basal. The good thing about this study is that they were propensity matched for multiple factors, including duration of diabetes, age, sex, smoking, alcohol, um, presence of snow, heart, uh, stroke, heart failure, everything else. So I, that's why I think this makes us, this study quite good. And if you look at it, patients after post propensity matching linagliptin and basal bolus, percentage of patients who had hyperglycemia more than 200 was statistically not any different. Total insulin dose was actually much less uh, with the uh, linagliptin, so about 10 units less uh, with the uh, linagliptin basal dose. And importantly, the number of hypoglycemic events 
was less. And that was statistically very significant. You can look 21 events here and 12 events here, and that included patients with um, uh, blood sugars less than 54 and less than, uh, yeah, less than 54 was not statistically significant. My apologies, less than 70 uh, was statistically significant. So you can achieve equivalent glycemic control with less hypoglycemia, less number of breaks, less number of insulin requirements. And this was the real world data. And this is a randomized clinical trial using linagliptin compared to basal bolus. Here, it showed that patients who had blood sugars more than 200, for them, basal bolus seemed to do better than linagliptin. There was slightly more uh, higher blood sugar overall. But if, if it is less than 200, then I think there is no difference. Importantly, uh, the hypoglycemia rate was much lower, as you can see here, with two cases as compared to 14 with the basal bolus. So all in all, we have got previously, if, we had, if I had wanted to show this slide in the beginning of 2019, I would have had to give a much bigger circle to citagliptin and smaller circle to linagliptin. But in the last one year, we have had more data coming up with linagliptin. So I think because the data is more recent, and there is both real world and RCT evidence with propensity matching, I've given a slightly bigger uh, circle for linagliptin and DPP-4 inhibitors as in patients. You have got very small data with saxagliptin, almost no data with tenilagliptin. As, as far as the CKD is concerned, in the um, CVOT data, um, Carmelina has got um, the most of the patients um, uh, with um, CKD, um, 45 to 60. And you can see here, with almost all of them, the CVOT, the CV neutrality is further proven even in patients who have got advanced CKD. In the Carmelina, there was a clear time to secondary kidney outcome um, data um, given to us as well. And that showed that the hazard ratio was 1.04. So the secondary kidney outcome here, you can read yourself, is the first sustained incidental disease. So many of us thought that there might be benefit, but actually there wasn't. So just reducing albuminuria, which all the DPP-4 inhibitors does, doesn't mean that it is going to improve or arrest the progression of EGFR. It does not, but at least it does not worsen it. So it's almost staying in the center. So I have put a bigger circle for linagliptin, although citagliptin has got a lot of data with hemodialysis patients as well. The only reason why a bigger circle is because you don't have to make those adjustments with the liptin, whereas you have to make it for the others except the liptin. So for liver dysfunction, if I give you a, 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 a simple case, which you and me saying day in, day out, fatty liver, what are the options we have? Um, and we know that non-alcoholic fat, fatty liver disease is, has a very high prevalence in our patients with diabetes. There is maximal data with citagliptin, um, with uh, human data with citagliptin in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. However, what is lacking is histological proof, which we don't have any with any of the DPP-4 inhibitors to that extent as we would want to say that it causes any benefit. But we have got more data with citagliptin in patients uh, showing reduction of the liver enzymes. The other DPP-4 inhibitors also have got some data uh, with um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But I think here uh, is important to mention that almost all of them can be used in patients with impaired uh, liver function, barring severe, that is stage uh, C, child score, uh, 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 chronic liver disease, where insulin is the answer. And of course, vildagliptin should not be used um, in patients with hepatic impairment. So I think here I would give a slightly bigger circle to citagliptin because it has got a lot of data. So coming to the last bit, the cost, I think Tenali takes the cake here. Ours is a poor country. We have to um, think about the cost as well. Although in my opinion, my richest patient asked for the cheapest drugs more than the poorest patients um, um, asking for it. But still, Cost is an issue in our country, and we have to honor that. And in that respect, I think tenilagliptin has got the biggest circle, followed by vildagliptin. My last slide, ladies and gentlemen, is therefore that 
you have to tailor your choice depending on the patient in front of you. Just asking which DPP4 won't get an answer out of me. Tell me the situation, you will get the answer out of me. And that is what it should be. So Chairperson, sir, I've got exactly one minute, 40 seconds left, and I'm stopping now. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for wonderful talk. You made the choice of gliptins in the management of diabetes for intensive management of diabetes. Tremendous uh, talk delivered by you, sir. Uh, now we are taking the question answer session in the last after the completing three lectures. Now I would like to request Dr. JJ Mukherjee, sir. He is a MBBS from Jipmar Pandey, DNB Medicine. MD PGI Chandigarh, MRCP, FRCP from London. He is endocrine training at St. Bartholomew Hospital, London. He is a senior consultant, general medicine, endocrinology and diabetes at National University Hospital, Singapore. More than 55 publications in high impact peer reviewed journals. More than 15 chapters in various textbooks and he is associate editor in Diapedia and associate editor in general of neuroendocrinology. I welcome you, sir, Mukherjee, sir. Over to you, sir, for next talk. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, all of uh, those who are listening to me. And Bansi, I can see you. Thank you once again for giving me the topic which is close to my heart, which is combination therapy. I spoke on this recently in the RSSDI as well. But this time, the combination has been fixed for me. So I have to speak on a fixed combination. And that combination is of an SGLT2 and a DP4 inhibitor. The topic given to me is a timely step for holistic risk modification in type 2 diabetes, role of SGLT2 DP4. I would slightly disagree with that in the sense that holistic medicine of diabetes is not just glycemic control. When we talk about uh, DPP4 SGLT2 combination, we are talking primarily of glycemic control, maybe a little bit about preventing complications but holistic management of diabetes is much more than glycemic control. You need to control your blood pressure. Uh, SGLT2s give a four millimeter drop, but you need antihypertensives. You need to control your lipids. You need uh, habits to be modified. You need weight management. So all that together is holistic management, which requires team effort, which requires a doctor, a diabetic nurse, educator, trainers, motivators, and dietitian. So I think I will stick to the topic of a timely step for not holistic risk modification, but risk modification in type 2 diabetes mellitus. And this is the holy grail of type 2 diabetes. We have seen this slide in various modified forms in various meetings that when diabetes develops, the insulin resistance is very well established far early, is basically the failing of beta cell, beta cell function not being able to keep up with the insulin resistance, which triggers uh, the onset of diabetes, sugars going above certain value. We define diabetes by certain sugar values, which are very arbitrary, my friends. But that's another debate. And what happens now, if you see, is the beta cell function keeps going down. And that is the reason why the, the, the beta cell is not able to secrete enough insulin to counteract the amount of insulin required to get the sugars under control during given that degree of insulin resistance. Here, it would seem that about 50 to 60 percent of beta cell function is still remaining. But that's probably not true. Uh, there are enough studies, the UK period, the epidemiological data, there are some uh, clamp studies which have shown that you lose something like 50 to 80 percent of your beta cell function by the time diabetes is being diagnosed. We know very well that if you can control diabetes very well early on, you get immense benefits. I will not bore you with this slide. This is the UK period slide. I think all these numbers should be by heart to all of us who are practicing diabetologists, what happens in the initial part of UK PDS and what happens in the 10 year follow up of UK PDS. Now, the other side of the coin was shown by uh, Dr. Kamlesh Kunti et al. A very nice study, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, statistical juggling, but very nice, which shows that if in the first six months, for six to 12 months, if you can get your HbA1c below 7% after diagnosis, as opposed to getting it not that bad, you see, the upper graph is not that bad, 7.2, 7.3, which we are very happy with in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. A new onset diabetes, the case of Dr. Kalyan Ngopad, they showed HbA1c 10%. Generally, in real life, what would happen is you would get less than 7% in two, three, four years' time. But look what happens if you get that HbA1c control in the first 12 months and then continue following the patient up for 50 years and maintain that. You have to maintain that. Look at the immense benefits you get at 5.3 years, significantly increased risk of all kinds of cardiovascular events, 
in the group which failed to maintain HbA1c below 7%, especially in the first 12 months. So the difference is not huge, but the cardiovascular events are massive in the people who do not get HbA1c below 7%. And this, unfortunately, is a scenario in our in our country, not in our country, everywhere. I'm just showing the Southeast Asia data part from the Discover Study Program. Yeah, majority of the patients in this were from India. And if you see, less than one in six had HbA once of less than 7%. So if you go back to this slide and you come to this slide, you, you know where we are. Unfortunately, we are nowhere near managing diabetes, type 2 diabetes, the way we should. We fail to get our patients under glycemic control, not only all throughout, early on. And early glycemic control is very, very important. I've shown you two slides. There are multiple such data available, which I can bore you with over the next 30 minutes. So I feel very strongly, this was my oration in this year in RSSDI, that it's high time that we move from treat to failure guideline-based sequential add-on step-up approach towards an effective treatment strategy, which includes combination therapy. Multiple pathophysiology well, defects are target, achieve good glycemic control early, prevent and delay the inexorable decline of, uh, of the beta cell function. A lot of people who say this is not known, that is not known, any pata. UK PDS was a 20 year old study and then another 10 year follow up. Do you want to wait for 30 years? I mean, it's like, like, like finding a nice girlfriend you want to marry, but you want to see how she will do with 30 years' time. So we have enough evidence to carry on. Just start. So we need to start combination therapy early on. So I'm, I'm giving you a case here now. Just Dr. Gongo Pante. I said, not so bad. He's 49 years old. He's got type 2 diabetes for two years on metformin, two grams per day, usual. Amlodipine, Delmisata, and Rosuvastatin. This is what I said holistic management is all about. Get blood pressure control, get lipid control. For three months, got 500 BD. HbA1c did not get down. It was 8.3. See, now, see how, how we treat to failure. And this is everybody's day-to-day <clears throat> -day clinical experience. That when HbA1c was 8.3 on metformin 500 BD, somebody thought of making it one gram BD. And then that continued for another six months. Remember the graph I showed you. If the first 12 months you get your HbA1c well controlled, you reap immense benefits. Look at what happened to this gentleman. Already two years have gone by, 8.3 on 500 BD, 8.3 uh, 8 uh, uh, on 1000 BD. And now <clears throat> when he comes to you, he's 8.6 HbA1c. LDL is still not controlled, which is sad. LDL should be controlled in every type of diabetic patient. It's not very difficult to control. So what would you do? These are the guidelines say. ADA is a treat to failure guideline. Step up approach, start metformin, wait for three months, start met three months, set a second drug, third drug. But thankfully, thankfully in 2019 and 2020, they have woken up and they have now allowed you to <clears throat> use combination therapy if HbA1 is more than 1.5% above. So this gentleman, HbA1c of 8.3 at presentation, you would aim for 6.5, should have been in combination therapy from day one. Why did we wait for two years? This is what, this is what we do in our clinics, day in, day out, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm trying to push you to start combination therapy from day one. AS, AAC is a slightly better grid, which starts allows you to use HbA, combination therapy with HbA1c more than 7.5. RSDI ESI guideline 2020, SABU, is basically reflecting what the ADA 2021 guideline says. It says more than HB once more than 1.5. Did not take the ACE AAC guideline. This is one slide I will show you. I don't want you to see uh, re read it. I don't want you to go through it. This is uh, Dr. Shubira and I. We have uh, presented this, published this. This is the grid that we think we should be doing in managing type 2 diabetes. When you first see a type 2 diabetic, subtype to diabetic, if it's a LADA, if it's MOTI, then of course you're not going to use all this kind of therapy. Then you set your HbA1c target, mostly 6.5 for younger people. Elderly, 8, 8.5, they don't think of too hard combination. Look for specific indications, contraindications for a drug. Then comes economic consideration, and then comes combination therapy. We strongly believe that even with HbA1c of 6.5 to 7.4, you should be using dual therapy, because not only are you dealing with glycemic control, but you're also dealing with the extra glycemic benefits, holistic management, which I will come to you when I show you the combination therapy. So for this gentleman, who's now 8.6, who already missed the bus for two years, come to you with metformin 1 gram BD, what will you start? You could start sulfonylurea, you could start glenide, TZD, alpha glucose inhibitor, you could think of insulin, you could think of the newer molecules, GLP-1, DPP-4, or SGLT-2 inhibitors. Now, this is the commonest combination. You like it or not like it, ladies and gentlemen. This is the commonest combination therapy used worldwide. Not only India, 
we blame that in India we are poor, so we add a sulfonylurea. No. Sulfonylurea is still the commonest second line drug in UK. Sulfonylurea is still the commonest second line drug in USA. Sulfonylurea does not target any of the ma eight major pathophysiological defects of type 2 diabetes. Logically thinking, it does not change the progression, the disease profile of a type 2 diabetic. All it's doing is it's getting the beta cell to squeeze out a little bit extra insulin as the blood sugar goes up and it's sugar independent. So there is a risk for hypoglycemia and weight gain. But cost is an issue as Dr. Gongo Fadai stressed a few times. So if your patient cannot afford, don't discuss the newer molecules. But having said that, those of us who are working in the, in the tier one, tier two cities, don't get carried away by the fact that the patient in front of you, you should be using something which is cheap, not required. If patient can afford, then you can move on. Affordability is not there. Metformin, SU, TZD, human insulin, period. Please use those. Tino2, use these. But remember, Tino2 controlled blood pressure, controlled uh, lipids, got them off smoking, got them to exercise 30 minutes. That's holistic management of diabetes. Just by giving metformin, sulfonylurea, that's what we are doing in India. That's why you saw a dismal uh, performance. We get less than 17% below HbA1c of 7%. If you use sulfonylurea, I will not go into more details. There will be issues with regards to sulfonylurea failure. We all know the ADOPT study where they compared metformin, SU, and rosiglitazone, and they showed how quickly the sulfonylurea was failing when you were using sulfonylurea with metformin. That's a very classic study. If any study you want to see about failure rate of OHA when they added to metformin, I think go back and dig to your 2006 ADOPT paper. You will get nice, nice uh, details. So if affordability is not such a big issue, 40 to 60% in, in UK and US. In India, take your pick. I don't have, I have not done a study, but even if 10 to 20 to 30% of your type 2 diabetic patients can afford, that's a huge population. And I think they are missing out. They're not being offered these new, newer, newer medications. So if cost is not a big issue, weight neutrality, weight loss, less hypoglycemia, extra glycemic benefits, CBOT data you want, then in 2021, why in 2021, in 2014, 2016, 2018, we should be thinking of starting combination therapy with metformin and one of these, DPP-4, GLP-1, SGLT-2 inhibitor. I will take GLP-1 out for today's discussion because it's an injectable and it's super expensive. So worldwide, the use is not that great. It's a very good molecule. If you ask me, that's the best second line agent after metformin, but because of injectability and cost, it goes out. So to, we are now left with DPP-4 and SGLT-2 to add on to metformin in a person in whom when I say affordability, you're not talking about buying a jet here. You're not, you're not talking about buying a Mercedes Benz here. It's not that expensive too. So affordability, if it is there, then you're thinking of DPP-4 and SGLT2 inhibitor. And now I'm going to talk about combining these two. Dr. Gangopadhyay discussed a lot about DPP-4. Somebody with HbA1c of 10%, 3% drop, yes, uh, in some randomized controlled trials. But if somebody with 10% on metformin, you need to do combination therapy. So if you combine, when you combine combination therapy, you should use drugs with different methods of action so that they can complement each other. And this slide shows you very nicely how an SGLT2 and a DPP-4 inhibitor complement each other. SGLT2 is insulin independent, DPP-4 is insulin dependent, causes glucose dependent insulin release. One works on the kidney, one works on the intestine. One causes uh, glycosuria, one reduces glycosuria. The biggest combination benefit, I think, is with regards to glucagon. SGLT2 is increasing glucagon, whereas DPP-4 is reducing glucagon. And then with SGLT2 inhibitors, you have all the cardiovascular benefits. I don't know whether you've already had an SGLT2 talk in the meeting so far. I did not attend yesterday. But if you have not, then I will show you some of the slides. And if you've if you attended, you know all the cardiovascular and renal benefits with SGLT2 inhibitors. And Dr. Gogopadha so nicely showed you that DPP-4 inhibitors are cardiac neutral and maybe a little bit of beneficial effect in kidney with regards to albuminuria with linagliptin and randomized control trial and with saxagliptin and, and sitagliptin as a secondary or exploratory endpoint in the in the TCOS and, and saver TME trials. So if you take SGLT2 inhibition, people with high HbA1c doesn't work very well when HbA1c is below, below 8, 7.5% doesn't get very good glycemic control. It's fasting plasma glucose centric, weight loss is a priority. And of course, as I said, when you think of certain things which rule in a drug, two drugs get ruled in, SGLT2 or GLP1, if you have ASCVD, heart failure or CKD. Whereas the DPP-4, Dr. Gangopadha has nicely shown you, 
somebody with near HbA1c target, very easy to use, very few side effects, tolerability is, uh, is, is not an issue, and you can safely use them in renal impairment, where SGT2 inhibitors you can't. So if you combine them, this is the benefit that you're going to get. What? This is the famous octet, and look at how many of these will be targeted if you use metformin, SGLT2, and DPP4. Except for the one which is the neurotransmitter dysfunction, probably you are targeting all, and the other one is lipolysis. Lipolysis is getting excluded. Apart from that, if you use metformin, SGLT2, and DPP4 inhibitor combination, <clears throat> you are targeting six of the eight pathophysiological defects. To target lipolysis, you either need insulin or you need a TZD, pyoglitazone. Neurotransmitter dysfunction is a Pandora's box. I think next five years, we'll hear a lot about, about this pathophysiological defect in type 2 diabetes. So when you combine, there are this is a uh, trial with EMPA and LINA. There are trials with DAPA and SAXA as well, similar trials. That if you start LINA5, EMPA10, EMPA25, LINA10-5, EMPA25-5. So you have combination of this, you have combination of this. There are three things to learn from this slide. First one, when you use DPP-4 or SGLT2 inhibitor alone, and when you use in combination, you get a bigger drop in HbA1c. That is absolutely a no-brainer. Second thing that you could learn is it's not additive. If you take 0 0.7, 0 0.1, 0 0.6, it should be 1.36 drop. When you're using a 10 on 5, you're not. You're getting 1.08. If you use 25, 0.6 and 0.7, you get 1.32. You're not getting a drop. Why? Because one of the drugs works quicker, gets the HbA1c down, and we know that HbA1c, higher the HbA1c, better the drop with any drug, be it metformin, be it DPP-4, be it SGT2 inhibitor, be it uh, immune insulin. Now, third thing to notice, with HbA1c at, at 7.5 to 8, a DPP-4 inhibitor works better than an SGT2 inhibitor. Why? Because SGT2 inhibitor is pushing the sugar out in somebody with type 2 diabetes. So here, if you see, the baseline HbA1c is 8, 8.2, and a DPP-4 is working better than an SGLT2 inhibitor. Three things to note from this slide. And this is the magic of baseline HbA1c, as Dr. Gangopadhyay was mentioning. If you start with the baseline HbA1c of 8%, the combination is giving you a 1.2% drop. But if you start with the baseline HbA1c of 9, 9.1, you get almost a 1.84% drop. Don't get carried away by this 1.84 drop. Generally, I think you, you, you should keep in mind a 1.5% drop and use a combination. Remember the slide I showed you? The earlier you get your target, earlier you get your HbA1c below 7%, the better it is for you. And this is what's happening here. You get it at 12 weeks, you get better glycemic control, and that is being maintained when you use a combination. And the other thing is percentage of patients below HbA1c of 7%. These are, these are all non-brainers. We've seen these slides multiple times this is before, so I'm rushing through. So if you take DP4 as you to inhibit a combination, certainly a larger proportion of patients with an HbA1c of less than 7%, almost double, as opposed to using them singly. This is a, a, an added benefit uh, in question answer session. If you ask me why, I will say I don't know that when you use a combination of DPP4 and uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, the GTI that you normally see with SGLT2 inhibitor is lesser. This has been seen in randomized control trials. This has already been shown in a, in a meta analysis of the randomized control trials. And probably that is the experience, but our experience collectively is not that huge. We don't have a real world data, but it would seem that GTI is lesser when you're using a combination therapy. And when you combine a DPP-4 and SGLT-2, you do not lose any of the benefits of SGLT-2 inhibitor. You get your body weight reduction, you get your BP reduction. I always remember ballpark of four and two, four millimeter, two millimeter. And you get your, this is microbolts per liter, by the way, don't, don't get carried, it's one milligram per DL. You get reduction of serum uric acid uh, with an SGLT2 inhibitor. So if we take one step forward, if we take this patient another three, four, five years down the line, we all know that major event in a type 2 diabetic patient is a cardiovascular event. So five years down the line, now he has an ECG, which shows LVH and which now shows microalbuminuria. This slide doesn't come out well. This is taken directly from the 2021 standards of care from the website, but still doesn't come out well. But I'll read it out for you. When they they have now differentiated heart failure and CKD. Previously, they had clubbed heart failure and CKD. Now they've made it separate. They said for heart failure, use SGLT2. For CKD, SGLT2 or GLP-1 tetragonus. But the small print we always forget. ASCVD indicators or high risk of ASCVD in which LVH alone is a high risk for ASCVD. So LVH alone is pushing you to this side. So as I said, certain drugs are indicated if there are certain issues and LVH alone is indicating a GLP-1 or SGLT-2 inhibitor. 
Similarly, if you see the CKD part, it's not very clear. I apologize for that. The slide is not very clear. It's it's the EGFR or the albuminuria. Even albuminuria alone is pushing you towards this track. So this gentleman, when he develops LVH or and or microalbuminuria, SGLT2 inhibitors are getting kicked in. So this these slides you've seen before. So I'll rush through in my last. I have four minutes left. Maze outcomes with SGLT2 and DPP4. I will not take you through DPP4 because of the Congo part I said in one word, they're all the same. If you see 3P maze benefit amongst the four SGLT2 inhibitors, I'll come to the fifth one, the hemogliptosin, which is available in India. Empa Kana had a benefit. Why? Because they had a larger number of people with established cardiovascular disease, Empa 100%, Kana 65%. Declared to me failed to get 3P maze benefit because 60% of them had only high risk uh, and did not have cardiovascular events. What is CV surprisingly did not get it. If you want to discuss, we can discuss. In the end, it's a big question mark why it did not happen. This is MACE outcome. If you take CV death benefit by God's grace, by luck, or because the molecule does so, only one SGLT2 inhibitor crossed the line, and that was Empa gliflozin in the Empa outcome trial. Uh, uh, Canvas declared in Vertis, uh, Kana Dapa uh, 2 did not show cardiovascular death benefit. I'm not talking about people with heart failure. Don't, don't confuse with uh, DAPA heart failure or M emperor reduced. I'm talking about the CVOT trials of the four uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. DP4 inhibitor, as you, as Dr. Gangopathy Gang mentioned, no, no CV increased death, no CV benefit. Heart failure, class effect. All of them show heart failure benefit. I'm not going through the details because I'm sure you're going to have an SGLT2 inhibitor session. And uh, Dr. Gangopathy mentioned the increased heart failure with saxagliptin. That's why when you combine DAPA saxa in diabetic patients, where we have said that the risk of heart failure is very high, there's so many risk factors for heart failure already existing. If you take the various guidelines, they're already in stage B of heart failure, diabetics. They're using a DAPA saxa combination becomes slightly difficult. Can still use it, but then you have to monitor the patients more carefully. This is the emperor reduced. I'm not going to show you. Somebody else will show you. And if you come to the renal composite outcome, SGLT2 inhibitors have been the drug after almost 18 years. A new drug has come, which has made a manageable, visible effect on the clinical renal outcomes. Again, for some reason, what is CV, even though the point estimate is to the favor, misses out. So if you take the combination, metformin, empagliflozin, dinagliptin, on the top, if you see CP maze, CV death, heart failure, and renal benefit. DAPA sexa. CP maze neutral, CV death neutral, heart failure risk and renal benefits are there. But the moment you combine with sexa, there's a risk for heart failure, which comes up. R2 sita is not available to us, it's available in, in the US. Neutral, neutral, heart failure decreased risk, even renal benefit is neutral. So if you see now, if you want to combine this GLT2 DP4 inhibitor, probably impulse lena is looking better than the other two. And now I told you I will have one slide on Remo Wilda because of cost issue. So if you're wanting to use Remo Wilda, Certainly, you can use for glycemic control, Wilda for glycemic control. Wilda has got phase two, phase three meta analysis with regards to CVOT outcome. Wilda had the vivid trial, which uh, unfortunately has gone a little bit against it, but the, it, it, the, the end diastole volume goes up. So they do not have any data on the four clinically significant. Now we talk about cardio renal management of type two diabetes, and if you see Remo, Wilda do, do, does not have that data. So with that, I think I'll skip this slide and I'll come to my uh, summary. Last one minute I have. Metformin, EMPA, and LINA addresses multiple pathophysiological mechanisms. Six out of the eight I've shown you. Robust HbA1c reduction. Hypoglycemia data I did not show you. was very little. HbA1c reduction. If you start with an HbA1c of 9, you'll get up to 1.8. Majority will get an HbA1c reduction of 0.9 to 1.5%. Lo weight loss. Not in everybody, but many of them lose weight. Not a huge amount of weight. Those are anecdotes, but ballpark figure weight loss is 2 to 4 kilos. Blood pressure reduction, 4 millimeter. I mean, fascinating effect on, on, on the renal function. Robust evidence for CV, heart failure, renal outcome, proven mortality benefit with EMPA, only one, which showed mortality benefit. Both EMPA and LINA are now recommended patients with at-risk heart failure. These have now come in the European Society of Cardiology and ESA 2019 guideline. They are safe. Convenient for once daily dosing. Now, cost effectiveness is very difficult to assess. Uh, there was a very nice hypothetical uh, graph that Ramachandran has shown, and we have used that slide many a times. That if in the initial two years you get glycemic control better, then you save thousands and lakhs later on with regards to cardiorenal issues. But this is very hard to sell in our country to a patient where it comes out of pocket. 
So to me, I'm a very, very big fan of combination therapy. Anybody who comes with an HB1 to 7.5 and above, I would recommend triple therapy. You could taper later on. When you're choosing combination therapy, choose a combination which this is multiple physiological defect, probably does not cause hypoglycemia, does not cause weight gain or helps you to lose weight. If cost is not an issue, metformin, lina, and, uh, and uh, empa comes to be a very good combination. And one pill with all the three medications that is now available in US for quite some time now. We in India don't have that. We have metformin separately and empa lina together. As I said, DAPAS XI is available to you. You are welcome to use DAPAS XI if you want to. But I have showed you a little bit of data with regards to heart failure and other issues. And I'm sure there are questions. We'll take that uh, during, uh, during question answer time. Thank you very much, Dr. Bansi Sahu, for inviting me. Thank you very much, Chairperson, for giving me this opportunity and indulging and giving me two minutes extra. I see I have 22 minutes. So in, indulging and giving me this two minutes extra for my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. J.J. Mukherjee, sir. Really excellent lecture. And you have given very insight about the combination of DPV-4 and HGL-2 inhibitor. And we all convinced that this is a superb combination. And the main thing before this, we have, you know, no do too much combination available. Like, and the combination, what we available right now, the DPV-4 and the HGL-2, it is a really very great combination. And we manage patient very well. And we control the sugar. And we hopefully uh, target the HB1C at our, what, recommended by ADA and ACC, uh, 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 European Diabetic Association. So with this, I thank you, Dr. J.J. Mukherjee. And now I invite Dr. Steven Marwa. He is a well-known practic uh, practicing endocardiologist at Ahmedabad. Uh, he is an honorary associate professor and head of the department endocrinology, SVP Hospital, Ahmedabad. Uh, he trained in France. He participated in many national and international conferences and presented many papers. Uh, involved, he involved in uh, as a principal investigator in various clinical trials. Uh, he is a co-author of chapter of RSSDA textbook of diabetes 2004 third edition. He has interesting thing about the Tivan Marwa. Uh, he is writing article every Wednesday for Divya Bhaskar newspaper, and he has written more than 300 articles till date. And Interestingly, another thing about the Dr. Thiven Bai is he is the author of two books in, written in Gujarati. And uh, the name is Diabetes in Kadvi, Diabetes ni Kadvi Mithi Vato. And second one is Gaur, Khan, Mad, and Sakrin, Ketla Mitha ne Ketla Karwa. Really interesting about this. Uh, he involved in uh, many national and international charity organizations. And he received uh, many awards, uh, including AMA and uh, the awards from Gujarat government. With this, I invite Dr. Tivin Marwa, sir, uh, for his presentation. And the topic is uh, beta cell preservation, a promise of DPV-4 inhibitors. Uh, over to Dr. Tivin Bhai. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tivin Bhai, for such a lovely, kind introduction. And I'm extremely thankful to uh, Diacon and particularly Dr. Bansi yeah. Sabu for inviting me to deliver this talk and participate in this conference. Uh, Dr. Bansi, as you know that he has done remarkable things over a decade or so uh, to enhance the knowledge and information among physicians, internists, endocrinologists, and which has been immensely benefited to the patients at large and society. So his contribution is really exemplary, and I acknowledge it, and I appreciate it. The topic given to me is beta cell preservation, how we can achieve through uh, different uh, uh, molecules. I know this is a very, very important topic. And as we know that diabetes is a product of two major important effects. One is insulin deficiency and another is insulin resistance. And in a given type two diabetic patient, these both uh, entities exist together. It's a combination which gives rise to hyperglycemia and leads to diabetes. And the importance of beta cell dysfunction is enormous and it is particularly important in our country. Indians are more susceptible to have beta cell dysfunction. This is very well known a hypothetical slide which, is, which has been presented several times that as the duration of diabetes increases, beta cell function declines and this leads to increased A1C 
and we have to adapt to uh, the decline in pituitary dysfunction and increase in A1C and modify treatment of the patient so as to control his diabetes and to bring A1C below 7%. And over years, there is a greater de decline in beta cell dysfunction, and this leads to more and more hyperglycemia, which we need to correct. And as the beta cell dysfunction is higher, as it has been shown in this classical study, the beta decline study, the C peptide secretion or insulin secretion when it declines, the chances of A1C becomes higher. So in this study, which is shown through pro-insulin-insulin -insulin ratio, uh, which is a marker of beta cell dysfunction, when there is an increase in uh, PII ratio, that is pro-insulin-insulin -insulin ratio, uh, there are higher chances of patient getting A1C more than 7%. In the other way, when beta cell function is intact, chances to get even say less than 7% is higher. So beta cell dysfunction is very, very vital and important to control diabetes and to keep the target of A1C less than 7%. Higher degree of beta cell dysfunction is associated with poorer glucose control, which is quite logical. And this has been reflected through higher pro-insulin insulin ratio. What, what are the other clinical predictors which can tell us about the beta cell dysfunctions? In this study, it was mentioned that BMI, high CRP, dyslipidemia, they were clearly correlated to decline in beta cell uh, dysfunction. Now the question arises: how we can measure beta cell function. This can be extremely useful clinically and also in experiments to understand the newer molecules and how to use molecules to treat our N number of diabetic patients. So there are several methods we cannot measure directly beta cells. Uh, it, it will be a very challenging thing, but we can measure beta cell functions in indirect ways. And one of the best ways is to HOMA. Uh, we can assess both insulin resistance and beta index, which tells us about the insulin resistance level and also uh, uh, the insulin secretory capacity. And as you see in this slide, uh, as you move from on the left side, it is on insulin resistance, and on the right side, it is uh, insulin secretion. As you move from normal to IFG to IGT2, combination of IG, IFG and IGT, which is diabetes, the insulin resistance increases. And on the other side, right side, as you move from normal to frank diabetes, there is a decline in beta cell function, and it leads to increase in uh, hyperglycemia and diabetes. There is another way how we can uh, assess insulin resistance and beta cell mass, that is disposition index. What is disposition index? It's a, a true assessment of beta cell function and which can be uh, you know, assessed by insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion. The product of insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion is called the disposition index and it is directly related to insulin secretion. And as you see in the, on the right side of the uh, column, as you move from normal glucose tolerance to IFG2 diabetes, there is a decline in disposition index, which indirectly mentioned that there is reduced beta cell mass. Of course, this is not structural representation. This is a functional representation of beta cell mass. And as you move from normal glucose tolerance to IFG to diabetes, there is a reduction in beta cell mass function and it leads to increased diabetes. Now, uh, we need to control diabetes and to control diabetes, the most important thing is to preserve beta cell functions. And this is very important in Indian patients uh, because uh, Indian, patients, Indian patients are more susceptible to... <laughs> Beta cell dysfunction. Sorry. Indian patients are more uh, susceptible to beta cell dysfunction, and we are having both combination of insulin resistance and insulin uh, dysfunction, beta cell dysfunction, and Indian patients are more susceptible to reduction in beta cell function. There have been many studies which have shown that 
as in Indians, we are more likely to develop beta cell decline. And this happens in the early stage. Uh, the beta cell decline is very early in Indian type 2 diabetic patients. And that's the reason in Indian patients, we need to have a strategy which can preserve beta cell function and it should address these problems right from the beginning. Uh, there are several ways through which we can preserve beta cell function. And for that, we need to understand what are the issues which can hamper beta cell functions. Uh, autoimmunity, inflammation, highlight amyloid, then insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, glucotoxicity, lipotoxicity. All these parameters, they lead to decline in beta cell functions. So if you want to improve beta cell functions and improve uh, beta cell working uh, and preserve insulin secretion, we need to address all these issues. Now, what are the mechanisms or molecules which are at our disposition, which we can use to prevent beta cell declines? Well, we are having statins, which can reduce inflammation. We are having glitazone, which can reduce islet amyloid, and we are having uh, incretin based therapy, which can improve hyperglycemia and also preserve beta cell function. The molecules which are already known to have impact on beta cell functions are mainly insulin, glitazones, and incretin based therapy. What they do, and it has been found from studies from through glitazones and incretins that, that they reduce beta cell apoptosis, they promote beta cell proliferation, and through this, they increase insulin synthesis and secretion, and it, they improve insulin, uh, insulin secretion pattern. So at least for do, these two molecules, glitazones and DP4 inhibitor, it has been shown that they had impact on beta cell function, and through this, they can improve the survival of beta cell and also preserve beta cell functions and improve insulin secretion in the long term. Now let's focus on gliptins. What are their roles in preserving beta cell function and insulin resistance? So gliptins are known to have impact on beta cell functions and also some impact on insulin resistance. So this study, which is a sort of you know, summary of the impact of DP4 inhibitors on beta cells, what they have shown, uh, DP4 inhibitors as monotherapy, it significantly improves homo beta. Uh, as an add-on therapy, also they improve insulin secretion. Uh, there is no significant impact on insulin resistance directly, but there is indirect effect. And when they do this job uh, as monotherapy, they improve hyperglycemia, and this is comparable to metformin, sulfonylureas, and glitazone. As an add-on therapy, they are beneficial, and they work in, in a synergistic combination with metformin, sulfonylurea, insulin, and all other drugs. So these drugs, they are having impact on both Oma beta and some impact on insulin resistance. Now let's focus on vildagliptin because there are lots of evidence on vildagliptin of its therapeutic potential and benefits. What do the clinical trials show? Clinical trials have shown that vildagliptin, either 50 or 100 milligram OD, they reduce A1C levels, they are safe and well tolerated, and they improve beta cell function. This is a PD slide, but in nutshell, it has shown that. Uh, there is improvement in beta cell function. There is no significant improvement in insulin resistance, but there is improvement in hyperglycemia. Uh, why they use 100 milligram OD? Because this study was to assess post breakfast meal impact and breakfast and its impact is seen only in four hours. And that's the reason why 50 or 100 milligram OD was used to assess the impact. And both were e equivalent because uh, Vildagliptin can uh, suppress DP4 enzyme even if it is only the dose of 10 micrograms for at least four hours. Now, there is a comparison of metformin versus Vildagliptin as a monotherapy in Asian Indians with type 2 diabetes. So, what is the impact on uh, different parameters? Of course, insulin resistance is improved better with metformin, but if we see the direct total effect, the A1C reduction was similar. Postprandial reduction was better with vildagliptin, and the median duration of monotherapy requirement was almost equivalent in both metformin and vildagliptin. But there are distinct advantages of 
will touch it in alone or combination which we are going to see in the subsequent slide. Vildagliptin improves beta cell functions and insulin sensitivity in patients with impaired fasting glucose. There are almost half the number of patients which, who are pre-diabetic as there are diabetic. And these patients, 33% of them, they are likely to develop diabetes. So what is the impact of uh, Vildagliptin on pre-diabetic patients? So it's a study which was done to assess the effect if impact of vildagliptin on beta cell functions, and it clearly showed that vildagliptin improved ARG, that is acute insulin response to glucose and insulin sensitivity index. And when you withdraw this medicine, uh, uh, there is a washout, and there is this the benefit you are seeing is no more. So there is definite improvement in beta cell function, and this is visible even after eight weeks. Uh, which is shown in pre-diabetic patients, patients with IFG. Now, what is this impact on diabetic patients? They also improve uh, beta cell function and insulin sensitivity. In this study, it was shown that long-term vildagliptin treatment can increase insulin sensitivity. And there is other marker, which is called adaptation index. Uh, it was also shown to improve when you give uh, vildagliptin uh, uh, in comparison to other molecules. So, Pyrolitazone was found to improve further the beta cell function when you give along with vildagliptin. This is a, another clinical study which has shown what is the impact of three months treatment of vildagliptin, 50 to 100 milligram per day on modulating insulin resistance and beta cell function, and of course its impact on hyperglycemia. So this study showed that there is a reduction of A1C from 8, 11 to 8.7, almost 2.3, 2.4 percent reduction. There was reduction in fasting uh, hyperglycemia. There was also some improvement in insulin resistance, which might be indirect effect. And very, very importantly, there was very good improvement in beta cell function, almost 70 percent, just after three months of treatment of vildagliptin. So vildagliptin was found to have impact on beta cell function, indirect impact on insulin resistance, and then in nut cell, there is an impact on HB1C reduction was almost 2.3%. Now, what is the impact of uh, vildagliptin on beta cell secretory capacity? As I was telling, that there are many, many ways to assess beta cell functions, and there are many uh, studies which were done either clinically or in an experimental way, and they have directly or indirectly shown the importance and impact of uh, vildagliptin on beta cells. So another study which has shown that in the black bar, when patients are on, on vildagliptin, there is increased AIR, that is uh, acute insulin response. And uh, when patients are off the drug, this effect goes away. So effects were not sustained after 12 weeks was out period. That means patients would need a continuation of this medication to get the benefit on insulin secretion as well as some indirect impact on insulin sensitivity. So again, in this study, it was shown that uh, when you give vildagliptin for a year, there is an uh, increase in uh, beta cell function uh, just after 12 weeks, which is sustained for a year, one year. And there is also improvement in insulin resistance, which is also sustained for a year. Uh, this another study it is also shown that when you add vildagliptin on top of metformin, even after a year, there is improvement in insulin secretion. And of course, this combination would have a great impact on insulin resistance as well. So the adaptation index, which is an indirect marker of secretion as well as insulin resistance, there is uh, improvement, the reduction, and you get the complementary benefit of using this combination. Now, this slide it shows even more clearly the advantage of vildagliptin metformin combination. And as you can see, that uh, vilda 50 milligram OD, there is an increase in beta cell function. And vilda 50 twice daily, there is slightly more increase. But if you do metformin, there is no increase. And, and the difference between metformin alone versus uh, vildagliptin alone, uh, uh, vilda plus metformin there was an almost five-fold increase in beta cell function when it was added to metformin. The combination of metformin plus vildagliptin 
it gives benefit on two events, one on insulin secretion, which is almost five-fold than if you use only metformin. And there is also improvement in uh, adaptation index, insulin resistance, et cetera. Uh, the recent ESD 2020 showed very nicely the effect of beta cell function in newly diagnosed type 2 di uh, diabetic patient after treatment of bildagliptin and metformin. This very famous VERIFY study, uh, it showed that after one year of early combination, uh, there is improvement in beta cell function, and this improvement is much more significant than if you use monotherapy. So there is no doubt uh, uh, that metformin is not working on beta cell function, but uh, this metformin plus bildagliptin combination because of bildagliptin, there is remarkable in improvement in beta cell function, and this was seen after the end of first period, and the conclusion was the early combination treatment with Lidla and metformin in patients with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic patients, it does show improvement in beta cell function and compared with monotherapy, uh, which is metformin. So early use of both vindagliptin and metformin give remarkable impact on beta cell function, which is the need for our Indian diabetic patients because Indian diabetic patients are more susceptible to early beta cell function loss. Now, what is the impact of gliptin on overall islet cell function? As you know that islets contain alpha cell, beta cell, gamma and delta cells, and they all have some impact on uh, pathophysiology of diabetes. And we can't forget the importance of glucagon and alpha cells, and we need to see what does vindagliptin uh, does on alpha cells. And in this study, it was shown that uh, treatment with vildagliptin, it resulted in both uh, reduction of fasting and postprandial glucose levels. There was also reduction in uh, glucagon levels uh, because uh, vildagliptin suppresses alpha cells and there is reduction in glucagon levels, which leads to improvement in hyperglycemia. And uh, there was no effect on absolute insulin secreted rate. So vildagliptin has got impact on both beta cells and alpha cells. And because of uh, its uh, Im uh, impact on both alpha and beta cells, and also which is glucose dependent, it's a very smart molecule to manage diabetes and without producing uh, hypoglycemia and without uh, producing major excursions. So vildagliptin has got ability to impact both alpha and beta cells, both they can sense and respond to hypoglycemia uh, when vildagliptin is given to the patient. So this is very, very important aspect of vildagliptin. Uh, uh, when you give vildagliptin to diabetic patient, there is suppression of plasma glucose, glucagon levels during hyperglycemia. And very, very interestingly, when there is hypoglycemia, there is increased plasma glucose, glucagon. So there is not only a glucagon uh, suppression is removed, but there is in fact increase in glucagon, which can eventually improve uh, uh, blood sugar level and prevent person to develop hypoglycemia. And so there is a significant increase in glucagon during hypoglycemia as well as the suppression of insulin secretion. So the beauty of, and smartness of this molecule is that uh, it suppresses plasma glucagon levels during hyperglycemia when it is very much needed. It increases glucagon level during hypoglycemia when it is very much needed. And also it stops insulin secretion during hypoglycemia. So it is both hypoglycemia friendly and anti-diabetic drugs. And it lowers postprandial glucose concentration by stimulating insulin secretion and suppressing glucagon secretions. Again, in the blood bars, there is increase in insulin uh, secretion. Uh, and also on the right side, there is in, in, uh, improvement in disposition indexes. So Vildagliptin, there are other ways to understand uh, the responsibility index and total disposition index, they get ameliorated by using vildagliptin. Now, what is the difference between SGL2 inhibitors and vildagliptin or DP4 inhibitors on insulin and glucagon? On right top panel, you can see that when you give SGL2 inhibitors, they are not able to suppress glucagon, whereas vildagliptin, they do suppress glucagon. So in case when you use a SGL2 inhibitor, there is hyperglucagon and which can worsen hyperglycemia in some patients. 
and there is 15% lowering of both fasting and postprandial glucagon levels as compared to SGLT2 inhibition with dapagliflozin. Dr. Mukherjee very nicely and elegantly highlighted the use of SGLT2 inhibitors and combination. So the disadvantage of SGLT2 inhibitor can be offset by combining a DB4 inhibitor, which will eventually suppress the increased glucagon level, which is achieved through SGLT2 inhibitors. So we are having different molecules we need to use in a correct way to benefit our thousands of diabetic patients. And we need to keep these things in mind that there are multiple pathology to produce hyperglycemia, and we need to use the molecule in a right way to address the right pathology to correct hyperglycemia. And, and these are the you know, uh, signals which can be used to use to the right molecules. We need to have medicine which should improve insulin resistance, improve beta cell function, lipid health, glucagon secretion, and eventually A1C. DP4 inhibitor has got impact on multiple set mechanisms. And if we combine with uh, metformin, it will address almost seven out of the eight uh, ominous octet, and it can reduce hyperglycemia and it can, it can benefit multiple of our type 2 diabetic patients. So to summarize my talk, uh, beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance are the two most critical determinants of type 2 diabetes. And in Indian patients, they are more susceptible to beta cell dysfunctions. And we need to choose the molecules which can address these issues right from the beginning. And we have seen that when there is high insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction, this will lead to hyperglycemia and diabetes. And in uh, all these experimental clinical studies, they have shown that DB4 inhibitors, they address at least if not seven, four major pathways of the ominous octet. And you, when you combine with metformin, they you know, uh, address seven out of eight parameters of type 2 DM ominous octet. And they can be a very, very useful combination to treat multiple of our type 2 diabetic patients. Vildagriptin per se improves beta cell function and insulin sensitivity indirectly in patients with impaired fasting glucose, those who are having pre-diabetic, can be a good molecule. And lastly, Vildagriptin has got very favorable effects and capacity in modulating insulin resistance and beta cell functions. And they can be a, a great uh, therapeutic armamentarium to treat many of our type 2 diabetic patients right from the beginning and also in the middle stage of the diabetic. Thank you very much for your very patient hearing. And if there are questions, comments, we can share together. And once again, Dr. Bansi Sabu, thank you for inviting me uh, to this important conference. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your very well explained talk regarding the beta cell preservation, as the beta cell preservation is a very important and critical part of early diabetes management. And now we move on the discussion session. Uh, I have a one one question for our three learned speaker regarding their own experience in their own clinic. My first question to Gangopadhyay is, sir, that what is your choice in first time detected young diabetes without any comorbidity in a combination therapy with metformin? What is your choice for gliptins? Gangopadhyay, sir. Okay, so as uh, Dr. Mukherjee has also um, alluded to, I think combination therapy is here to stay and is building up. I try and include pioglitazone also in the initial combination. Now, I might be the odd one out here. I know many people don't use pioglitazone. They may not like it, but I am one of those who use it at least for a short period of time, say up to about two years, because that, you know, I feel clinically at least there's proven benefit of it preserving beta cells uh, clinically. Um, and so an ideal combination for me, newly diagnosed will be DPP4, metformin, pioglitazone. Which DPP4? So I might, so pick your, um, you can choose between Sita, Lina or Vilda. Cost, 
Wilder. Um, if cost is not an issue, then I might choose between Lina and Sita. The which one to choose between <clears throat> two? Then I have to show my entire presentation again based on certain factors. So which factors are there will guide you which one you will choose, Sita or Lina. So that will be my choice. DPP4 plus metformin plus pyglitazone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now my question to Mukherjee, sir, that what is your experience regarding the genitourinary tract infection with the use of SGLT2 inhibitor and how will you deal with this? Mukherjee, sir. Okay. Uh, when you say your experience, it is a very Indian thing about saying in my experience, you know, I mean, my experience is not of uh, 100,000 patients. I, I have fair few patients on SGLT2 inhibitors, but if you ask my, my uh, experience, it does happen. When I prescribe G, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in my prescription, it's written risk of GTI explained. I always give uh, either, I don't use fluconazole that much because of liver issues. I just give them a, a, a cream, a cotrimazole cream. And I tell them, this is my, my personal experience, my personal way of working. I don't know if anybody wants to disagree. I tell them that if you get a GTI, stop the SGLT2 inhibitor, apply the cream for five days, the thing is going to disappear, restart. If you get it a second time, uh, if, if it's a mild GTI, if, they, if it's a bad GTI, I say stop straight away, come to see me. If it is okay. a mild one, then restart. And I say that if you get three recurrent episodes of GTI, then you come, uh, completely stop it. Having said that, I see the patients at a frequency of three to four months. And I haven't had a single patient who's had three episodes of GTI in the three to four months uh, period that I have not seen the patient. So this is my experience. This is what I, I, I tell them. I ask them to wash the area well. Uh, most of them say that outside the house, they can do it. They can't do it. So I, I accept that. But I said that when you are at home, please do it. So prescribe, mention GTI is a risk factor. Ask them to stop it for five days. Use a cream. Some people of my colleagues use, like, like to use a tablet because only one or two doses is more than enough to deal with it. And if you get a bad GTI or you get a recurrent GTI, please stop it. If it is happening in the interval period of the three months that I'm seeing you, if you get three episodes, please stop it. Or please walk into the clinic and we can discuss again. Can I, can I add something to about the beta cell uh, and DPP-4? I think uh, yes. the, pre the presenter mentioned beta cell function and the chairperson mentioned beta cell preservation. Both are two absolutely different things. What happens with DPP-4 inhibitors is absolutely a transient increase in beta, beta cell function. It's absolutely transient. There is no hard data to show that DPP-4, GLP-1, pyoglitazone, anything has an effect on beta cell preservation or beta cell apoptosis. We have some animal data. We have that st stock slide which all of us keep showing around on some animal data. In human data, all the data is on beta cell function. Majority of it has been done with the home homeostasis mechanism, uh, uh, the formula, which has got a lot of issues. There are some very nice studies as uh, Dr. Marwa presented so nicely about some hyperglycemic lamp studies, but majority of them are transient improvement in beta cell function with no hard human evidence of beta cell preservation. So with that, yeah. I'll stop. I'll, I'll wait for any other question. Thank you. Uh, may I? Yes, Dr. Panika, sir. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very well said. There is no real evidence with DPP-4 or GLP-1 except animal studies to show that beta cell preservation. But with the glitter zones, there is a good durability, which is seen in Adopt study and so many other studies, which tells you that there is an element of beta cell preservation. No question about that. So that is where it would come. And Dr. Kalyan very well said that he would use a metformin, pyoglitazone, and a DPP-4. I would say metformin, pyoglitazone, and SGLT2. That would be the ideal combination in the patient with no co comorbidities. Can I add on to that? The reason pyoglitazone, I also follow that, uh, Dr. Baniker. I use my pyoglitazone in the first six months of new onset diabetes because as I was discussing in my talk, of the eight pathophysiological defects, lipolysis is a very important pathophysiological defect with a very bad effect on beta cell function. And only two things work on lipolytic pathway. One is insulin, which if you can get to give to your patient in the first six months, very good. That's why if you see the early insulin studies, why it does better, why it changes the pathophysiology. Because early insulin acts on many aspects, including lipolysis, it acts on beta cell apoptosis. So that's why uh, Dr. Panikar, I choose pyoglitazone because pyoglitazone is the only other molecule orally which is acting on the lipolytic pathway, which is very active in the first four to six months. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And one more question to Marwa, sir, that what is your experience 
to use a vildagliptin with metformin in OD days, OD dose? Uh, well, first, uh, first to answer to the comments of Dr. Mukherjee and Dr. Panikar regarding uh, functioning and preservation, yes, uh, you would agree with me that it's very, very difficult to prove uh, beta cell preservation. You need long-term trial, you need to have histological, pathological, you know, uh, studies which are extremely difficult and unethical. And uh, I already mentioned that uh, there is a transient improvement in beta cell functions, and after also a period, there is no improvement. If at all, there are indirect studies which have shown in, uh, effect through rosiglitazone or pyoglitazone in preserving beta cells, two are indirect. So I agree with you what you say. Now, answering to uh, your question, Dr. Bias Patel, uh, regarding OD use of filtagliptin and metformin, yes, uh, well, Indian patient, we still use even if you don't like sulfonylureas or not. And uh, the studies have shown that at least glimepiride is not harmful for cardiovascular outcome studies. So many of our patients, they are on, even, uh, even today on sulfonylureas or metformin combination, particularly glimepiride or glipazide. In such patients, using OD dose of intagliptin plus metformin and, uh, on, uh, on one uh, day glimepiride plus metformin, <clears throat> They can have very excellent control on uh, uh, hypoglycemia A1C reduction, and it can be a very significant reduction. Of course, now we are having other molecules like SCLD2 inhibitors and glitazone, etc., which can be also used on top of using OD dose of beta and metformin, and which can be beneficial. So many of our patients can benefit through different combination. Uh, and because they are going to address different multiple etiopathology and indirectly there will be benefit not only on diabetes but also cardiorenal complications. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yes, may last add, question. May I add to what Dr. Yes, sir. Mark, yes, to, sir. What he said is absolutely right that when you use it in combination with the sulfonylurea metformin, a OD dose could do the trick for you. But basically, if you look at Vildagliptin, a OD dose will have a DPP-4 inhibition less than 70%. If you need a 100% DPP-4 inhibition, you need a BD dose of uh, Vildagliptin. But when it is add-on with another drug, a slight push from there will get your glycemic control, which doesn't mean that it is the ideal thing to do. Ideally, it should be twice a day. Okay. Recently, thank you, thank you the sir, one for your comment. Recently, one company is coming with, you know, OD dose also, the sustained release. <laughs> the, uh, my question to all panelists, like any one of them, uh, I think since many years, we are trying, you know, giving practice like uh, with sulfonylurea and metformin combination to any new onset of diabetes, the HbA1c more than like eight or nine, something, whatever. And usually these two combinations, sulfonylurea and metformin, usually we are giving. But now we are number of drugs, uh, number, of, number of groups available. So what should be the ideal stepwise approach one by one? And what is the ideal combination first we have to start and then what drugs we should add one by one? So can you comment on please? Can you arrow? Can you arrow who's to speak? Uh, okay. Now we conclude the session as... Bavis, this last... All the speakers for... Very well, uh, sir. We already running short of time. That's we must conclude the session right now. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your uh, lucid talk and very informative talk. Thank you, my co-chairperson and my younger uh, elder brother, Dr. Diran Patel, reporter Sushit Patel, and thank you, Bansi Sabu sir, for giving me an opportunity. Thank you. Move on the next session. Yeah. Over to thank you. Thank Rupa you, all Charlie. panelists. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bansi Sabu. Thank you so much, everyone. On the behalf of the organizing team, uh, I thank our reporter, Dr. Sufit Patel, and our esteemed chairperson, Dr. Tiran Patel and Dr. Maris Patel, for the wonderful uh, conduction of the session. Now we are moving towards the next session. So that is common pitfalls in diabetes. And for this, we have three wonderful speakers with us. And to start the session, I would like to invite our reporter, Dr. Rupam Chaudhary from Guwahati. And I would ask uh, to take over and introduce the chairpersons and to start the sessions of this common pitfalls in diabetes. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Over to you, Dr. Rupan Todri. Thank you very much. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. And we have a very interesting topic right now, which is the common pitfalls in diabetes. Uh, for this, uh, to chair, I would like to request Dr. Jitendra Patil, who is from uh, Ahmedabad, and also Dr. Uh, Parikshit Goswami, who hails from Himmat, uh, Himmatnagar. So uh, I, I would re request the chairpersons to take over the session and uh, to carry forward. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rupam, for inviting me to, and uh, my co-chair, Dr. Jitendra Patel, sir, for this very interesting talk. Three talks uh, are lined up for this session. And uh, first, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Tirthankar uh, Chaudhary, sir, um, whose speciality is endocrine diabetes and thyroid. Um, He's trained at uh, UK, um, MRCP, uh, multiple publications in the journal Diabetes, Diabetes Therapy, JAPI, a lot of uh, awards to his credit. And he's uh, uh, currently working as a consultant for diabetes, endocrine, and thyroid um, uh, at Kolkata, Emory, and the Apollo Journal Hospital, uh, Apollo, Apollo Hospitals. And uh, uh, his talk, he will be talking on managing diabetes, uh, think beyond the uh, even c glycemia. So I request Dr. Tethankar Chaudhary sir to take on the session. Uh, thank, thank you very much. much. And very good morning for the kind introduction. Uh, should I try to share screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, how do I go about it? Let me see. So this is my, I, I don't think you are seeing it at the moment. No, no, right now it's not, not visible. Okay, uh, let me, let me go to the share screen. I just saw that. So I click on the share screen. Now I let you share. And then I go to my presentation and oh, to the lovely, wonderful slides. Here. Am I visible and audible? Absolutely fantastic, sir. Go ahead. Okay, yes, thank you very much, sir. So I've been asked to speak today about managing diabetes, think beyond HbA1c. When I got this topic, there are two things that comes to my mind. That one is that if you think beyond HbO1c, you think of time in range. But I'll briefly touch that because I think there may be other speakers on that. And then that things come when a diabetic patient comes to you beyond HbA1c, you start thinking about the obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, role of aspirin. And I have added is probably looking for incipient heart failure. So these are the aspects that beyond HbA1c that comes to my mind when we are seeing a type two diabetes in our clinic. Now, how to, what, how to and why we worry about it? Now, the first question comes, when we are talking of time and range, is that people would ask, what is the range? And they would also ask that, what is the range beyond which and for how many hours or what percentage of time you need to be to invite the ills of applications of beyond time and range? To start off very easily, that 70% of the time what we think is the opinion that you should be in range. Second question is, what is the range? We are thinking that your blood sugar should range between 80 to 180 milligram per deciliter. Third question is, what percentage of time if you take them, you should be in range? We think that you should be there at least 70% of the time when you are doing this. Now, I and you know very well that if you have a lot of glycemic variability, then we know that a person can have an acceptable HbA1c along with hypos and excursions beyond um, our expectation or our desire. Therefore, the inter intraday glycemic variation, recognizing hypoglycemia is very important uh, in diabetes management. Now, the question comes, if you're talking of glycemic variability, 
then we have got some evidence that it is a it causes cardiovascular damage in people with type 2 diabetes and high gv has been associated with cognitive impairment as well and we also know that there is increased risk of mortality that's why it is important as i said at the onset that what we need to have is at least 17 hours in range and we should be 70 percent of the time in range now with the many of the times as a clinician, you would ask, how do we do that in the clinic? Now, there are many ways of doing it. The cheapest, easiest way would be if you have a glucometer even and randomly check it, say, we call it seven point, like fasting, PP, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and doing at 3 a.m. in the morning or variable times. You can get without going into elaborate uh, testing a time in range and that can be tested maybe once in seven days or two weeks or three weeks but if you are more pedantic and you want to do it there are many ways of continuous glucose monitoring systems available including our lipre pro as well as the metronics one where you can get uh, proper i pro you can get the entire data now the question comes one i would say that when do you suspect if a patient comes to you and patient has a good glycemic control and he's still talking of symptoms, I think we should be very alert to these complaints because probably he's getting hypos in the middle. So what are the microvascular outcome? If we are talking of time in range is not maintained, this is briefly to remind you that time in range is important, that even if you are less by 10%, evidence says that you increase the retinopathy risk by 16%. 4% in terms of relative risk, nephropathy as well as neuropathic risk. Therefore, time in range beyond HbA1c is important. The second part that I would come now is about the other issues that you should keep in mind to prevent complication. In the natural history of the type 2 diabetes, we know that there is a potential for micro and macrovascular complication. Therefore, what we need to do when we are seeing diabetes, it is very important that we identify not only the early signs, but also treat them aggressively. I often feel that we are, the onus lies upon us to prevent a complication because once the complication comes and your eyes are affected, it's in the parlance of the ophthalmologist. One year, somebody has got a heart attack, it's in the parlance of cardiologist. Once there is an impaired renal function it's in the parlance of nephrologist. So it is very important that we identify or try to prevent the complication because that is the time we are given. We are given the time to prevent the complication and it is possible to prevent or postpone the complications in a very, very effective. Now, one thing that comes to our mind is overweight or obesity. If you look at the look ahead trial, we know that we have been talking about factors associated with obesity. We know that obesity itself over nutrition causes a lot of effects as you can see in the busy slide. So atherosclerosis in coronary artery, carotid arteries, cerebral arteries, aorta and peripheral arteries and hypercoagulability are the consequences. But in the look at it, if you just look at the study per se, you know that it did not show improvement in cardiovascular outcome or in terms of reduced risk of cardiovascular complication. But what it did show is improvement in mobility, quality of life, psychological questionnaire, sexual function, et cetera. But when the study was followed up, they found in the follow-up study, those patients who had a better control had reduced cardiovascular complication. Therefore, obesity is a very, very important target. And the fact that over the last few years, we have got some molecules in our hand, they not only cause no hypoglycemia, but they also take uh, causes weight reduction is actually a very important uh, tool for us in the glycemic management. Now, what are the benefits of weight loss? Just to remind you that weight loss is not only that the benefit you are seeing, it is more important to achieve that. As you know that it is not very easy to do diet because we have got some hormones in the body, including GH, relin, et cetera, which gives you hunger, hunger, uh, you're craving for food. So it is not very easy that it is to just to tell them a lot of behavioral therapy is involved when you are trying to reduce weight. I think um, why weight program of Jocelyn is a very, very interesting thing to go through about how do you reduce weight. 
I think behavioral therapy is very important. We know now that three to 5% weight reduction is necessary to get the benefit of weight reduction or any benefit of preventing uh, any complications related to diabetes. We also know that you have to have 500 to 700 kilocalories of energy deficient, deficient, deficient in patient treating obesity or in an overweight patient. So a few of the data I give you, one is the how much weight reduction, how much calorie day, you should have 500 to 700 uh, calorie deficit. Second is that what is the percentage of weight reduction you need to get the benefit, three to 5%. And you need a behavioral therapy. One of the recommendation is 16 sessions in six months, but of course there are many recommendations. And why do you want to do it? Because it improves insulin sensitivity, it causes risk markers of thrombosis to go down, inflammatory markers to go down, and then cellular function is improved. So adiponectin is a fat-derived hormone. That is also, we know, the beneficial effect when you reduce weight is expression of adhesion molecule is decreased. So all the anti-inflammatory markers are actually reduced. If you look at metabolic or vascular benefit, we know that in diabetes, up to 50% of fasting sugar is reduced just by 10% weight loss. But 10% weight loss is not easy and you should give three to six months to get that. We should remember that at risk for diabetes, 30% more decrease in fasting insulin. So you see just even a slight reduction of weight does so much of benefit that we often say that it is probably possible to get a lot of the complications of diabetes and tablets down just by weight reduction but you need a very good education to the patient to achieve this. It is easier said than done. And we know that the impact of weight loss is profound in terms of HbA1c, blood pressure, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. So the treatment strategy is of course about physical activity, then comes the how much, and it is as you know, it's a 30 minutes for 150 minutes a week. And of course, along with the diet, and most important, I keep saying that the behavioral therapy is very important. Patients should be educated about why he is doing it. And that the initially it takes a long time to get the results coming up. So most of the patients give up when they start trying and seeing the benefit is not coming, maybe in weeks or a month. So it is important to do that. Self-monitoring, low calorie diet, exercise, and even tablets. Now, when you talk of blood pressure, is another thing that we, when you see the patient in the clinic, that we know that we do, I do not need to overemphasize the complications of hypertension. But when we are talking of hypertension, you start thinking of Accord BP, you start thinking of hot study, you start thinking of sprint study, you start thinking of advanced BP study. And what did, this is one of the study we have realized that if you treat somebody over 140, 90, you are going to get the benefit. Our consensus is about 130, 80. We have also realized that if you talk of the hot and the sprint study, then you know that this has got less relevance to diabetes. You look at Accord BP. We have also seen that if you want to do intensive versus standard, there is another debate. Advanced study BP itself did not look explicitly at the blood pressure, but still the benefit intensive group with pendopril and natural exercise, of course, there. Now, when you are trying to do very intensive blood pressure control. The benefits have been shown in studies about uh, albuminuria, it's about stroke, but not in the cardiovascular outcome, but at the expense of side effect. So 138 is a good, good target to uh, achieve. Now evaluation and screening, this is needless to say, I always say that if you are starting or increasing uh, antihypertensive drug or starting antihypertensive drug, it's a good idea to do the blood pressure yourself because our clinic blood pressure, uh, I don't know in what setup you work. In my setup, I feel com more comfortable doing the blood pressure for the first time. And of course, when you, I'm going to titrate the blood pressure tablet, because there is a lot of variation interperson in terms of measuring the blood pressure. And you and I know very well that people often measure even blood pressure over uh, coat or winter dress. Now, you get PDS again, what I was trying to say, if you have got over 140 and 90 and you are treating them, or you are treating 130, 80 and above in a high risk cardiovascular group, you are going to get the risk reduction or uh, benefit. So uh, I want the chairperson to remind me if I'm exceeding the time, but I think I'm also giving, uh, doing the time giving. 
Now, therefore, the risk reduction is profound in any diabetes-related endpoint. You can see here the risk reduction um, in this busy slide, and most of the numbers are very, very impressive, including the heart failure. Now, when you talk of management of hypertension, that study, as you know, uh, is another uh, diet-associated uh, approach is very good, but I cannot imagine not using AC and ARV in a type two hypertensive at this stage and age of our career. Abnormal lipid metabolism, again, the question comes, what is my target? What are you going to do? So in primary prevention, I would not go to the secondary prevention. Most of the time in primary prevention, I would say, if you look at LDL less than 100 or in a high risk group, over 20% of cardiovascular risk, aim, time to aim for 70 uh, of uh, LDL is a good idea. So therefore, if you look at uh, statin, statin and statin remains, and then comes the question of dosing, I would say a moderate statin dose is good enough. You should do a lipid profile at the beginning to understand where you stand. Initially doing a three months to see whether we have achieved our target is a good idea, but then we can do on a yearly or as need basis. And of course, in people who are fine and younger, you can do it in even in five years. So I think that doing LDL is important. Then you know that triglyceride is another issue that we keep talking and I'm coming one by one. So we know that safer values first. Uh, this is what we are trying to aim for uh, starting. Now question comes up triglyceride. I know there's a lot of question about triglyceride, the questions about fibrates, the question about um, question about niacin and uh, statin. Now we know that there are many studies to this relation. And you know the triglyceride starts coming down when the hyperglycemia is treated. You are using the statin. And we also know that you are also have got evidence to say that just attacking TG initially, well, above 500, you were thinking about pancreatitis, but fibrin and uh, statin together also causes a lot of rhabdomyolysis and uh, non-specific myopathies. So you should be very selective in what you want to do and that's sh what should be your target. So we know that lipids is bad. We know it causes atherosclerosis, it causes adverse outcome. So therefore the statin is the goal. You can use a fibrate for hypertriglycemia in an appropriate patient. If you look at the different studies in terms of uh, statin and niacin, you know that there is a AIM high study, there is heart failure protect study. They have not shown much benefit, but therefore there is a place, of course, I'm not talking the secondary, in primary prevention, you should choose your patient carefully, but moderate dose statin is of course something that we should do. So high but LDL, two, therapeutic lifestyle, drug Two minutes therapy. more, sir. Two minutes Sorry? more. Two minutes. Okay, okay. According to my watch, we started late, so five minutes. I, I it's, okay. Okay. it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so choice of statin, again, where you should use fibroid is uh, important in our thing. Now, therapeutic lifestyle, drug intervention is important. And ACRB, therefore, anti drug and lipids are something we should have on board in the patient and should all be started on aspirin. Well, nowadays we know that in primary prevention, no, we are not giving it, but there are a subset of patients in whom you think the cardiovascular risk is uh, almost over 20%. These patients are smoker, young patients in the family having a heart attack. You want to identify the patients of microalbuminuria. You want to discuss the patient. Well, there may be a case, but we should be very selective, but normally not. To reiterate, hb one c alone might not be adequate to manage and diabetes complication. So it is very important that obesity, your hypertension and your dyslipidemia. Aspirin is uh, one we discussed. Now, before I finish, I just want to add one word that when you are starting diabetic patient, it is very important to look at the incipient heart failure because they don't have the primary and secondary like ASCVD. So non-atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and patient may come with a diastolic dysfunction, SJ2 inhibitors and drugs like that with the early intervention can save the patient. As you know, heart failure is a very, very significant complication of diabetes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, please pardon me as uh, uh, we, are, we had started a little 10 minutes late. So I just cut it one or two minutes from your session. No worry, no worry. Excuse me and pardon me for that. 
and uh, kindly stop sharing your presentation uh, sir and uh, i invite to my uh, second co chair dr jitendra patel sir to uh, introduce our second speaker thank you sir sir unmute yourself sir you are mute dr jitendra sir unmute you, yourself okay yes. sorry uh and uh, thank you dr tirthankar for giving excellent talk on the given topic and now we have moved to the second talk that will be on paradoxes in the diabetes and for which we have a very eminent speaker dr vijay panikar uh, he is honorary consultant of department of endocrinology and diabetes and metabolism in lavati hospital mumbai and he is ex professor of medicine uh, in kj somaya medical college mumbai also ex vice president of rssd and past chairman of rssd india chapters and past president of college of physicians and surgeons of bombay and organizing chairman of rssd national conference in mumbai and had lots of publications more than 20 research publications in journals written chapters in textbook and medicine updates and lots of pioneer work and co-author in rss day also so without taking much time over to you sir for uh, your talk on paradoxes in diabetes thank you jitendra for a kind introduction let me share my slides Can you see them? Yes. 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 At the outset, I must congratulate Bansi, Hardik, and his entire team for having put together this wonderful academic feast. And as usual, he's a master at it. The topic given to me is paradoxes in diabetes. What is a paradox? It is that there is a statement which has two parts. One is seen what it is and one which is actually not what it is. So let us go through the paradoxes in diabetes. Let us look at intensive glucose control. UKPDS was the first study which showed that good glycemic control would give these benefits. And follow-up 10 years later also showed the legacy effect that there is a significant improvement in microvascular and macrovascular complications, especially myocardial infarction, 16%, 15%, and all-cause mortality reduced by 13%. So UKPDS showed that good glycemic control early in diabetes could benefit outcomes, including cardiovascular risk. And basically what came out of this was, everybody interpreted it that having an HbA1c below seven was the thing to do. So national guidelines followed suit. This is the ADA ESD guideline for 2006. If you see here, diagnosis, lifestyle intervention, and then it says HbA1c. If it is not more than seven, nothing is to be done. But the moment it goes above seven, then you have glitazone, sulfonylurea, basal insulin, and so on. Everywhere across the panel, you will see HbA1c of 7 is the standard. What is the paradox? Everybody said, yes, HbA1c 7, but hardly any improvement on the ground. In fact, half of the prevalent cases are not known or diagnosed. So there are a huge population of undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. Half of those are not treated. Those who are diagnosed, half are not treated or not taking the treatment. And half of those who are treated are not controlled. This is the ground reality, in spite of all guidelines saying HbA1c7. Then we had major studies. So everybody thought that getting a HbA1c to 7 or maybe lower could give you good cardiovascular benefits. So then came these major studies in intensive glucose control in the real world population. They were the ACCORD, ADVANCE, and VIDT. They all tried to get the HbA1c to below 7 in the hope that we would have a good cardiovascular outcome. And what did they find? It showed little benefit of intensive glucose control other than in nephropathy, and that too in ACCORD and ADVANCE. VADT did not show that either. And ACCORD showed increased mortality, weight gain, and hypoglycemia. And the ACCORD study had to be stopped in between because of increased mortality. There were other evidences here. 
This is the Hemmingson Cochrane Review. Meta analysis from 2011 13 on type 2 diabetes, no reduction of total or cardiovascular mortality, MI, stroke, or end stage renal failure, and 30% increase in severe hypoglycemia. So, tight control, no benefit. This is Keller et al. 2014 systematic review meta, no trend towards improving all cause of CV mortality in intensively controlled type 1 diabetic patients. Kunti, retrospective cohort study, increased risk of CV events in those treated with insulin, type 2 diabetes and type 1, and who had hypos. There are other evidence also, the Levin study which showed that in a randomized control study in the surgical ICU, most of these patients are actually on a ventilator. Very well controlled, getting HBA sugars to around 110, between 80 to 110. And they showed that if intensively treated, there was reduction in in-hospital morbidity and mortality. But when this was translated to the general ICU, like in the NICE sugar study, there was an increased mortality in the extensively treated group and there were increased high posts. So now the trend is 140 to 180. Anything below 180 is good enough. Earlier it was below 110. So what is the big message in cardiovascular disease? The paradox is that you could have a good glycemic control. You can die of a heart attack even when HbA1c is 6.5. So good glycemic control does not prevent cardiovascular mortality. That is the paradox. The take home message is tight glycemic control is not ideal for all diabetics. Focus on those patients who are most likely to benefit and least likely to be harmed. Good diabetes control does not, is always not the same at good glycemic control. See, diabetes is a multifactorial thing. Like Dr. Tirthankan showed, you have to treat blood pressure, you have to treat dyslipidemia, you have to treat obesity, you have to have physical fitness. All that is holistic approach. Just glycemic control is not the thing. And But any reduction in HbA1c is worthwhile in terms of reducing risk, especially the microvascular complication. So following this, there was a change in approach to glycemic management. And what was that change? There was individualization of glycemic goals is now the accepted good practice and should include consideration of age, life expectancy, comorbidities, likelihood of benefit and drug specific risk of hypoglycemia. So what really was the change here was that we know that early tight control is known to slow the progression of microvascular complication, while relaxation of targets in those at high risk of hypoglycemia and those with multimorbidity can improve the safety of the treatment. So this was the change in the approach to the management of diabetes. But look at this. Pam Brown in 2016 did a retrospective analysis of almost 2 lakh patients and they looked at glycemic data from and patients on insulin and sulfonylurea. The mean age of the cohorts in this study was 66 years. 62% were age about 65 or older. 91.5% of these patients had at least one comorbidity. And what did they find? The highest HbA1c level, a mean of 7.7, .7, was in the younger age group, 18 to 44. Whereas the lowest HbA1c, 6.9, was in those 75 years and older. This is the glycemic management paradox. The antithetical relationship that over-treatment of those who are likely to least benefit and under-treatment by stricter control would have been life-extending. This is unfortunate paradox in the management of type 2 diabetes, which we see in day-to-day -day practice. Then we, the same authors again looked at patients with comorbidities. So patients who had no comorbidities had the highest A1C of 7.4. Patients with advanced comorbidities including dementia, cancer, end-stage renal disease, had the lowest HbA1c, a mean of less than 7. So the striking paradox of misaligned diabetes treatment could harm. Older patients with diabetes and multiple comorbidities are more likely to be treated to a lower HbA1c with insulin, exposing them to the risk of hypoglycemia. 
whereas younger, healthier patients who could benefit from more aggressive therapy had worse glycemic outcomes. Now let us look at the BMI paradox in diabetes. The normal BMI for Caucasians is 20 to 25, for Asian Indians is 18 to 23. We all know, and Dr. Tithankar very nicely showed, obesity and overweight increases the risk of hypertension, strokes, and all these things that are mentioned here. Obesity and cardiovascular disease, as the BMI goes on increasing, you have a relative risk increase steadily going up. So obesity paradox. Obesity is a strong independent predictor of cardiovascular disease in the absence of other risk factors. Obesity increases the risk for cardiovascular disease in primary prevention. And as such, clinicians and researchers have historically assumed that excess body mass would also be detrimental in secondary prevention settings. Now, obesity has been called the mother of all diseases. Obesity is the root cause of insulin resistance and so on. And historically, has been strongly linked to diabetes. However, there are still some paradoxes that exist in diabetes epidemiology and obesity, and there is no unifying hypothesis that has been proposed to explain this paradoxical phenomena. I'll explain to you what is the paradoxical phenomena. Obesity paradox. Can obesity be a friend? Patients with established cardiovascular disease who are overweight or obese have a better prognosis than leaner patients with cardiovascular disease. And this phenomenon is known as the obesity paradox. This is a meta-analysis of six studies, almost 22,000 patients, impact of BMI. If you look at the total mortality, cardiovascular mortality, as the BMI, low BMI has very high incidence of it. As the BMI overweight and obese, it comes down. For rehospitalization, with increase in BMI, obesity, severe obesity, it goes. But basically, cardiovascular mortality comes down. Very surprising. This is outcome from the origin study. After adjustment for age, sex, and all available covariables, co patients with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes and with prevalent cardiovascular risk factors, those who are overweight or obese have a reduced risk of mortality. CV mortality, composite or CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, heart failure for hospitalization. Those who are overweight showed a better outcome in all these parameters. Again, from the original origin study, patients with a low BMI, less than 22, have increased risk of mortality compared to those with a normal BMI. These findings contrast the conventional consideration that low body weight improves outcomes. There are other studies which have been shown in the European Heart Journal 2010. Large prospective study involving 2,50,000 patients followed up for 3.8 years. Overweight and obese patients have lower mortality compared to overweight and normal weight individuals. And similar findings here. And there is a U-shaped curve relationship between BMI and mortality. This is from the large Swedish study. So underweight BMI less than 18 had the highest mortality rate followed by the patients with normal weight, while the overweight patients, 26 to 28 BMI, had the lowest mortality. But here again, they found that when the BMI increases above 40, there is an increase. So that's the U-shaped curve that is seen. It goes this way, and as the BMI increases beyond 40, it increases. So obesity paradox. All these mechanisms supporting the obesity paradox found in clinical studies may be valid, but none is well established. In fact, a true paradox may not exist at all. Instead, we may simply be observing heterogeneous populations that have been poorly characterized into obese, non-obese groups by measurement of BMI alone without factoring in the type of obesity the level of inflammation, whether the patient has metabolic syndrome, whether he has a bad obesity, whether he has visceral obesity, none of this has been factored in. Individuals with a higher BMI may be actually physically fit and with less insulin resistance, better lipid profile, and therefore having lower mortality. This is our YY paradox. This is Yudzik and Yagnik from Pune. Both have a BMI of 22.3, but look at the body fat. 
in Indians. So we are the thin, fat Indians, and that's why we have more risk for cardiovascular outcomes. So the take-home message here, as far as the body uh, mass index, is, despite the presence of obesity paradox, substantial evidence still supports weight loss among patients with cardiovascular disease who are obese, especially when associated with increased physical activity and cardiorespiratory fitness levels. Now, weight loss paradox, type 2 diabetes, is it worth the effort? effort? These are the diabetes control programs or diabetes prevention programs where they had a diet and exercise and metformin in different arms. And what did they find? That lifestyle changes, there's a 58% reduction in the risk of getting diabetes. Effect of weight loss in patients with diabetes, fasting, cholesterol, LDL, triglyceride, everything comes down with weight loss in diabetic patients. And then came the look ahead study, randomized trial of 5,000 plus obese patients with type two diabetes, randomized to intensive lifestyle intervention. The goal was more than 7% initial weight loss, 175 minutes per week physical activity, outcomes, fatal MI, CVA, non-fatal MI, and 11.5 years of follow-up. And what did they find? Very good improvement in weight reduction. Physical fitness levels increased, well-being increased, waist circumference significantly reduced, glycated HbA1c significantly reduced. But what about the cardiovascular outcome? Not at all, no change. There is no improvement in the overall cardiovascular outcome. This is the paradox there. So the conclusion is an intensive lifestyle intervention focusing on weight loss did not reduce the rates of cardiovascular events in the overweight or obese patients with type 2 diabetes. The health paradox in the US, obesity is on the rise worldwide and so is it in the US. But with obesity rates climbing, the number of new diabetes cases in the US is coming down. This is a paradox. And actually in India, it is absolutely the reverse. Probably we have more central obesity and we are the thin fat Indians and that is why we are seeing more diabetes coming in. The Caucasians, when they become fat, they are fat all around. It is not just a central obesity which they have. Then we have the diet delusion and diabetes. Diet every decade, every five years, there is a new diet which comes in. You have these so many diets, so many fat diets and all so and so forth. And then came this pure study very recently in the, published in the Lancet, association of fats and carbohydrate intakes in, with cardiovascular disease and mortality in 18 countries from five continents and a prospective cohort study. And during follow-up, there were documented 5,796 deaths in this group, 4,784 major cardiovascular disease events. And what did they find? that higher carbohydrate intake was associated with increased risk of total mortality. Higher carbohydrate intake. But this total mortality is increased, but not the risk of cardiovascular mortality. Total mortality is increased with high carbohydrate intake. But look at the intake of total fat and each type of fat, which was associated with lower risk, total fat, almost 23% reduction. Saturated fat, almost 24%, sorry, for 14% reduction. Monounsaturated fat, 19%. Polyunsaturated fat, 80%. So higher saturated fat intake, which is against what we believe today, was associated with lower risk of stroke. They had lesser stroke in this population. So total fat and saturated and unsaturated fats were not significantly associated with risk of myocardial infarction or cardiovascular mortality. So interpretation of this pure study results is increased carbohydrate intake was associated with risk of mortality, whereas total fat and individual types of fat were related to lower total mortality. This is a paradoxical statement today. Total fat and types of fats are not associated with cardiovascular disease, MI or CV, whereas saturated fat had an inverse relation with stroke. More the saturated fat, less the chances of stroke. So global dietary guidelines should be reconsidered in the light of these findings. 
this is the paradox of your diet and fat so the final paradox is that good judgment comes from experience i repeat good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment this is what the final paradox of this whole thing is thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for a very patient hearing thank you sir thank you uh, dr jitendra sir uh, kindly unmute yourself yeah thank you vijay sir for excellent talk on given topic i i think i over to dr parikshit for the final talk and then we'll take the all the question answer and panel discussion at the end of all three talk yes sir yes sir um, it was really wonderful talk dr vijay panikar sir um uh, ab hamara vijay hua hai tai hua hai after the listening of paradox in the diabetes yes um, and uh, we heard lot many times uh, dr simon heller um many credits to his name and i think so he is a known name uh, among the indian fraternity also and uh, but uh, nevertheless simon heller is a professor of clinical diabetes at university of sheffield and uh, he is a director research and development and honorary consultant physician at sheffield teaching hospital foundation trust uk and uh, he was editor of diabetes is medicine and uh, he conducts a research program concerned with the developing a daphne intervention and uh, i think so in uh, light of today's talk actually um his research regarding the daphne intervention will uh, really help us to understand more about the hypoglycemia and his talk is on um, hypoglycemia and technology alone is not enough to solve the problem so in this conference itself we heard lot many technological advances and um, technology has really gained in momentum since last 10 years time um, and uh, but still uh, we have a very senior and very learned um, speaker who will uh, throw a lot of light on hypoglycemia over to you sir thank you very much for those kind words and uh, it's a pleasure to be asked to participate in this great uh, meeting so i'm going to share my screen and and i just want to confirm yes yes your screen is absolutely visible and you are loud and clear sir great Go thank ahead, you sir. very much so as you've heard my uh title is technology alone is not enough to solve the problem and these are my disclosures and this is the outline of my talk i'm very briefly going to remind you about the epidemiology of hypoglycemia and defining the problem and then one by one i want to consider the potential benefits sadly very briefly but we may have time to enlarge this in discussion about technology which is truly transforming the clinical picture of diabetes across the world but to remind you of the benefit of new insulins of course where they can be afforded and uh, to also uh, impress upon uh, the audience uh, which i need to remind myself every day is that education is a very effective way of reducing hypoglycemia now we have heard and seen technology and that includes new insulins transforming the last 20 to 30 years of diabetes and you might imagine as some clinical trials have shown that this has made a big difference uh, the dcct uh, i think was the first study which proved that microvascular disease and eventually macrovascular disease at least at those in early stages of diabetes could be reduced by intensive glycemic control and the price that was paid for those benefits back in the early 1990s uh, was 
a really high rate of severe hypoglycemia to remind you that severe hypoglycemia being defined as needing the help of another person to recover. So you can see a threefold increase uh, in severe episodes in the 1990s, uh, which brought glycemic benefits. If we forward to a fairly recent study, um, you can see that using uh, sensor augmented pump therapy could reduce hypoglycemia, but look at the frequency in both the controls and the uh, patients in the intervention group. And you can see marked reductions uh, in severe hypoglycemia. Uh, and you may therefore conclude that technology has uh, solved the problem of hypoglycemia. But if we look at real world data, and by that I mean uh, the kind of episodes of hypoglycemia which are being recorded in clinical practice on a daily basis, uh, and this is in the Western world, uh, Europe, and North America, you can see that the frequency of hypoglycemia, one is greater than the DCCT uh, and sadly has hardly changed at all uh, in the last few years. And you might say, well, these this the last study was about eight years ago. Uh, it's probably not uh, as bad as all that. Uh, but I could show you data from the HAT study uh, but this is a, a study presented as a poster in the recent virtual ESD meeting. Uh, it was from Stuart Harris's group in Canada, and they did a survey of over a thousand patients from North America, uh, a USA to be precise, and measured the incident rate, the same events per person per year, and the proportion, again, the same. Uh, and it also includes people with type two diabetes. Uh, and I think these are remarkable uh, and worrying findings because of what they show in everyday clinical practice that we have made almost no improvement uh, over the last 30 years. In their type one population, 3.5, that uh, severe hypoglycemia in type twos is about uh, a third, but these data show that it's over 50% as high. Um, and if we look at the proportion, you can see half the patients with type one and a third of those with type two have had a, a, a severe event over the previous 12 years. Not only that, but the, um, percentage of severe events which resulted in hospitalization was only around 4%. 90% were treated outside of the hospital. Uh, and of those, 50% uh, of those were treated at home. So the burden on the family and the friends is huge uh, and uh, shows we have a very big job to do uh, in improving things. Now, this audience knows the effects of hypoglycemia on the central nervous system, how it increases the rate, uh, risk of road traffic accidents. Uh, and in recent years, we and others have shown that hypoglycemia almost certainly has adverse effects on the cardiovascular system, which probably uh, limits the benefits of tight glycemic control, at least when using insulin and, and probably sulfonylureas. But we can address hypoglycemia. Uh, and I want to take these three areas one by one. First, very briefly, just show you some examples of how technology could and has reduced hypoglycemia, remind you uh, of the potential of newer insulins, uh, and then uh, finish by uh, also reminding you about education. So let's take technology. Uh, and certainly in many countries across certainly Europe uh, and in North America, uh, continuous glucose monitoring uh, as 
shown by flash glucose monitoring uh, and the Libra device has transformed the clinical landscape. Uh, and now around 40 to 50% uh, of type one patients in the UK are using these devices. Yet if we look at the evidence base for continuous glucose monitoring, it is rather limited, particularly in terms of randomized controlled trials. Nevertheless, I want to draw your attention to this study published in the Lancet fairly recently. Uh, they took 241 adults with type one diabetes. You'll note that these patients had pretty tight control to start with. Their mean A1C uh, was 7.5%. Uh, and they were randomized to either use the Libre or conventional blood glucose monitoring, measuring outcomes at six months. There was no real difference in severe hypoglycemia uh, and their outcome was uh, the hours per day less than uh, around 70 milligrams per deciliter. You'll notice that HbA1c didn't change. It, it remained around the 7.4% mark, but there was a modest reduction in uh, glucose below 70 uh, over the, the course of the study, which was uh, significant. So a really modest benefit. And if we look at RCTs, we, we struggle to see uh, the benefit, although in clinical practice, many patients uh, say this has really improved their quality uh, of life. Another study, uh, I think showing that if you take those most severely affected, then you can make a difference. But this is not a randomized study. This is uh, a study published in Diabetes Care. 35 patients with impaired awareness of hypoglycemia is defined by the gold score uh, and the effect on uh, using uh, on pumps or MDI, despite aggressive education, still having significant hypoglycemia. Uh, and when they were treated uh, with a CGM device, uh, they could show this improvement, as you can see on the right, uh, in terms of uh, hypoglycemic episodes uh, in people with impaired awareness. So in non-randomized studies, we can definitely show benefit. But technology isn't always uh, been shown to be successful uh, and people fail to cite these studies. This is the HypoCompass study. It was a two by two factorial, which compared simple education, uh, a couple of hours, weekly support from a healthcare professional uh, in all these patients. Uh, and some were randomized to pumps some were randomized to pumps plus CGM, and the results are shown on this slide. Uh, and please note uh, the uh, changes in these groups. The first thing to say is that if we looked uh, at those randomized to pumps or MDI, there was no difference compared to those who received education uh, and support. Uh, and in terms of other benefits, uh, education did just as well. Uh, and you'll notice the p-values uh, are all non-significant uh, for all these outcomes, whether it's annualized rate of severe hypoglycemia, the proportion affected, uh, and the impaired gold score. So what it's showing is that education is just as effective in a randomized trial uh, as technology. Here's another study which we published in the BMJ just three years ago. We compared uh, insulin pumps versus MDI in adults with type one diabetes in a cluster randomized controlled trial published uh, in the British Medical Journal. Uh, both groups received structured education. Uh, one group received pumps uh, and there were no additional benefits in terms of glycemic control or psychosocial outcomes and no difference in severe hypoglycemia. And yet in both treatment groups, the number of severe events was reduced by around 50%. Uh, the incident rate ratio altogether was 0.46, uh, 
uh, and the reduction was the same in both groups. Education is cheap, extremely cost effective, uh, and at least in uh, patients uh, who have yet to receive education, there is no benefit of pumps. So what else can we do? Um, how can we treat our patients more effectively? Just a couple of slides on uh, the potential benefit of insulin analogs, which I think is important. This is a study in type one diabetes. Uh, it was a randomized crossover study in patients at increased risk of severe hypoglycemia. Uh, and I would say in passing that we surely should be recruiting patients at high risk if we want to demonstrate the benefit of our interventions. You can see that in this study, there was a 30% relative risk reduction uh, in terms of severe hypoglycemia and indeed an absolute risk reduction of 0.5 severe episode per patient per year. And you can see shown in, uh, highlighted in gray, that the benefit is in reducing hypoglycemia uh, through the night. Uh, if you look during the daytime, there, there, the difference is are much less marked. And indeed, uh, in some you don't see any at all. The benefit is in reducing hypoglycemia at night for those at high risk of severe hypoglycemia. Uh, and this was um, uh, comparing human insulin uh, to uh, insulin analogs, both rapid acting uh, and uh, basal insulin as well. Uh, so the benefit at night, uh, and if we look let, at one of the new modern insulins, I'm going to choose insulin degladec uh, because this is a nice slide. You can see that if we look at the regulatory studies, the begin studies, switch to the crossover study, and lastly devote the large um, cardiovascular outcome trial, um, no difference in HbA1c. These were uh, patients all aiming for tight glycemic control, some reduction in fasting plasma glucose, a variable change in dose, but a consistent reduction in hypoglycemia. Uh, and for devote, uh, there was a nearly a 40% reduction in the risk of severe episodes. So insulin analogs, when they can be afforded, will make a, a real difference. Uh, and finally, what's the evidence about improving education? The first study is a study in type 1 diabetes. It's from Michael Berger's group. Uh, and what it showed was the effect of structured training, uh, their insulin treatment and training program, a five-day uh, inpatient uh, course. Uh, and what you can see here, is, as was shown in the DCCT, um, this uh, relationship between HbA1c as you come down, uh, an increase in the risk of severe events in the year prior to the intervention, uh, and in the year following uh, the intervention, you can see that that relationship has been abolished. So merely teaching people to use their insulin safely and effectively uh, in an intensive way can uh, reduce the risk of severe hypoglycemia in those who strive for tight glycemic control. And I think these are really important data which uh, people tend to forget. Now, you may say to me, what about type two diabetes? Uh, I would concede that the evidence is fairly limited, but here's a study from uh, South Korea in which they took 55 patients with type two diabetes on insulin uh, or sulfonylureas they randomized them uh, after a, a standard educational program to an additional one hour of hypoeducation. Uh, and those who had the additional education are shown in the black squares. Uh, and you'll note that within two weeks, uh, episodes of hypoglycemia, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, were halved uh, and remain so through the uh, 24 weeks uh, of the study. So again, evidence in type two diabetes uh, that uh, simple education uh, of just one hour can make a real difference to hypoglycemic risk. So uh, in my conclusions, before I have one other summary side, I think that technology, new insulins and education all have their place in addressing the problems 
of hypoglycemia, uh, although inevitably most of the evidence has been accumulated in type 1 diabetes. Education in type 1 diabetes uh, appears to be effective, much more cost effective, but sadly rarely adequately provided. Uh, and although we don't have a huge amount of evidence in type 2, I would suggest uh, that what we do have uh, suggests similar benefits. Uh, there are increasing alternatives to insulin in type 2 diabetes, as we've heard uh, from the previous session uh, today. Uh, but again, it's where they can be afforded. Um, so what are we to do in terms of our clinical practice? Well, this was um, a systematic review published in Diabetes Care fairly recently. It only applies to type 1 diabetes, but some of the benefits are likely to accrue from those uh, on insulin with type 2. So first and most effective is structured education in optimized intensive uh, flexible insulin therapy using insulin analogs uh, and possibly blood glucose awareness training, which is what BGAT stands for. For those who still have problems, then pumps uh, and possibly real-time continuous glucose monitoring could be added. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, for those, again, where it can be afforded, we now have very sophisticated technology of which more in a minute. But probably the most important thing is very frequent contact um, and uh, support from people who know uh, how to manage hypoglycemia. So what is the future then in terms of technology? Uh, and this slide uh, has been labeled progress towards an artificial pancreas and its effect of hypoglycemia. And it shows you six stages of which we're probably now reaching stage four. So the first pumps that we used were pumps which shut off uh, when uh, the patient didn't respond to their falling glucose, a combination of continuous glucose monitoring and pumps, um, which caused a 38% fall in nocturnal hypoglycemia. Then we had the predictive uh, pumps from Medtronic, which could predict hypoglycemia based on the rate of fall of hypoglycemia. Uh, and that caused a 60% fall in events uh, from a study published in 2000. And 17. Uh, the technology is becoming more uh, sophisticated because now uh, insulin doses above a certain glucose level can be <clears throat> added to reduce the risk of hyperglycemia. And then now we have the automated basal hybrid closed loop, uh, the 670G, uh, and a paper sharing both a fall in glucose less than 70 and uh, a greater fall in HbA1c. Uh, and we're on the verge over the next 10 years of seeing a fully automated insulin closed loop and a fully automated multi-hormone closed loop. Are these gonna be the answer to our problem? Maybe in type one diabetes, but again, they're gonna be incredibly expensive. But as we've been discussing this morning, giving insulin uh, in infinite amounts to people with type two diabetes uh, is gonna be something uh, to be carefully assessed uh, because uh, I would suggest this alone is never gonna solve the problem in type two diabetes. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention uh, and look forward to the discussion. Um, thank you, sir. It was a really wonderful presentation. Of course, uh, we will have a lot of technological advances uh, in the next coming many, many years. We will have a lot of artificial intelligence. But in the era of artificial intelligence, they say you will have a lot of information. Artificial intelligence will never take your wisdom away from you back. So that's the things for the education, I think, so for a diabetes. Um, with more and more educations, uh, we became more wise to manage our patients and pa patients themselves more better for their blood glucose level, and thereby we can avoid the hypoglycemia in much, much better way. So um, with this, we have finished all three talks, and uh, we will have a, a good time left for a discussion, actually, uh, 10, 10 to 15 minutes left. Uh, 
So uh, my first question to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Tirthankar Chaudhary, sir, that, uh, of course, uh, we must uh, think beyond HP1C uh, for any type 2 diabetes patient, in particular, what you, uh, you throw many, uh, many, many lights and many tunnels. Uh, but what is the single most uh, important point uh, which uh, one should look every time in type 2 diabetes patient beyond HP1? Well, uh, as I was saying, that the goal of managing diabetes is one is glycemic control. And I think we have a lot to do that beyond HbA1c, that is of course uh, absolutely essential that you should look at the HbA1c. But also the home monitoring is very important. Trying to identify uh, minor hypoglycemia is very important. And also it is very important as I said in my lecture, that you, you should try to see that we have, you, you have adequately covered what you can do in terms of preventing complication. That is blood pressure. That is your cholesterol or lipid levels, more importantly, LDL. You have to also see what you have done with the lifestyle and uh, weight reduction. I think these are one side, but as I said at the end of my lecture, one of the very important things I find that we have understood and realize the presence of heart failure or incipient heart failure in diabetes. As a very, so even at the very onset, trying to identify the BNP and ECHO, trying to see that early heart failure, because a lot can be done now in terms of medication. I therefore think these are something that I look in my patient when I see. And quality of life, education, psychological well-being are very important. One thing we try to forget in our busy clinic is that when a young patient comes, as you know, that we see more younger patients with diabetes than probably, in my experience in UK and Simon's experience, that was a more elderly patient. We are seeing 10 years before. And you can imagine the, uh, you can, we sometimes fail to understand the psychological impact of the diagnosis of diabetes in the patient. There is a lot of, lot of depression. He is the lead in the family, bread earner in the family. He has got a long life to live. So I think that needs to be addressed as well. Thank you. So I have Thank one you. more question to Dr. Tithankar. Uh, looking to the basic lifestyle changes, exercise and diet, particularly uh, for approaching a obesity group of patients for prevention of diabetes, at particular what point of time in your day-to-day -day clinical practice you will consider starting metformin, either by looking at BMI or either by looking at the HbA1c value? Patient is well, already doing all other lifestyle changes, exercise, weight reduction, or diet control and everything. But particularly for metformin in obesity group, when you will consider either by looking at BMI or looking at the HbA1c value? See, my answer to that is I, I'm not considering a metformin in my patient as a weight reducing drug. What I'm thinking is that why I'm using metformin. That would be to me a more important aspect. That what we're trying to achieve in the patient. If the patient has got an HbA1c problem, then I'll try to see that what is the standard of practice in this patient. As you know, that to start with the vast majority of the patient, you know that we have got a lot of non obese type 2 diabetes. We'll come to that, where you know we talk of metformin, sulfonylurea, TZDs. But the vast majority of patients probably is a candidate for metformin, DPP4, and SGLT2 inhibitor. Or more appropriately, I didn't say in creatine based therapy or GLP1 RA because of the cost, et cetera. But most vast majority of the patients are candidates for metformin your incretine based therapy and SGT2 inhibitor. Now, I'm not starting metformin on a patient uh, as a weight reducing drug. That's what my take. But suppose suppose my patient or obese patient having a BMI of 32 or 33 with HbA1c value of 5.7 or 5.8, will you start metformin in this? See, because it's falling, it is falling in metabolic type of patient. So this yeah. is an absolute ideal patient to start metformin. The patient has not fully established diabetes. But he's two things. Awesome. Two things. Number one is that why you are trying to use metformin. Are you trying to use it for weight reduction? Or second, no, no. are you trying to address hyperinsulinemia? If you can establish hyperinsulinemia, then of course you may have some uh, place. But I think it will be more appropriate to think of weight reducing drug like lifestyle intervention. Uh, as I said, that we are aiming for three to five percent weight reduction for any clinical outcome, and therefore. 
we, we have, to, if you want to change the metabolic syndrome story and get some improvement in terms of cardiovascular outcome, we need three to 5%. And we are aiming for a 500 to 700 energy deficit in the day-to-day -day calorie deficit that we are trying to create. That I will emphasize more. But, <coughs> sorry, if you can establish hyperinsulinemia, then you may argue a case for usage of metformin. But I would say that even early start, weight reduction procedure, lifestyle intervention, because my glycemic stimulants are okay, then I'm not using metformin normally as a weight reduction molecule. Sure. So I, I really want to um, heard a, a good comment from Dr. Vijay Panikar. Actually, this is a lot of paradoxical questions that Dr. Jitendra has asked. So <laughs> I would love to hear the comment from him. See, basically, when you have a HB1C of 5.7, I would think twice before putting a stamp of diabetes on him. I would repeat his fasting postprandial or for that matter, even get a post glucose sugar done to see if he's really a diabetic. If he is, then it's a different ball game. If he is not, lifestyle modification, weight reduction is what is the crux of the matter. No drugs are required. But if you have a diagnosis of diabetes, I mean, you could have a patient who was initially sugars were high with lifestyle modification. Now his HbA1c has come down to 5.7. Yes, you would definitely consider. Then look at his lipids. If his triglycerides are high, his HDL is low. That would suggest that he's got insulin resistance. If he's got a central obesity, he has insulin resistance. Then I would like to treat him for that insulin resistance. Because more than the glycemia, the insulin resistance is a major risk factor for all his outcomes. 80% of the patients will die of a cardiovascular problem. So that is what needs to be addressed. So a lifestyle modification will reduce insulin resistance, yes. But then if you have to consider a drug, yes, metformin, pioglitazone would be in there. But pioglitazone would add to his weight. So that's where SGLT2 would come in. So you have a whole... Today, you have many drugs which you can use and effectively treat your patients for long-term benefits. I am not looking at one year, two years. I am looking at 40 years, 50 years. You have a 30-year-old guy. He actually would stand to lose about 14 to 15 years of his life. And that is where you need to come in to actually treat him perfectly so that he, he does not lose those 15 years. That is the way I would treat it. So, so summarize sir, your answer. So GLP any patient, any patient of also, GLP one RDS are also in higher dose, are being licensed not in this country, but abroad in terms of weight reducing, like Lida in three milligrams, if I am right. So I think that is some option in your patient you're talking about. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Dr. Panikar told very nicely about IGT and hyperinsulinemia I was referring to. So in those cases, I think GLP one RDS in higher dose uh, for weight reduction is also licensed. I think so, Simon. Sir, I fully agree with you about GLP-1, but the only thing in our setting is it is cost prohibitive. Agreed. <laughs> totally agree. I say we are not licensed also for that but word to use. So, secondary. So, so, summarize, sir, your answer is any patient of obese with central obesity with sign of insulin resistance with low HDL and high triglycerides, even though uh, his or her blood sugar is normal, you should consider metformin. Lifestyle modification. Lifestyle first. modification is already there. Exercise is already there. Diet control is already there. Even though patient parameters showing insulin resistance sign by abnormal lipid values with central obesity in this group of patients, we should start metformin. That is what your conclusion. No, he has not been diagnosed as diabetic. But sir, HB1C with 5.7 blood sugar falling in normal value with full fledged sign of low HDL, high triglycerides, central obesity, BMI 33, Patient is doing exercise, diet control, and even though falling in high risk group of categories, so we should not start metformin? No, you will do a glucose tolerance test to see if he is a diabetic. You don't label him as a diabetic and start. So on purely metabolic syndrome based, we cannot start metformin unless he be fall into a diabetes category. With lifestyle modification, you treat each component of the metabolic syndrome aggressively. He I also agree that it's the lifestyle intervention, trying to get, get him down on the weight. And if you want to use something for weight reduction in this patient and with the metabolic syndrome picture you're talking, 
a GLP-1 RNA in higher doses may something along with early stat is an option. So I think I'll go that way, that line. I, I don't and think what is, is going to do. And what is the comment about SGLT2 people are using? Uh, I have seen the endocrinologist prescription. They are using SGLT2, particularly in addition to metformin also. Uh, to lose the fat cells and particularly we are, in spite of all full fledged aggressive approach for lifestyle exercise metformin diet control and even though patient is patient body is not responding they are adding low dose of empa or any any uh, sglt2 and patient uh, is uh, responding so what is your comments sir on this no that would be in a known diabetic who's now hba1c has come down to less than 5.7 but if he has not been diagnosed, sir, I have seen I have seen the cases of non di. I am talking about only non diabetic group of patient, particularly obesity with some falling in IGT or maybe pre diabetic range with HB one C value of five point seven or less than six. I can say, and I have seen the prescription that they are using metformin full phase. I also, even added SGLT two also, and the patient responded. So, the usage of any any your experience or any your comment on this? Yes, usage of SGLT two inhibitor. The indications are quite standard. You have got, you can treat it for metabolic control in diabetes, or you can take in non diabetes with cardio renal and other issues that, that is not in our parlance anyway. But anyway, the patient now we know that even a non diabetic with the recent studies are outcome that they can use there. But for us, the indication is diabetes for maybe with metabolic control or with the cardio renal and heart failure issues. So I don't think non-diabetic for weight reduction, I'll use as gel tenu. I don't think there's so any, we cannot. No, there's any such study that has, or any such guidelines that tells you use as gel for weight reduction. The way That's I would look at it is, at least if we say that he's a pre-diabetic. Yeah, IGT. Fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance, HbA1c in the pre-diabetic range, then yes, you would go the whole hog. You could give an SGLT2, you could give a metformin, you could give a pyo. Because in our Indian setting, insulin resistance is predominant. Yes. But if he has not been diagnosed as a pre-diabetic or a diabetic, I would reserve it. I would not jump and label him as a diabetic and, you know, I would just go for lifestyle modification and periodic checks. Dr. Simon, would you like to comment on it, sir? Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed the discussion. I agree. I, I think that if somebody does not have diabetes, I wouldn't give them metformin. And I'd like to remind everybody about the direct trial in the UK, which was surprising to me that at least a small proportion of people with, um, with diabetes could stop all their medication and they would go into diabetes remission. Now, it's not for everybody, but I think lifestyle modification, as you have see, said, is just so important. And I really enjoyed your lecture. And I think the, the other thing that we just forget, and you reminded us of, uh, is that if we want to reduce cardiovascular disease, we can treat with much better medication. We use statins and hypotensive drugs, which have a remarkable effect at reducing cardiovascular disease including stroke, uh, and we uh, focus on drugs which don't cause side effects, which are relatively cheap and which are incredibly effective. Uh, and I think we neglect those at our peril. So uh, uh, I have one question for Dr. Vijay Panika, sir. In your lecture, you have mentioned a pure study paradox Okay, by even weight reduction does not reduce the CV mortality. Similarly, there is a paradox about the fat the total fat on the contrary reduce the stroke chances at the same time fat whether it is using total fat MUFA or PUFA has showing no benefit on CV mortality. So according to particularly for diabetes group of with this abnormal lipid value. So looking to this paradox statin is must to prevent the CV mortality that's normally what we focus all diabetic group of patient average of 40. But even though if our patient asks us to which type of fat is safe for us what is your answer, sir? <laughs> <laughs> very, very complicated question, Jitendra. Uh, see, normally what I tell my patient is, use whichever fat you want to use, use minimum. Because the story of fat keeps changing every year or every two years. So, use minimum, whichever is convenient for their use. Don't try to change their lifestyle and say you take 
तिल का तेल और यू टेक कोकोनट ऑयल नो लेट देम फॉलो वॉट दे आर डूइंग बट यूज मिनिमम दैट्स ऑल नो चेंजेस दे दो द प्योर स्टडी सेज दैट मोर द फैट लेस द चांसेस ऑफ कॉम्प्लिकेशन कार्डियोवैस्कुलर the paradox we have to now look into it again obesity paradox those with a higher bmi have less chances of cv mortality but that could be that like i said in my own talk that maybe they have not looked at them properly i mean you could have mike tyson who has a bmi of 45 or 46 but he's got no fat he's all muscle he's fit so that you can't just go by bmi so that is where the paradox is coming and these are the paradoxes in life basically like my last last slide which said that we have to learn from our mistakes true and unless you commit mistakes you don't learn so it's true. something like that yeah oh, wonderful wonderful discussion is going on and i think so uh, but this uh, time is uh, uh, saying that please stop we are 12 uh, 57 so we just have to finish our talk because uh, in another session the dark hair gold uh, um, uh, oration is waiting for all of us and again with this regard it is again a paradox to uh, all of us because uh, <laughs> technology what has changed uh, type one diabetes management so paradox is going on so uh, we will uh, finishing this session um, i must congratulate and i'm really thankful all the learned speaker who threw a wonderful um, uh, session uh, today afternoon thank you thank you very much thank you thank you dr simon thank you all my friends here thank you thank you jimit thank you sir thank you very much we had a wonderful session right now coming from paradoxes also or hypoglycemia also and we are thinking beyond hb1c also so i thank you all for this wonderful session uh, we had a great discussion here and as dr parishit has said we are going to have the diacare gold medal oration in the next uh, uh, at 1 pm so we i i welcome you all in the suman shah hall at 1 pm to join for the diacare gold medal oration and, and again thank you our esteemed reporter dr rupam choudhury sir and our team chair persons dr jitendra patel and dr parishit goswami for wonderful handling of the session thank you thank you everyone
Hello, Lezek. Namaste, boss. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, great. Excellent meeting. I was listening to lectures yesterday. Very interesting. The last one in this year, I guess, for all of us. Yes, sir. Very good one. Hello. <clears throat> I think we will start Jimmy Sharp at two o'clock. Sure, and sir. Yes, sir. For the next session, we have all three speakers had come. Let's check. I can see Siddharthan. I can see. And uh, I think Rapasso will join a little later. But your session is very, very interesting because Let's check had come out with a very new topic, which is a chronodiabetology. Just uh, this weekend only on Friday and Saturday only, we had finished our national meeting of chrono medicine. Dr. N.K. Singh, who is very active in that and he's sharing today the session of your this, he's uh, active in chrono medicine. So he'll be uh, sharing your session. And then Siddharthwan is talking on diabetes and COVID. And again, from India, N.K. Singh, who is an eminent personal to talk about diabetes and COVID. So, with the right person to chair the session. So, over to Dr. Jimit. You can start with your thing, and then at 2 o'clock, you can start with the talk also. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. We all are back here in the post-lunch session in our Dr. R.M. Shah Hall. And I welcome all the delegates who have joined here also and who have joined on the other platforms also and who are seeing us live. Uh, I also welcome all the esteemed panelists here for this session. Today we are having a wonderful session of New Horizons in Diabetes and we have three wonderful international speakers joining with us for this session. And I'm sure we all will have a, a good academic feast here and to start the session, but before starting, we have a few housekeeping announcements. You can type the questions in the chat box or the question and answer box. Who are listening to us on the other platforms, they can also write down the questions which our technical team will uh, will forward it to us. And uh, as the proceedings are there, we will keep the discussion at the end of our lectures of all three uh, speakers. So we will have a discussion and question answer at the end of the session. We have dedicated time for that. And we are reaching, uh, we are starting on our time and I will invite our esteemed reporter, Dr. Nimi Mulwani. That her. I welcome her uh, and I ask her session by inviting the chairperson and for the proceedings of this wonderful session. Over to you, Dr. Nimi. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jimit, sir. Uh, for today's sessions, like Dr. Jimit explained, it's a new horizon in diabetes. And to chair the sessions, I invite Dr. N.K. Singh from Dhanbad and Dr. Manohar K.N. from Bengaluru. Over to Dr. N.K. Singh, sir, and Dr. Manohar K.N., sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. I'm audible. Hello? Dr. Nimi? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, yeah. sir. So good afternoon to you all uh, with my co-chairman, Dr. Manohar, a good friend of mine. And uh, I'm really thankful for the Dr. Bansi, who is doing an excellent job for uh, this conference. So today, I think this is a very, very exciting session. And as Dr. Bansi already told that uh, a new thing or something new concept in diabetology is going uh, to be delivered by Dr. Lejek 
uh, who was a specialist in the internal medicine. He is also a specialist in the diabetology, head of uh, department of diabetology and internal disease at the Medicine University of Warsaw. So he graduated from the Medical University of uh, Lodz in 1994, had uh, uh, foreign training and scientific internship at Oxford, London, and many places. And his clinical practice, uh, he focuses on the diagnosis of carbohydrate tolerance disorders and treatment of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Diabetes accompanying other diseases and complications of chronic diabetes. So I think he has done a wonderful job uh, in all such research papers. And he's also director for the ESD postgraduate course. So today, as uh, Dr. Bansi was telling, he, there has been some new concept. It has long been recognized that normal glucose-induced insulin secretions in humans vary across the day-night cycle. And the disruption of the circadian oscillations of glucose metabolism uh, is a feature of type 2 diabetes. It is being known for the few, I think, the couple, uh, few years back, there were lots of things happening in this field. So today, uh, the, he, I think uh, the, many things has uh, new has come up in this field. So I request Dr. Lejek to uh, start his oration, uh, sorry, his paper, and uh, let we will discuss this paper later on. So over to Dr. Lejek. Uh, good afternoon for you. Namaste. Good morning would be in my country because it's we just had breakfast in Poland. Uh, I'm delighted to join this conference. Uh, it's not for the first time during this COVID era uh, when Dr. Banshi Sabu is kind enough to invite me. Uh, I take it as a huge privilege and a pleasure. And I also admire all the technical skills uh, that this type of meetings can be successfully organized despite all the differences in time distance and through all continents. So I always give the examples of Banshee's conferences that if this is possible, anything is possible in the times of COVID. Uh, okay, let me, I hope you start seeing my screen. Uh, let me, during the next 20 minutes, present some concept really, uh, on the chronodiabetology, it's the name I've never encountered before, uh, but I don't think I am its inventor. It's the one I think I can use for this lecture uh, because that's the, the area which is not very frequently discussed. The reason is simple, I guess. Uh, if you look at the program of this uh, wonderful and very comprehensive meeting, but also other big national or global meetings, we concentrate on pharmacotherapy, we concentrate on complications. Uh, basically, we evolve around the drugs because this is what we as doctors are supposed to do, to prescribe medications. This is what the patients accept us, uh, expect us to do. But there is much greater, there are many greater issues about diabetes care as we know the whole lifestyle change, which is the biggest challenge of all, I guess, in diabetes care. And this uh, chronobiology or chronomedicine bit of diabetology is the one we probably uh, neglect uh, or did not, did, do not acknowledge enough. But nowadays we have more and more data that this is something which may help our patients uh, improve their diabetes control if we also pay some attention on their daily rhythm. Uh, the picture you can see now is the hospital where I work. I'm not there at the moment, I'm at home because it is Sunday. I'm also isolated because I've just eventually got coronavirus. I'm fine, no symptoms, but uh, I, I spend all Christmas, which is the most important time of the year for us in Poland and in Europe in general, uh, in solitary confinement, unfortunately. So I'm even more grateful that I had this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, the rhythm, circadian rhythms are well acknowledged, at least in one thing we do in all our patients, which is blood pressure control. This picture shows 
the regular, the normal blood pressure rhythm shown by this light pinkish areas here. This is diastolic and this is systolic blood pressure rhythm. Blood pressure, as we know, should drop by at least 10% overnight. It drops in healthy people by over 20%. And this blue line here is the uh, blood pressure recording during, during 24 hour blood pressure monitoring uh, seen in patients with advanced type two diabetes, something we call reversed blood pressure. And this uh, phenomenon is pretty well described. I also feel uh, I spent some time of my research days of the blood pressure regulation in type two diabetes. So I'm very much convinced. And as I said, we have abundant data. If you look at the papers at the date of the papers are not very new, where abnormal blood pressure rhythm affects uh, the organs and affects also diabetes complications. That's a simple paper published in Union Journal of Medicine almost 20 years ago, showing that abnormal nocturnal pattern, so being a so-called non-dipper when blood pressure does not uh, go as low as normally it should overnight, or it's even increased, it's higher overnight than during the day, that these patients have a greater chance of developing microalbuminuria. There are even more compelling data showing that patients with reversed, showed, showed here with R, reversed blood pressure rhythm as opposed to normal blood pressure rhythm with diabetes. This paper was published in diabetes. These patients have also much worse prognosis of survival. So uh, for that, uh, the, the conclusion from these studies, for example, was that the timing of blood pressure medication should be particular, some drugs should be given overnight, some drugs in the morning. That probably is not that important nowadays when we have majority of medications working for 24 hours, but clearly blood pressure is something, blood pressure rhythm variation, you may call it, is something we should look at. Uh, that's just to prove that I know what I'm talking about roughly. We also studied blood pressure regulation in patients who are morbidly obese and underwent gastric bypass surgery and showed that uh, this uh, very soon after the surgery, blood pressure returned to normal uh, rhythm soon after uh, uh, the patients were treated with Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. So that's blood pressure. That's something which is probably most common when we think about uh, 24 hour rhythm. But what does, it look in what does it look like in diabetes? Well, that's actually quite opposite because if we look at blood pressure at the blood glucose value in healthy people, this is the paper uh, published by the group of Chinese authors, uh, one of many you can find uh, showing that this is blood uh, glucose values in people who are healthy. There is no rhythm here at all. Or you can say that the rhythm is just, is, uh, the rhythm means maintaining blood glucose as flat as possible with a, a little change as possible. The top curve here is glucose uh, changes over the day in patients with newly diagnosed type two diabetes. And this is the middle curve here is this is what was achieved in these patients with newly diagnosed type two diabetes who are treated with multiple insulin injections from the start. So we can see two things here. One, those variability of glucose has decreased, which is good, but it is also very difficult to achieve normal glucose values in people with diabetes. We know it very well, but if we look at those lines in patients with poorly controlled or not treated type two diabetes, we see much greater changes in glucose levels. And there is a certain rhythm, of course. Uh, the tool which led us to appreciate it even more is con uh, continuous glucose monitoring systems. And if we look at these curves here, one day as we know is represented by one line, one curve of different colors. Uh, these on the left at the top here are shown the patient. This is a patient with type two diabetes treated with oral agents, excellent glucose controlled overnight, slightly deteriorating during the day, but still it looks very well. 
The one on the right here is also type two diabetes treated with oral agents had much worse control. This is type two diabetes treated with insulin, not bad overnight during the days, but very erratic during the day. A, a similar patient, insulin treated type two diabetes. And those two bottom, uh, bottom pictures show patients with type one diabetes where we see no rhythm, no pattern, all erratic, and treating these patients is just hell. Uh, it needs a lot of education. And bringing this glucose to this typical rhythm, which means no variation at all, is virtually impossible. So this, we can call it variability, but I'd rather call it the rhythm because I'm not going really to talk about glucose variability itself. It's a separate issue. I'd rather concentrate on 24 hour on or during the day, urinal circadian, different activities which may affect glucose control. Uh, we also, and just my final word about glucose variability, we also have data then these changing of rhythms may affect also mortality through glucose control. That's one of, again, many data we may find. This comes from the DEVOTE study where the glutag insulin was assessed and patients who had higher glucose variability, variability in this study had higher all-cause mortality. But the higher glucose variability we know now means also the higher risk of hypoglycemia, and this is what is associated with greater mortality. But the rhythm, in my view, in diabetes control is important. That's one of, again, my early interests in these maintaining stability of daily pattern in patients with diabetes. We did a really small study that only deserved a short letter in Practical Diabetes International, the British Journal for Practitioners, as you know, where we studied 74 type two diabetes patients and we took a very simple thing into account. We wondered, do the timing of insulin injection before a meal in type two diabetes has anything to do with glucose control? And what we came up with a conclusion is that insulin injection meal time interval is important, but it's not the length. It's not how uh, long or how much time before a meal insulin is, inject is injected. The patients who had the best uh, glucose control were the patients whose changes in this duration, uh, in this insulin meal interval duration were less than 15 minutes, simply those who took insulin at a stable intervals before meals, they have the best glucose control. So even these tiny things like maintaining stability over the day, like maintaining insulin injection to meal time interval may translate into improvement or deterioration of glucose control. So from different areas, whether we look from blood pressure glucose variation itself, glucose regulation, or administration of insulin injections, we may see some relationship with glucose control. And now we come to the concept of biological clocks, which is now developing uh, very rapidly, thanks to the knowledge we can all get from various studies. We know that there is a part of hypothalamus, which is called suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is where our biological uh, general clock, we may say, is located. Something which is responsible for us going to bed. It's not the sole mechanism, but one of the major ones. And nowadays we have the concept of central and peripheral biological clocks. And if you've never listened or studied uh, of this area, studied this area, you may be surprised that organs like liver, pancreas, wide adipose tissue have also their uh, peripheral clocks. They also work and excrete various hormones or their metabolites or absorb what they should absorb in a daily pattern. And <coughs> the documentation for this comes from the studies uh, mostly on shift workers, but not only, where aligned or misaligned daily pattern in the studies. Aligned means we behave as we should. We are awake, we are awake and active during the day and we sleep during the night. 
but those who are misaligned stay awake during the night and sleep rather during the day. And this translates into misalignment and all the diurnal patterns of many organs, even like stomach or, or adrenal glands. Uh, do this translate into glucose control? Well, it might. I show you some data from the recent American Diabetes Association meeting, where there was a very interesting session called Metabolic Changes Related to Alteration in Circadian Rhythms. There were two speakers and they argued that it's all about sleep and the other one argued that it's all about food intake. What, what, what's the timing of food intake? And the sleep is not controversial anymore. We now, we now know the less we sleep, the higher is our insulin resistance. The data from US show that 44, the patients who uh, work overnight uh, during night shifts, they are at least almost 50% more likely to develop type two diabetes. And as it happens before COVID era, at least, increasing number of people work during the nights. The, the earth, the, the globe does not go to sleep. Many of us work overnight, doctors, nurses as well, so we know what we talk about. Uh, over the last, let's say, 50 years, the duration of sleep decreased. If you see here the data again from US, in 1960s, people sleep well over eight hours a day. Now we sleep less than seven. Well, I personally sleep less than five, which is probably not very wise, but that's what I got accustomed to, and that's what my uh, work requirement is. I uh, work in a different city than I uh, live and that also makes me wake up very early. And we know that insufficient sleep leads to impairing of insulin sensitivity and that's actually quite an important element, uh, even more important than the diet as you can see here, uh, leading to uh, uh, increase of insulin resistance. This is a very interesting study published very recently in 2020, in this year, showing that just one night, just one night of sleep deprivation uh, shown uh, here, uh, brings uh, insulin resistance to the level shown uh, during six months of high fat diet. So, the effect of sleep deprivation is powerful in deranging hormonal system to decrease insulin sensitivity. In the same session, we could also hear that if we limit the sleep to five hours a day, it leads to the greater post-dinner snacks. But very logical, the less we sleep, the more time we have to eat. And people who go to bed late, they simply eat something else after the dinner, which is well, not beneficial at all. It simply increases the number of uh, the, the amount of calorie intake, but also affects the whole hormones. And this also has been proven and published recently that eating more calories at dinner late during the day as compared to breakfast even increases mortality from diabetes by almost twofold. So it is a serious matter. And that in the next step takes us to the concept of intermittent fasting, the very fashionable diet or meal pattern, which is now intensively discussed and also studied. There are concepts, as you know, that if we limit the window, the time window, uh, how long we eat, uh, that's basically beneficial metabolically. That's the study, and again, published very recently, only two years ago, that if we limit the food intake between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. and we don't eat after 2 p.m. So as for this day today in India, imagine that the lunch you've just had is the last one, last meal of the day. That might sound not very attractive, but it brings a lot of benefits. It lowers blood pressure, lowers oxidative stress, decreases eventually appetite, improves beta cell function, insulin sensitivity, and of course, lowers postprandial insulin. So maybe that's the way we should eat. That's the way many animals eat. The dogs in my country, that's the most popular pet. Dogs are basically fed once a day and that's okay. It's difficult for us to imagine we, should, we would be fed once a day, but those limiting time for the, the feeding window is probably metabolically quite attractive. And just to finalize my talk, uh, that's the one of the most recent studies published in Diabetology, our main journal 
European Journal, one of the two, three main journals in the world on diabetes, where again, two groups of patients were compared, one who had a meal during the normal day with full alignment of room light, uh, of, of uh, day and night, so being awake during the day and sleep during the night, uh, and the group which were compared were patients with misalignment the other daily rhythm, patients who sleep during the day and stayed awake uh, during the night. And then they all had a meal and then glucose and insulin secretion was measured uh, after this meal. And those who had proper day, aligned day, behaved as they should, uh, we can see that the glucose levels were lower and also insulin levels were more physiological and eventually lower. So just one night sleep deprivation, as I showed before, makes a difference. And imagine what happens when people sleep very little during the night and try to cover it during the day. And in this paper, we may find this complicated figure, but showing how many aspects of daily uh, day, including food intake and sleep pattern, might affect insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity. It may also help to explain or understand why some patients, even if we try very sophisticated pharmacotherapy, we are still not achieving good glucose control. So the final conclusions, but I don't have really the conclusions as the title of my talk is introduction to chronodiabetology. I'm rather here to ask questions for which we have no answers yet but just to provoke all of, us, all of us to think and maybe even to study that area. So at least four questions I would make for all of us to try to answer in near future. First, should maintaining physiological daily rhythm with proper sleep timing and duration, especially that when we sleep, we don't eat, uh, should it not become an important recommendation for our people with diabetes? We talk about lifestyle, when we talk about lifestyle modification, we talk about diet, we talk about exercise. We also talk about stress management, uh, but we should add proper sleep duration and also timing, but also meal, uh, the proper meal pattern. But we still don't know what the proper, the best meal pattern for diabetes is. Are patients with disturbed sleep and meal daily rhythm, are they at greater risk of developing chronic complications? We have no data yet. If they were shown, as I showed you at the beginning, we have the data on reversed blood pressure rhythm and relationship to the complication risk and even mortality. If we have these data, that would be a compelling evidence to modify our recommendations to the patients. What is the relationship between certain meal rhythm, like eating during six or eight hours during the day only? There are studies which try to prove that just eating for four hours during the day uh, has uh, an important effect. What about alternate fasting? One day fasting, one day eating. Uh, we all know the issue of Ramadan, which is a, a very typical fasting period. This also has been extensively studied. What is the relationship of these different meal patterns on long-term metabolic control of diabetes? Not much about calorie intake, but much about timing of calorie intake. And the last one, we go back to the medication, is using anti-diabetic medication with stable and flat profile of action, the ones we prefer now. We use oral agents, which act 24 hours, and we take a patients take it only once a day. We prefer stable long-acting insulins. We are now even using, as you know, and you are using as well, I guess, or you will be using it more and more once weekly, GLP-1 receptor analogs. Are they optimal in patients who will have disrupted sleep and meal pattern? Because that's the way they work. That's the way, that's the way they simply prefer to live. So these are just four questions I came up with. There probably could be many others. I do not expect any, any answers from you or from myself today, but that's the perspective we should be really thinking about in the near future, where we, without any expensive medication, finding answers to these questions might help our patients to control their diabetes better. Daniwa. Uh, 
Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Very interesting. We started thinking that sitting is a new smoking, and then sleeping. I don't know what we would name it. Uh, maybe in the next diacon we would find it out. I think we'll move on to the uh, next topic. But Manor, if we have any question related to this topic, because all three topics are different. So, I mean, even if you have some question, maybe related, or you may ask directly also if you want to ask. Him. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, again, okay, we... Manohar, I would like. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I would like to ask one question. Uh, actually, this is a chrono diabetology. Uh, already, our speaker has told that there are lots of questions, but hardly there is any answer. Uh, but I think uh, some uh, clock genes have been uh, found, like uh, BMIL1, and uh, it has been found that some peripheral melatonin. Uh, sort of receptors which he was also showing. So if it is uh, some uh, malfunction in the liver, there could be some metabolic problems. So my question is ki whether some, uh, although there is, you, know, I, you told that there is not uh, a clear-cut pharmacological intervention at present, but uh, lots of things are happening in the field with the melatonin tablet. Melatonin. So whether uh, in your part where melatonin is being used or not, or if it at all being used, <coughs> uh, some people are also using it in the for the treatment of the mild cases of Corona COVID-19. So uh, it also acts as an antioxidant, uh, becomes anti-inflammatory and anti-aging. So what is the, your opinion regarding the pharmacological intervention with the melatonin tablet? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Yes, that's. Uh, something which comes to mind when you uh, th when you when you think about the 24-hour rhythms. Uh, well, if you look at the evidence, melatonin is also popular in my country or in Europe, uh, mostly for jet lag or for sleeplessness. But if you look at the melatonin effect on metabolic control of diabetes, there is simply not a single study which would show its effect. So it's not that simple. It's not that we, when we take just melatonin, it will improve anything. The clock genes, clock genes work. Uh, we still need to learn more about, for example, how beta cell action is regulated by those clock genes. This is particularly important in type 2 diabetes. But little data on melatonin, well, no actually data that melatonin have, may improve glucose control. It's like... I guess another vitamin D, uh, where we know it's very potent, it's, it, it has many beneficial effects. <clears throat> there were studies, again, if v, vitamin D can improve glucose control. Well, not really, if you look at it seriously, maybe a mild improvement. Of course, if you do not have enough vitamin D, your levels are low, you should take it nevertheless. Uh, it's especially in Europe, yes, you, you're the country where you have much more sun than we have in Europe especially in northern part, but still it doesn't translate into improving of glucose control. So melatonin never really made it to any recommendations. I'm not surprised it's used for coronavirus as many other concepts, uh, ivermectin, uh, now in, in my country, amantadin is number one discussed, why we shouldn't prescribe amantadin to everyone. Uh, Today, with, when we talk about COVID-19, today is a special day because the first vaccine was administered in my country. The head nurse <clears throat> of the main COVID hospital in Warsaw got it. Uh, there are already 10,000 vaccines arrived from Brussels uh, yesterday and we start national vaccination program. Without vaccines, we'll be doomed for the next year or two. Uh, we all know it. So. I, I'm not really much hopeful about melatonin as we have the data now. Uh, thank you. I think that explains. Manohar? Any yeah. change of shift versus working continuously at odd hours? Is there any difference? And how do we know the duration of sleep and quality of sleep? So someone say if you sleep eight hours a day, one third of the life is gone sleeping. So some say five hours could be sufficient for them, like you are doing it. Well, of course, we not mas we are not all robots, machines. Yes, we are all different. There are people <laughs> who need a lot of sleep. I'm fine with four and a five, four and a half, five hours of sleep a day. 
Uh, although from my younger years, I'm rather a night owl. I'd rather stay longer overnight. When I was a student, I, um, I learned until 4 or 5 a.m. and then went to bed. Now I don't do it anymore because I have to wake up 10 to 5 a.m. Uh, but I'm fine. I don't think everything's bad with me. Of course, that's probably not very reasonable. And I may develop diabetes sooner or later. We will all have diabetes anyway. If we live long enough, that's, that's probably all our future. Uh, but the quality of sleep is another issue. Uh, I have, I didn't show it, I have 20 minutes, but at some time of my career, I also studied sleep apnea when uh, CGMS arrived. And we analyzed how CPAP treatment in sleep apnea uh, improved glucose control and insulin sensitivity in obese people or in people with pre-diabetes. And the effect was quite convincing. We had a paper published in sleep. It was one of the few papers, one of the first papers at the time. So the quality yeah, 220, of 220, uh, is yet another issue here. Plenty of things to study and pretty complicated because you have to, you cannot do it in a hospital really. You have to do this research in the nature environment of, of all of us, of, of patients. So it is challenging, but we simply do not appreciate enough how things we do in everyday life may affect uh, our metabolic control. Thank you very much. I think we are over short our time too. And uh, I think we'll move on to the next topic, diabetes and CVD, the double geopardy. I think this is more uh, related uh, to us and more commoner than what we had. Uh, to, to give this lecture, uh, we have Dr. Siddharth Von Sangdu from Indonesia. Uh, he was born in Amsterdam in 1944, graduated medical doctor in 1971, specialist in internal medicine 1984, consultant endocrinologist 1990, and PhD 2004 from the University of Indonesia, Jakarta. He's currently the professor of medicine and endocrinology, University of Indonesia. President of the Indonesian Diabetes Association for two terms and chairman of the Indonesian Endocrine Society for two terms. He initiated diabetes education programs and organizations in Indonesia, served two terms as executive committee member of the IDF Western Pacific region. Presently, Dr. Siddharthwan is leading the Indonesia Diabetes Institute and practicing endocrinology at SS Diabetes Center, Husada Hospital, and Silom. Hospital in Jakarta. Over to you, sir, for this important topic. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Manohar. Again, uh, thank you, Sabansi, for giving me the opportunity to be part of this very prestigious meeting. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, um, I'm uh, to talk about that diabetes and cardiovascular disease as a double jeopardy. Although at this moment there is a triple jeopardy with COVID, uh, but is going to talk with the next speaker. Um, the double jeopardy of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Uh, as we all know, that the burden of diabetes, according to the uh, IDF atlas that uh, the current trends continue, 700 million adults will have diabetes by 2045. The largest increase will take place where economies are moving from low to middle income status. Diabetes greatly increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Patients with type 2 diabetes have twice the risk of cardiovascular disease compared with the general population. Approximately 75% of people the type 2 diabetes, sorry. Are at risk of cardiovascular disease. Many people already have macrovascular complications by the time they are diagnosed. And worldwide, one person dies every eight seconds from diabetes and its complications. And 50% of deaths in people with type 2 diabetes are attributable to cardiovascular disease. 
85% of deaths from CPD are due to atherosclerotic CPD, including heart attack and stroke. CPD was the cause of death in two out of three people with type 2 diabetes, more than 70, 65 years of age. On average, at the age of 60 years, life expectancy is reduced by 12 years for a person with type 2 diabetes who experienced a heart attack or stroke. Type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and kidney disease are all interrelated disorders. As you see that 35% to 45% of diabetes with heart failure have CKD. 20% of, to 44% of patients with type 2 diabetes have also CKD. 76% of patients with CKD and type 2 diabetes have CKD. This chronic kidney disease, heart failure, type 2 diabetes, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the 32% of patients with CKD have type 2 diabetes. They are all interrelated. The pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease in patients with type 2 diabetes is very complex. Type 2 diabetes shares common risk factors that cardiovascular disease and contributes to vascular damage. Risk factors for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease are physical inactivity, high blood pressure, poor diet, smoking, obesity, dyslipidemia, and metabolic syndrome. And the direct effect of hyperglycemia are arterial, arterial stiffness, endothelial dysfunction, oxidative stress, platelet activation, inflammation, metabolic syndrome, metabolic dysfunction, patients, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. As we know that the cardiologists now, it started with the European Society of Cardiology. They uh, differentiate CV risk categories and recommendations for management of dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia according to risk, very high risk, high risk, and moderate risk. The very high risk are patients with diabetes and established cardiovascular disease or other target organs, target organ damage, as proteinuria, renal impairment, or three or more major risk factors, age, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoke, and obesity, or early onset of type 1 diabetes of long duration. High risk are patients with type uh, diabetes duration more than 10 years without target organ damage, plus any other additional risk factors. And moderate risk are young patients with diabetes duration less than 10 years without other risk factors. As you see here, that Patients, every patient with diabetes are at risk. Yeah, the moderate risk, diabetes less than 10 years. What about the ADA? Also, they differentiate also, uh, for treatment of ADA, for uh, starting treatment. Diabetes age 40 for 75 years without ICPD, use moderate intensity statin. Diabetes at higher risk, especially those with multiple atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, risk factors, or age 50 to 70, year, 70, 70 uh, years, it is reasonable to use high intensity statin therapy. Just almost every diabetes patient is recommended to use statin therapy. And even the American College of Cardiology 2019. If, uh, uh, for treatment of type 2 diabetes for primary prevention with cardiac of cardiovascular disease. If the patient has diabetes, A1C 6.5 consistent with type 2 diabetes, you suggest dietary counseling, uh, 150 minutes per week, moderate to vigorous physical activity, and then consideration of metformin. But this is very important here. Aggressive treatment of other risk factors. Because here you see that it's not only glucocentric aggressive treatment of other CVD receptors, including lipids. And the AACE, they have the new guidelines also, that diabetes is a high to moderate risk and the LDL target should be less than 100. These guidelines 
change the paradigm, how to treat diabetes and cardiovascular disease. This, he said that lifestyle therapy, severely respects algorithm, starting therapy to target the cyber LDL levels. The extreme risk level, diabetes and clinical ICPD, the LDL, LDL, uh, LDL goal is less than 55. And the high risk diabetes without other risk factors, age less than 40, LDL goal less than 100. This almost every diabetes patient is, should be treated with statins. But you see here that the cardiology, the cardiologists, they said that the, the sweet spot cardiovascular reduction in diabetes in June 2019, the paradigm for cardiovascular risk reduction has shifted more and more to embrace the concept of treating the patient, not the disease. We are no longer considered internists, cardiologists, or endocrinologists. Instead, we have become true physicians, crossing interdisciplinary lines and blurring boundaries between disease. If we say diabetes, in our mind, we have to think about diabetes, cardio, vascular, and renal. That's not only glucocentric. That means we need collaborative approach to clinical management of patients with type 2 diabetes. A team approach to diabetes care can effectively help patients cope with the fast array of diabetes or safety complications. Considerations for optimal collaboration to improve health outcomes include we have to define the roles of each uh, physician and its responsibilities. There should be effective and established communication between them. The multidisciplinary approach for clinical management, and then by, the, by then understanding the patient journey. Multiple complications require multiple approaches. As we know, uh, diabetes, the microvascular complications, the eyes, the kidneys, and the peripheral neuropathy, the peripheral nervous system, the macrovascular complications, brain, cerebral circulation, heart and coronary circulation, peripheral vascular tree. We need ophthalmologists, we need nephrologists, neurologists or podiatrists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, psychiatrists, cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, vascular surgery, orthopedic surgeons. There's profession uh, involved in the care for long-term management according to the AD standard, endocrinologist, ophthalmologist, podiatrist, orthopedic surgeon, renal and cardiac physicians, mental health practitioners, pharmacists, dietitians, nurses, yeah, and pharmacists. All these need to be worked together. And patient-centered care provides optimal outcomes for diabetes care. Early screening and close monitoring can prevent disease progression and complications. Early treatment and treatment intensification, we have to adhere the guidelines recommendation to ensure that appropriate treatment is provided and without delay. Patient empowerment, ongoing diabetes self-management education and support are critical to prevent and reduce long-term complications and collaborative multidisciplinary team approach and referrals, routine monitoring and a system, system, uh, systemic referral process ensures consistent and ongoing patient support and care. To prevent disease progression and complication, primary care physicians, allied healthcare professionals, specialists, and patients should work together. You see here that diabetes is a multi-pathology disease. It needs a multifactorial treatment and multidisciplinary approach. These are the steps. Step, first, first step is anthropometric uh, clinical assessment. Second step is risk assessment and discussion of goals. And the third step is treatment using multifactorial algorithm. Lifestyle therapy algorithm, obesity algorithm, brain diabetes and diabetes algorithm, and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or gastric heart algorithm. Each has this algorithm. This, the trend is like this. Cardio diabetology, endocrinologists, and cardiologists working together to improve clinical outcomes. It's already mentioned in uh, 
2016 by cardiology. You have to work hand in hand. Cardiodiabetology or diabetes cardiology. What do the cardiologists do? In patients with established CPD and known type 2 diabetes, assess glycated hemoglobin and fasting plasma glucose for initial screen plus OGTT if others are inconclusive. Recommend evidence based SDA2 inhibitors or GLP1 receptor agonists in referral patients with newly diagnosed CPD or at high risk. Initiate evidence-based SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP receptor agonists after hospitalization, hospitalization for CVD events. Collaborate with endocrinologists or primary care practitioners for type 2 diabetes management and risk factor management. And the endocrinologist, his job is assess CP risk factor, refer to evaluation of CPD of if clinical indicated. And initiate evidence-based SGLT2 inhibitors or CRT receptor agonists and referral patients with newly established CPD or high-risk CPD. Collaborate with cardiologists, primary care practitioners, and risk factor management. This why do you need multidisciplinary care patients of the car pathway? Yeah, nephrology, cardiology, internal medicine, energy, needs to have to screen for type 2 diabetes risk factor optimization, and then evidence-based therapies this influence multi-system health, building collaboration to create new dimensions in patient care. Time to think beyond A1C, not glucocentricity, CV outcomes and mortality, we have to work together, a shared goal between diabetes care and cardiac care. In my place, I create the diabetes connection care, cardiologists, Diabetologists, endocrinologists, nephrologists work together. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, sir, for the crisp presentation. Any questions? I can't see anything in the chat box. I think uh, Dr. Eugene Brownwald uh, had already said that cardiodiabetology would be a new field of medicine, and uh, I think this was brought out very well by the speaker. Uh, I, I don't know if the co-chair has anything to say. Uh, yeah, it was an excellent presentation, Manohar. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I have, my question is that uh, cardio diabetology he showed very well, and there is a big uh, connection between the cardiac and the diabetes problems. So my question is that today we have some drugs so, and there are lots of uh, papers uh, have established that if you start a combination therapy from the very beginning of this uh, diabetes, uh, like SGL2 inhibitors or GLP-1 are agonist, but uh, I find that even in the established cases of uh, heart failure, reserve dejection fraction cases, cardiologists are very reluctant to, at present I see that uh, most are not using it even when it is indicated. So I think a new concept is coming that uh, apart from waiting for all the cardiac problems to come up, so whether we, is it uh, not uh, today, the, is it not happening or is it not the message is coming from the, all the established papers, new papers, that from the very beginning, we can start with metformin, some sort of uh, drugs like SGL2 inhibitors, or uh, if it is possible, GLP-1 or agonist in selected cases or where available. So what is the opinion of uh, the speaker on that this subject? So this is my question. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, if we see a uh, look at the guidelines, we divide our patients into two. If the patients have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, then we have to treat differently. But how do we get these patients if we don't check the cardiovascular uh, uh, um, examination because you need to be to, to prove let's say about established uh, risk uh, of cardiovascular disease you have to be uh, yeah, the patient more than 55 years has to be uh, checked whether they have stenosis carotid peripheral and uh, coronary if it is more than 50 percent then it is risk but if you don't check that, 
You don't get this. But how to check? We have to ask the cardiologist to do, do the doctor. We cannot do. And even um, if, if, if it is established cardiovascular disease, okay, if the patient has a stroke, infarct, you can find. But the risk, the high risk, you have to check the stenosis. And therefore, you have to work together. Otherwise, you lose. And also, the, the other patient also, heart failure. If you don't check the echo, then you don't get echo. How do you know it has a uh, infection? Because we have to work together. Otherwise, you cannot start at GLT-2, you then cannot say GLP one because you lose the heart failure patient. You lose the high-risk patient because you don't ask the cardiology to do it. That's, that's, that, that's the point. Thus, we have to look. Yeah, because 25% of all diabetics are with ICD. But if you don't check, you lose. I, and now no, the, the latest guidelines, metformin, you can use, but if there's been a, a high safety or high risk, metformin can be, you don't need to be, uh, look for A1C. Even any A1C, you just start with SGL2 inhibitors or GF1 receptor agonists. I know it is expensive, but it's the way to do People, we have to serve them and check also because otherwise we don't find this patient. Thank you. I think uh, we want to the next talk. We yeah, are related to the current pandemic situation. COVID and diabetes is the talk. Okay, thank you. Can you to speak it all the way from Portugal, we have Dr. Joe Raposo. Joe Philip Cancela Santos Raposo. I hope I have pronounced it Perfect. right. Thank I don't know. Perfect. Thank you. Graduated in medicine in 1988 by the medicine faculty of University of Lisbon and got his PhD in medicine and endocrinology in 2004 by the NOVA Medical School of NOVA University of Lisbon. He had his endocrinology residency in Portuguese Cancer Institute, being a consultant of endocrinology since 2006 at APDP, Diabetes Portugal. He's a member of executive committee of the DESD, Diabetes Education Study Group. Currently is an assistant professor of public health in NOVA Medical School of NOVA University of Lisbon. Over to you, sir. Uh, just uh, last week, I and Dr. N.K. Singh, we were involved in a meeting called as Coronocrinology. So I was just trying to bait, uh, I was trying to patch up these two words and I, was, I had organized a meeting and it would be a good learning experience for us to hear what you get it from Lisbon. Thank you. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you to all of you. Greetings from Portugal from um, an early morning on Sunday here, a sunny Sunday in December, which is good. And it's a, my pleasure to be with you and having learned with you also. It's always good to share experience from all around the world. And I must say a very special word to Dr. Benchi Sabu, my dearest friend, who is still organizing all this thing and putting all this thing in place, which is, I realize it's a challenge. But so without further ado, let me share my screen. And here we go. Okay, so the topic was about two pandemics in collision and we've heard by my previous speaker about the diabetes and CVD and now we also have diabetes and COVID-19. And today is a very special day also here in Portugal and in European Union, since we have just started today the vaccination process for COVID-19. So what I propose to discuss, it's the possible links between diabetes and these new viruses and then speak a bit, a little bit about the COVID-19 pandemic with people with COVID-19 with diabetes and people with diabetes without COVID-19, which still needs our care. And how can we merge and take care of this process? So the question is what to do, what to adapt and what to create. So this is not for sure new for anyone here in the audience, I hope. But uh, I, I just want to compare how we deal with these two pandemics. So for many, many years, 
we and at IDF promote the IDF Atlas with these huge numbers of people with diabetes all around the world. And guess what? We are speaking about millions and millions of people all around the world. But up to this moment, we are really not frightened about this scenario. So for us, this is normal. And as I've heard in two talks before, it seems that we are all doomed to have diabetes. So nothing to take care about it because it's inevitable. But I really think that we must stress that it's possible to do different things as it was demonstrated with COVID-19. So when we speak about the COVID-19, uh, it's very similar. We showed the numbers, but that was still, and we are all afraid of COVID-19 for the right reasons, I hope, but still the numbers are very, very at a low rate compared to diabetes. And it kills less hopefully and luckily than diabetes. But it's all around the world with a clear geographical distribution considering the different waves of COVID-19. When we speak about diabetes, we speak about this growing prevalence of diabetes and we are always speaking about how we fail with the projections for the next 10 years, 20 years or 30 years as is clearly demonstrated in this IDF atlas here. And when we speak about COVID-19 cases worldwide, and this is quite recent data, we always speak about the growing evidence of the numbers with different geographical prevalences all around the world, the same as in diabetes, and the same about undiagnosed cases. And with diabetes, we know that diabetes even if we say it's, it goes to all people all around the world, it doesn't affect in the same way people all around the world. We know that the prevalence is still higher in high income countries and similar to middle income countries, lower or perhaps a little bit lower in low income countries, but uh, it affects different people in these countries. So it, it, it's really, the social determinants in diabetes are really relevant as are in COVID-19. And it is also clearly demonstrates the, by the IDF Atlas, the different distribution between urban and rural areas all around the world. And as I told you before, the number and proportion of adults with undiagnosed diabetes per different regions we are always speaking about 30, 40, 50% of people with diabetes and diagnosed in different parts of the world. And guess what? And these are for the CDC estimates from February to September, 2020. So even for people hospitalized, as you can see here, just one in 2.2% of the people hospitalized were reported one in 6.7 of symptomatic illness were reported and just one in 7.2 uh, cases, infections were reported. And this means that even for COVID-19, which is a recent disease where all the people are aware of the importance of relating and reporting this disease, we are clearly underestimating the number of people affected. So as you can see for the United States, it means that 91 million of people estimated total infection, 77 million had symptomatic illness and 3.4 million estimated hospitalization, a higher, clearly higher number than the reported numbers. And again, the burden of the, of the disease is measured just not by the number of people affected, but for the money that we spend on those persons. And clearly there are geographical and income disparities all around the world, as is clearly demonstrated for diabetes. And I just put it here from OECD, the possible burden for the COVID-19 representing a clearly a uh, higher risk than the 2008 financial crisis for the sustainable development of many countries in the world. And so uh, if you can see here for the COVID-19, it really represents much less money in the systems, in the economic systems, 
And this is clearly a threat for the government, for economy, for finances all around the world. But while we take care of these in COVID-19, diabetes has been all around for decades doing exactly the same and we don't see the same perspective. So something that I like to talk when giving this kind of, of speeches, the perceived value of the disease. Diabetes is perceived as a normal banal disease while COVID-19 is a threat to all of us. But coming back now for this strange relation between diabetes and COVID-19, from the early reports, and this is an early report from the Korean Diabetes Association, it was always possible to see that the prevalence of diabetes among people with uh, coronavirus COVID-19 patients was about 13, uh, 10 percent in all cases of infection. And if you see the middle um, panel here, the diabetes prevalence among severe cases is much higher than among non-severe cases. And the same here, the diabetes prevalence among survivors of COVID-19 compared with non-survivors, uh, it's clearly different. Diabetes is demonstrated here from an early beginning that it was clearly a risk factor for the serious forms of COVID-19. As you can see in the bottom panel, the mortality in diabetes is clearly higher than the mortality in non-diabetes in different series. And this was in Korea, but it's the same all around the world. And I just show you a number from Portugal here, where at an early reporting here also in Portugal, where we had 20,000 cases of COVID-19, 5.3% were in people with diabetes, where people with diabetes were slightly, slightly no, considerably older with uh, a similar gender proportion, but the mortality, while the global mortality in COVID-19 was 2.5, in people with diabetes was 7.2. So three times more mortality in COVID with diabetes than with COVID without diabetes. And clearly we know that it's not just the case for diabetes. And so this is also a, a report from China where we have the diabetes clear. And we can see with the red line, diabetes was clearly a risk for poor outcomes during hospitalization. But even with people without diabetes, and we can see in the, in the purple box in the bottom, getting to the hospital, with a fasting blood glucose higher than normal represented an increased risk to poor outcomes during hospitalization of COVID-19. So clearly high uh, level of blood glucose is also a risk factor for poor outcomes. And this comes to the previous communication where we are always speaking about CVD risk in diabetes, but 10 years ago, we were also discussing CVD risk with pre-diabetes because we always knew that a higher level of glucose, slightly higher than the normal, is already a risk factor for CVD. And we are just not taking care of that also. And so the other discussion was about, and here in Portugal at least, it was a huge discussion about if both types of diabetes were different, type 1 and type 2, and we know that both types of diabetes, and this is data from the UK, where they, as you can see uh, on the right uh, graph, age is clearly uh, as a linear trend with the risk of mortality in hospital mortality. But if you look at the bottom part of the graph, type one and type two diabetes are clearly also both of them risk factor. And to be honest, if we see here the difference, it seems that type one diabetes demonstrates a higher risk for mortality in hospital than type two, but the numbers are quite different as we know. So the conclusion of this paper was the result of this national wide analysis in English so that type one and type two diabetes are independently associated with a significant increased odds of in hospital deaths with COVID-19. So why 
and what's the connection between, between COVID-19 in people with diabetes and these poor outcomes. Well, as I've tried to demonstrate, it's not a question of age. It's not just a question of, of diabetes per se. The glycemia is really important. And in this paper uh, co-authored by Stefan Del Prato, early also, it was in July, the reason for these poor outcomes should be multifactorial, probably reflecting the syndromic nature of diabetes. So it's about age, of course, it's about sex, ethnicity, and comorbidities such as hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and probably it's this pro-inflammatory state and pro-coagulative state that we, are, we all know that exists in diabetes, especially in poorly controlled or not optimally controlled diabetes, that contribute to the risk of these worse outcomes. So it's tried to be demonstrated here where we have the infection of the, this new virus contributes with the, probably with a direct, direct effect on beta cells through or not through this cytokine storm. And so we'll have at, at admission hyperglycemia, this worsening metabolic control in patients with diabetes. And probably we have new onsets on diabetes and we have a worldwide study now trying to report the new cases of diabetes in the sequence of the infection with SARS-CoV-2. But so we, and just to emphasize this, obesity, inflammation, coagulation, hyperglycemia, either connected with the ketoacidosis or hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome, the older age, the hypertension and cardiovascular disease and the renal disease all contribute to this poor outcome in COVID-19, which is also represented here with, and I just put it here because there's also kind of discussion with the status of vitamin D and as either social determinants or genetic determinants, we have some ethnic groups that also are reported to have a poor outcome, poorer outcomes of COVID-19 when getting to the hospital. And then we have also to try to understand if it's the drugs that we are using for diabetes contribute to better, poor or indifferent outcomes during the COVID-19 uh, infection. And as you can see in this table here, uh, apart from the disadvantage that we recognize in many of the drugs that you are use, using in diabetes, so metformin with the risk of lactic acidosis and uh, SGLT2 inhibitors with the risk of hypovolemia, GLP-1 receptor agonists with the gastrointestinal side effects and aspiration, the sulfonylureas with the risk of hypoglycemia, the pioglitazone with the risk of fluid retention and heart failure, and the insulin with the risk of hypoglycemia. But there are advantages also in many of these classes. And the only one that, as you can see in this table, doesn't report any advantages are the sulfonylureas. And for people when getting to the hospital, we have the interactions with the COVID-19 treatments. As a, uh, and as you can see here in the table, many of the drugs used here can interact with many of our antiviral drugs. But then, as I told you in the beginning and getting to the end, I hope, and we also have to take care about people with diabetes and with no infection. And for that, this is a report from the ADA and it's just to how to take care of the risks, management and learning from other national disasters. So, what we had to implement also here in Portugal, and I think in, in most of the countries all around the world, was how to promote the care of people with diabetes during this pandemic. And I think we all get to the same conclusions. We had to keep contact with the healthcare professionals through the use of telecare, even phone calls here in Portugal, face-to-face -face consultations for urgent podiatry and ophthalmology and many other situations. And we had increased a lot of the community and self-management of people with diabetes with their community and creating groups of support in local areas. As you can see, and it was also a point of the previous speaker in this communication, patient education, 
is a key factor for diabetes care ever and ever. So keeping the clear point of contact for all patients, the reiteration of sick day rules and repeat prescription for 28 day supplies or longer and proactive review of patients. So patient involvement, patient empowerment, increasing the health literacy of patients is clearly the key point of success in diabetes care. So for this part here, just to remember that people with diabetes are really the diabetes manager. So increasing their education, empowerment, capacitation, whatever you call, increasing their health literacy, keeping the system focused on, on people with diabetes needs, be proactive and be sure to involve all the strengths in the community are really important. And just for a last word for vaccination, and this is what the recommendation for the uh, National Academy of Science in the United States, where they put people with type 2 diabetes at an increased risk of severe illness. So they should be in the first group of people getting the vaccine and people with type 1 diabetes mellitus. And in the second group, as you can see here, the people with diabetes are in the phase 1b for vaccination. And this is not the same all around the world. I must tell you that in Portugal, uh, people with diabetes with no other strong comorbidities are in group two of the vaccination. And just the last comment, diabetes like COVID-19, and this was published in the Lancet uh, last month, uh, diabetes is a wicked problem. And the wicked problem is those problems that we cannot solve just by scientific solutions. And we should take care as globally as possible, as was demonstrated by my previous colleague. So if you want to put in place a digital diabetes ecosystem, we should connect personal consumers, like food choices, physiological, sleep patterns, behavioral, like physical activity, psychological, the mood, either entomal, hair quality, and genetical data with an understanding of social preference like family meals versus eating alone. And those, these ecosystems should be integrated with our workload. So taking care of our job as doctors, as clinicians, and still maintaining the empathy with the user. And for that, I reached the end. Thank you for being patient to hear me from Portugal, stay safe. And for those in transition of the year, I wish you a happy 2021, better than this one for sure. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Manor. Thank you, it was a fantastic lecture. Uh, well, uh, how is the experience with use of insulin in diabetes in COVID time? It's the mainstay treatment here in, in a hospital. So for, of course, depending a little bit of the in type two diabetes when, uh, when they get to the hospital, but most of them are in uh, with a higher uh, yeah. blood glucose levels. And so it, we change them to insulin from the beginning for many of them not taking care of the oral drugs and stop and getting back to the, when discharge, getting back to the older medication. And many of them, they can easily go to back to the oral medication if they are in oral medication after discharge. But during inpatients, we change to insulin as in many other situations before COVID-19, as you know. Yeah, quite very true. That has been our experience. Uh, the amount of insulin, what we use, it's phenomenal, actually. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it is stress hyperglycemia. Is it insulitis? Is it the gene, H2 gene? Is it steroids? Even remdesivir, whenever we use, they say it causes. And they come down dramatically post-discharge yeah. to their previous levels or even better. So that has been our experiences. Yeah, and uh, hydration right. status, uh, is there any discrepancy when you in the hydration status when you manage covid uh, patients who are impending ARDS like you want to keep them hydrated well or keep it keep them dry this is another area of controversy where we get into the ICU intensives mm. where they want them to be a bit dry so your opinion on it, that it, well I, I don't treat in, in ICU so I, I I'm aware of that discussion uh, and it's still 
it's a debatable question, as, it, as you're saying, because it, during the ICU, they want it a little bit on the dry side because of not having fluid overload at all. So they'll have the pulmonary system, the ventilation without as possible fluid in the lungs. But for the other side, we have a little bit on, on the metabolic side, yeah. we are in, on the risk of a, an hyper osmolar syndrome which we all know that is associated with poor outcomes. But this is a very difficult balance and I'm not aware of any clear results on, on any side. So sorry, but it, it's a debatable question, as you have said. Uh, I think uh, this is a fantastic uh, summary of the COVID and diabetes by you. Thank you very much. So I think uh, Thank you, sir. you have summarized everything, uh, whether diabetes poses a significant risk for a general population, or you told clearly that the mortality risk with the diabetes, how it increases. And you also told something about the new onset diabetes. So just I want to know that, uh, have you some follow of the new onset diabetes in COVID cases, whether what is the fate of such cases, whether they finally return to the normal normalcy or I think they become normal or they continue to be a diabetic patient. So, or rather you have seen more destroyed induced diabetes so what is your opinion about that? I, I, I think we are seeing both cases. So we have this, the diabetes on sequence of stress, hyperglycemia, or transitory beta cell damage like the insulates that uh, our colleague was speaking. But there are anecdotal uh, reports of also an increase of type 1 diabetes, as is also demonstrated with other viral uh, infection. So uh, the question now, and it's still now on study, is to check if this COVID-19 viral is more prone to develop this type 1 diabetes than the other viral infections. And we should know that somewhere in the next year, I hope. But we all know that this, as it was demonstrated in several reports, these viral infections increases blood glucose levels through this massive inflammation with through this hormonal response to stress. And so for many patients, probably those that were already in the pre-diabetes state, they move to the a kind of diabetes, secondary diabetes to stress. And luckily for many of them, they return to normal state after discharge. But for sure, we must keep an eye on them because they are at high risk to develop type 2 diabetes because for sure, they have clearly a deficiency in the process already stated, installed. I think most of the audience want to know, you told about the diabetic uh, drugs and in the COVID. So suppose you are not going to insulin in mild cases or moderate cases. So you told that the sulfonylurea has no advantage, but you told that metformin pioglitazone or gliptins, they have some advantage. But uh, what do you think about the SGL2 inhibitors? Where I heard that there was a trial known as DARE-19, where they dared to use the SGL2 inhibitors <laughs> in COVID severe cases. So what is your opinion? Like, I think the results will be in the available by January or March uh, next year. So what is your what is your preferred drug in the, if you tell you are going to use a drug in mild to moderate cases, which anti hyperglycemic agents you are going to choose? And what is your, your opinion about this DARE-19 trial? Well, the, <laughs> as I told to your colleague, when the people get to the well, if they are staying at home or if they, if they have a mild form of diabetes and they are not on insulin, we keep them on the same drug. So we don't change it for a specific drug for being more prone to better results in COVID-19. I'm aware of, of those trials. Uh, and now SLT2 inhibitors, they, they seem to be the wonder drug of the century because they are good for everything, even for people without diabetes, as we know. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, 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 and probably this protective effect they have on heart and kidney uh, uh, and as we know, these effects, these protective <clears throat> effects, they are good not only for people with diabetes because they are not related, as far as we know, to a, a direct metabolic effect on glucose. So they have other effects on heart and kidney. 
And so probably that would be the reason why we could dare to use them in more critical healed patients uh, because they will have other effects that we still don't know exactly the mechanistics behind it. But I think you have made a, a clear <laughs> point of, of the use of this. Uh, I, when I'm in hospital or if I was in a hospital because I, now I don't work in a hospital as I was telling you, uh, I wouldn't change the medication based on that at this moment. I would just go to the insulin as traditional because this is still, there are so many things unknown at the moment that it's still difficult to try to, to, to put anything on, on the process to, to get a little bit more messier than we are already doing in, in our regular practice. Thank you, excellent answer. Thank you for uh, your Dr. Question. Manohar, is there any question in the chat box? Oh, I can't see any questions there. So I think uh, uh, they have, all the speakers have done great job. Can you can summarize the session? Yeah. Yeah, I think we started with uh, circadian rhythm, which was thought of uh, with only more to do with hypertension. A good uh, perspective about it, and then the commonly used topic uh, came from Indonesia, diabetes and cardiology, and our, I don't know. We thought about diabetes. Cardio, diabetes, nephrology could be the next thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I think uh, if we can revisit our uh, history of medicine, previously we used to think if you know tuberculosis, you know whole medicine. If you know syphilis, you knew whole, whole medicine. And I'm sure we are coming to a point that where we know diabetes, COVID. we know most of medicine. And then uh, COVIDology, or uh, I think uh, Dr. N.K. Singh was a part of our meeting, coronocrinology. And the yeah. same topic was uh, spoken by me. I think yeah. it was a fantastic interaction across the globe. I would like to thank uh, the big B of Indian uh, diabetology, Bansi Sabu sir, for uh, providing yeah. me this opportunity to be here. And I would like to thank my co-chair, uh, Dr. N.K. Singh, is a great friend and a very enthusiastic uh, knowledge-sharing person. I've never seen him as active as anyone else yeah, yeah. around. And I would like to thank our reporter, Nimi, Dr. Nimi. And uh, we all, uh, I think uh, uh, people who have logged in would have enjoyed the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. And over to NK Singh before we conclude. Uh, you. I thank think, you. Uh, Manohar, you summarized the whole session very well. Uh, I think the first session where in the Indian culture, uh, <laughs> there was something like that, uh, the science is moving towards that, that the early rise <clears throat> and going to bed early and uh, at all what you take, you take before the sunset is something the science is going to prove in a couple of next uh, years or decade. So that was a fantastic message. And uh, CBD and diabetes really was a wonderful lecture. And uh, we learned many things. And lastly, even the, about the COVID, everything at the end of this uh, year, uh, he has summarized. So I think this was a great interaction. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Bansi, Dr. Bansi. I think we can end the session here. Thank you, sir. So thank wish you, everyone. Thank you. A happy thank you. New Year. Take care. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can't thank get you. worse than 2020. Hope 2021 will be better. Thank you. See you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Sure, a very happy 2021. Yeah. Namaste. Thank okay. you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.
Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are a little bit ahead of our schedule. Uh, let me first uh, thank you all the previous session panelists, especially our reporter uh, and chair persons who have conducted the session very wonderfully. And now we are moving towards our next session. So that is evaluating concepts in diabetes. So a very important topic of fetal programming of type 2 diabetes, even non-alcoholic fatty liver steatosis, and other re topic regarding therapeutic options. So we have three wonderful uh, speakers that have joined us here in this wonderful session of evolving concept of diabetes. And uh, to start the session, I would like to invite our reporter, Dr. Manish Gupta from uh, Panpur. I welcome him. And uh, welcome, ma'am. And uh, Dr. Manisha will, is from Kanpur, and she'll be introducing the speaker, our chairperson, and to start the proceedings for the session. Over to you, Dr. Manisha, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Jimit. Uh, to begin the session, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Arun Shakar from Tiruvanthapuram. Dr. Arun is medical director and senior consultant diabetologist from Jyoti Dev Diabetes Research Center, Tiruvandrum. He is alumni of Government Medical College, LAP, Chief Coordinator of Diabetes Telemanagement tele System at JDC, investigator in various clinical trials, liraglutide, deglutec, and citagliptin, speaker at local and national forums, including RSSDI and Diabetes India. And he has made major publication in international and national journals regarding insulin pump therapy and continuous glucose monitoring systems. Our next chairperson is my colleague, Dr. Saurav Mishra. He is also from Kanpur. And uh, Sir and me are working together in Center for Diabetes and Endocrine and Regency Hospital Private Limited. And uh, Sir has got first prize in medicine non-compliance in type 2, a totally untouched issue in Diabetes India 2017. And second prize in group installation of insulin pump is a better approach Diabetes India in 2018, Kolkata. Sir is very enthusiastic regarding insulin pump installation all the time, and uh, he's uh, installed many uh, pump to our uh, type 1 and type 2 patients. And he also got a National Diacon 2019 Rising Star Award in Diabetes Care in North India. So over to our chairpersons. Uh, sir, you need to unmute yourself. Dr. Saurav, you need yes. to Yes, Dr. Manisha, thank you for such a kind introduction. And I would thank, first of all, thank Bansi, sir, and all DICOR team for organizing such a grateful event. And we are learning all throughout since past two days. We have been learning remarkably. Now, not taking much time, I would like to introduce our eminent international speakers for the next talk, Rashmi Prashad, ma'am. She is a doctorate degree in PhD in Molecular Genetics from Medical Faculty, German Cancer Research Center and Heidelberg University, Germany. She has a junior group leader. Uh, she, she is a junior group leader and associate professor at university in Sweden. Her main research interests are fetal programming and parent of origin effects in type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes and islet biologies. Her mentors include like person like Kari Hemken sir, Akhilesh Pandey sir and Live Group. She has authored more than 50 publications in high impact peer reviewed international journals such as Nature Genetics, Cell, Member Cell Metabolism, Nature Communications, uh, Blood and Lancet, and Lancet like Diabetes and Endocrinology. Her research is funded by her own grants with Swedish Research Councils, Heart Foundations, Lung Foundation, Diabetes Fund, and then she is also very much known for her eminent ability of giving international lectures now it is uh, 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 a, a high time that we should listen and follow her advices about evolving so ma'am the stage is yours you can begin with your topic thank you very much for that introduction i'm just going to start by sharing the slide So does this look okay? Can you see the yeah. present of you? Yeah. yeah, yeah uh, so good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for that introduction again. And I would like to begin by thanking uh, the organizers and especially Dr. Banshi Sabu for inviting me to speak at this event today. Uh, 
And in the next 20 minutes, I will talk about fetal programming and how this can alter the risk of diabetes and a little bit about the data that we have uh, generated in this topic. So it's very well known that a family history of diabetes is a huge risk factor. So if you have a first degree, degree relative with type two diabetes, the risk of developing diabetes has been found to be approximately 40%. And what's also been reported quite often is that this risk is higher if the mother has diabetes rather than the father. And this is the reverse in the case of type one diabetes, where if the father has type one, then the child has more propensity to develop diabetes. So what is being proposed and also observed to some extent is that the offspring who are type two diabetic have a higher propensity to inherit these risk alleles for type two diabetes from the mother. So this is referred to usually as a parent of origin effect. And this means that the, the trait uh, effect depends on which allele the parent, uh, which allele, uh, which parent the allele is inherited from. And this basically links back to the DOHAD hypothesis, which is the developmental origins of health and disease, which was proposed by David Barker, uh, wherein early life exposures can cause adverse consequences to the offspring. And fetal programming is linked with both genomic uh, and printing and parent of origin effects because both are determined by resources, uh, resource provision and restriction in early development. And according to the Barker hypothesis, the maternal exposures, both pre and post conception can alter fetal programming during development in utero, and they can cause adverse consequences in later life. And a lot of these include type two diabetes, cardiovascular disorders, obesity, and, and many, many more. What's also been recently reported is that the paternal exposures like smoking and, and uh, obesity can also have an impact on the offspring via altered epigenetic coding in the sperm. So it's been said that the sperm contains a memory of all of the man's experiences ranging from his nutritional status to his exposure to toxic chemicals. So what happens in a physiological level? On a physiological level, adverse exposures like diet, hypoxia, stress, like glucocorticoid exposure, then there's placental insufficiency and efficacy and other conditions can adversely affect developmental programming during the perinatal period. And the effect is multifold. So it starts with adipose tissues where there could be excess lipid storage and high relative white fat and increased abdominal uh, adiposity. Then there's low muscle mass, there is uh, also impaired glucose handling uh, due to, for example, in the pancreas, there could be reduced pancreatic beta cell mass development. And then there's uh, immense vascular dysfunction, which could lead, lead to cardiovascular dysregulation of the cardiovascular system and renal insufficiency due to reduced blood flow and diminished nephrogenesis. How does this programming take place at the molecular level? Well, this is a segment of a chromosome and this is unraveled to reveal a double-stranded DNA. And this DNA is found around these proteins called as histones. And what happens is there's an additional layer of programming on top of this uh, through epigenetics. And in, for example, this could be in the form of DNA methylation of the uh, cytosine molecules in the DNA. And then there are also histone modifications that include uh, acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, et cetera. And both of these together in tandem become a code by itself. And this will then reveal or, or provide information as to which gene, when and how much of this gene should be expressed. And then what are the mechanisms underlying this uh, epigenetic programming? So DNA methylation and histone modifications of course act in tandem. And they can alter the epigenetic coding of the maternal and the paternal alleles in the offspring. And this can lead to changes in gene expression. So what happens here is that in early development, uh, there is a complete erasure of the parental specific imprints in the, in the germ cells. And then this is completely reestablished. And after fertilization, this imprint marks are sort of maintained throughout by methyl uh, DNA methylasis. And, and as the cell propagates, except in the germ cells where they are erased and reestablished for the next generation, this continues to be maintained. And so any exposures that you have during either this phase or this phase can actually alter the programming that is supposed to happen. And then the, this can actually alter the consequences in later life. This deferring optimal fetal program trajectories of paternal versus maternal uh, genes are predicted to represent major determinants of advantages and deleterious programming effects, especially those that are involved in insulin secretion, insulin resistance, visceral obesity, and other manifestations of the metabolic syndrome. So this is something that's come out from a publication in 2020, literally. 
where it shows how the maternal and the paternal effects can, can manifest. So at placentation, there could be reduced placental growth. And it, at birth, this is manifested as, a, as low birth weight, lower muscle relative to fat, lower lean mass overall, lower beta cell mass. At infancy, there could be higher brown adipose tissue thermogenesis, lower appetite, reduced sucking, less early catch-up growth. And in uh, childhood or juvenile or adolescent stage, this could also be less interest in complementary foods and hyperphagia for self food. And there's also earlier puberty. So this is also an impact. And all of these actually uh, confer a selective advantage. So in the thrifty genotype hypothesis, when it was a uh, feast of famine uh, in the early days of uh, either hunter-gatherer uh, situation. This would actually confer an evolutionary advantage because this would provide a survival benefit by storing all the fat against starvation. But now, and also early reproduction would be advantageous as well. However, in the day of today, when the when there is more westernization, this leads to more of a thrifty phenotype hypothesis, and this is more, this confers more of a disadvantage because this leads to more insulin resistance, diabetes, and obesity. So an additional dimension is, of course, the paternal contribution, which adds, adds to the risk. And how this happens has been, uh, it has been manifested as lower rates of brown fat thermogenesis and also uh, paternal, uh, paternal programming sort of catches up much later on. And then there's a rapid catch up effect that happens after intrauterine growth restriction from environmental causes. So there are two concepts that have been proposed for the role of paternal and maternal uh, contributions to the fetus. So one of these is the conflict hypothesis, which stipulates that there's a genomic tug of war between the uh, paternal programming and the maternal programming. So the maternal tries to conserve the, her resources so that she can increase her evolutionary fitness and pass it on to more of the offspring, uh, potential offspring, whereas the paternal programming tries to maximize the maternal resources to this one offspring to increase the survival of the offspring. So the analogy that is most commonly used, and it's sort of one of my favorite analogies, is that the, the embryo development is like a car on the highway of growth and development, where the paternal programming tries to speed up the car on the highway and the maternal tries to slow it down. And the paternal would, of course, eventually catch up later on. So in contrast, the, another theory has been proposed, which is the co-adaptation theory. Uh, and this states that there are paternal and maternal genes that have co-evolved to optimize the care of the offspring. One of the most adverse consequences of fetal programming is how this can actually have transgenerational effects. The adverse exposures not only impact the first generation, which is the F1, uh, the developing fetus, but it can also affect the F2 or the subsequent generations by introducing changes or epigenetic alterations also in the germline of the developing, em developing embryo. In the next few slides, I will talk about potential ways to study fetal programming and identify this. So these are four ways uh, that have been uh, published so far. There are of course many more, but I will highlight on these four for now. I will start with famine cohorts and famine cohorts are, are absolutely very informative to, to provide uh, information about how fetal programming can, uh, can impact the future health of the future uh, health of the future generations. And one of the most extensively studied examples is the Dutch winter hunger famine. And this occurred between 1944 and 1945. And this happened towards the end of World War II, where food supplies became very scarce in the Netherlands. And then the winter set in, the canals froze over, and it was impossible for barges uh, to function. Uh, the railway lines were shut off, which means that there was no food coming in. There was immense shortage of food. And offspring of, uh, of these uh, people who were exposed when they were born uh, after the famine were actually much smaller than the, uh, than, the, than the regular babies in the Netherlands. And there was a high risk of low birth weight in babies. And this persisted for two generations subsequently. What was also seen is that the prenatal famine exposed individuals had higher BMI, higher serum triglycerides, higher fasting glucose as well in later life. And recent studies, and there are many, many studies about this, and one such study is this one, which has actually identified the epigenetic changes that have happened. So these are the, each of these, this, this indicates the significance level, and the, and the more uh, higher this, the dots are, the more significant uh, the values are. And each of these indi indicates one CPG site and methylation at one CPG site. And you can actually see that from the p-values that there are a number of um, CPG sites whose methylation states are altered, and this mediates, uh, the, uh, the BMI in, in these offspring. And this is the, uh, the same uh, interaction for the triglycerides. 
Uh, it has to be remembered, of course, that there's a U-shaped relationship between birth weight and risk of type 2 diabetes. So if babies are born at very low birth weight or very high birth weight, both of these uh, increase the risk of diabetes substantially in later life. So another way to study fetal programming and its effect is through birth cohorts. And I here present two very elegant studies. Uh, the first one, uh, which of course has to be mentioned is the PMNS cohort. And this is the Pune Maternal Nutrition Study, which was conceptualized and, uh, by Professor uh, Chitranjan Yachnik and initiated in 1993, so really early on. The participants here were recruited and followed for two generations now, and soon it will be 30 years since the conception of this study. Uh, a number of important discoveries have been reported through the study, and one of the seminal findings is, is of course the description of the thin fat phenotype, wherein the overall weight of an individual or the baby was very low and the muscle mass was low, but there was very high fat mass compared to the European counterparts. Um, a large proportion of the young men and women uh, also showed abnormal glucose uh, tolerance, and they also, uh, also the low birth weight individuals had higher glucose concentrations. So uh, another thing that came out of the study was the impact of the maternal micronutrition uh, status and physical activity during pregnancy were also related to the child's anthropometry and had a significant effect. And I have a very wonderful collaboration ongoing with Professor Yajnik and his team, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to continue working on this cohort to, to look into some very interesting scientific questions related to fetal programming and parent of origin effects. So a, a second study that I have been uh, part of as well is the uh, Pona study, as it's informally called. Pona means uh, to heal in Swahili, and this is based in Tanzania. So this involves collaborators from Tanzania, Denmark, and Sweden. And the study is based in Koragwe, Tanzania. And there's a high prevalence of anemia and malaria in this, in this population. And what's been observed is that this is sort of accompanied by high rates of cardiovascular diseases and cardiometabolic disorders in later life in, these, in this population, in subsequent generations. So we here studied fetal programming in the offspring due to maternal anemia, malaria, and GDM and other exposures. And I will briefly summarize what has been found so far. So it has been found that anemia and malaria during pregnancy impact fetal placental vascularization. There is also a high prevalence of gestational diabetes in this population. And anemia and GDM, of course, in older generations, uh, concordant to what has been reported before, uh, has also been accompanied by higher cardiovascular diseases in the younger generations. And what we have now done is we've, we've performed a lot of omics studies in the cord blood and the placenta of these individuals. Well, placenta is, is, uh, in, is next, but in the cord blood, and we find a lot of signatures of fetal programming in the cord blood. So there are gene expression signatures that are accompanied by epigenetic signatures or DNA methylation changes because of these maternal exposures in the cord blood. And these relate to how, uh, these are developmental, important ge developmental genes that, that modulate the, the development of specific organs like the pancreas or beta cell development. So there are some exciting findings and we've submitted this paper and hope to have it accepted soon. So other ways to study fetal programming include animal models and family cohorts. And these are two things that you must have, of course, if you would like to look into this. And I will show you some data from these two methodologies combined. So I'll start with this one. So this is KCNQ1. Uh, the, this uh, gene encodes a protein for a voltage and lipid gated potassium channel. And these potassium cha voltage gated potassium channels have uh, been shown to have diverse functions, including maintaining membrane potential and regulating cell volume, modulating electrical excitability in neurons, et cetera. So multiple functions have been reported. And genetic variants in this or SNPs in this gene have been shown to associate with type 2 diabetes risk, primarily started with the Asian population, but, but replicated uh, uh, robustly in the European studies as well. And then this really cool study was published about a decade ago, uh, which originated from Deco Genetics in Iceland, mm -hmm. where genetic variants in this gene were shown to have parent of origin effects. So what this means is that if you have pedigrees, and this includes, let's say this is a trio, right? So this is a father, a mother, and a diabetic child. And what you would expect is that in Mendelian transmission, you would expect 50% of alleles from the father and 50% from the mother. But when you actually expect, when you see parent of origin effects, the, the, there's a significant deviation in these transmissions in that um, if there's a maternal effect, the transmission from the father is much less than significantly or statistically significantly less than 50%, whereas the transmissions from the mother are significantly greater than 50%. 
And what was found for these variants was that the maternal the type 2 diabetes risk alleles came more often from the mother than from the father. And when they looked at gene expression patterns, it seemed like the paternal alleles were actually imprinted and maternal alleles were expressed. So this study uh, was one of the first studies that we also tried to replicate. And we have uh, access to uh, the Botnia cohort, which is for my postdoctoral mentor, mentor Leif Grok, who's of the PI of the study. And he this uh, Botnia cohort is based in Western uh, Finland and Southern Sweden. And we had access to approximately more than 2,000 families from the Botnia study, including for 4,200 individuals. And we found we tried to replicate these findings from the Iceland study and found that uh, the risk allele C seems to be transmitted more often from the mother and, and it replicates this data perfectly. Whereas the transmission from the father doesn't seem to differ so much between the two alleles. And this difference between the transmissions from the father and the mother are statistically significant. So we were able to robustly replicate the findings. Moreover, what we also found was that the maternal C allele, uh, and this is studied now in non-diabetic individuals because, because treatment can alter the insulin values, so or the OGTT values. So what we did was we took the non-diabetic children uh, of these families, and we tried to study how these associations are um, occurring. And what we find is that the risk allele C, for example, from the same uh, SNP actually increased uh, to our glucose and fasting glucose and decreased to our insulin from the, when it came from the mother in the studies during an OGTT. And then there were a few follow-up studies on this. So one of the follow-up studies came in from the uh, Oxford group uh, led by Anna Gloin. And what they found was that, that there was a, a lot of epigenetic changes that accompanied this, uh, this uh, genetic transmission. And there was a change in the programming. So in the fetal pancreas, only one copy of the allele was expressed, whereas in the adult, the expression was biallelic. So both copies were expressed, which means that there was a change in the programming from the, adult, from the fetal to the adult stages. And it was sort of uh, inferred from that, that the that this risk of type 2 diabetes was mediated pretty much in early development for this gene. And then this really interesting study that was published about five years ago in PNAS, uh, where they, they took animal models to demonstrate this. So when they took control mice and they took a knockout mice uh, of the KCNQ1, so homozygous or heterozygous knockouts, there was absolutely no difference on beta cell mass of function. So there was no difference in the, in the size of the beta cell mass. There was no difference in the number of beta cells and there was no difference in uh, insulin secretion. But when they took control mice and they divided the knockout mice into paternal heterozygous knockout or maternal heterozygous knockout, then the beta cell mass was significantly decreased at birth. And when they followed it up after 24 weeks, this still persisted. So there was a reduced beta cell mass only in the pet paternal heterozygous knockout, but not in the control of the maternal. And this is some more data. Uh, this is actually uh, the, the data from the same study where there was an elite specific mutation or truncation in the KCNQ1. And you can see from A that this, is, uh, this showed a reduction in the KCNQ1 uh, levels. And uh, B and C also show how there is a reduction in the beta cell mass, a significant lowering of the beta cell mass only in the paternal heterozygous knockouts, but not in the wild type or the TM, which is the maternal. And this also was accompanied by uh, changes in the expression levels of the CDKN1C, which is another neighboring gene, which is very important and sort of works in tandem with KCNQ1. And when the OGTT was performed on these mice, uh, there was also the mice with the paternal mutation had a significantly lower glucose levels and lower, uh, significantly higher glucose levels and, and significantly lower insulin levels. Uh, this reduction was not seen in the knockdown uh, or the knockouts in the maternal or the non-specific other control groups. So I would conclude by saying that the identifying these molecular signatures of fetal programming will provide invaluable insights into the mechanism by which the risk to disease is altered. These can also be provide to be invaluable biomarkers to understand what exactly uh, is dysregulated in the system. And early identification can provide a window of opportunity for intervention to preserve health of not only the mother and the child, but also for the subsequent future generations. And future generations might find the current way of life to be reflected in, in their genes. So I would end with thanking uh, the team, the collaborators, the study participants, the funding agencies, and thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for such a nice talk. 
Ma'am, we have been enlightened by your knowledge about fetal programming, and I think so. I was listening the lecture very nicely. Since past twenty uh, minutes, we we have a thought. I I uh, I can just say, Bansi sir has always been promoting to control diabetes in our country. So the mission may be um, the future coming science will evolve something related to fetal genetics also by for controlling diabetes in our country. now just i would like to invite my co-chair dr arun shankar sir to introduce the next eminent speaker for the next talk thank you thank you uh, dear dr saurabh mishra happy to ch uh, chair along with you first of all i would like to thank uh, dr dear dr banchi sir for this opportunity so without wasting time i would like to invite our next speaker is uh, our guest speaker from belgium Mr. My, uh, Dr. Michael Hermans, Professor Hermans, uh, obtained his medical degree in uh, 1984 from Leuven University Medical School in Brussels. He had uh, interested uh, in interest on uh, beta cell biophysics and stimulus secreting uh, secretion coupling in the early uh, research. Uh, his interest was on these areas. He is the specialist in internal medicine, endocrinology, and diabetes. He got the Susan et Jean Pirat Prize from Association Belgi de Diabetes. He is the visiting fellow at Diabetes Research Laboratories, Oxford University. He is a senior consultant at Saint Luke Academic Hospital, Brussels. Professor Hermans was awarded the following diplomas from the Open University in Milton Keynes, UK: Natural Sciences, F S Science, Human Geography and Environment, and a postgraduate certificate in Social Science. His current research areas are uh, type two diabetes. metabolic syndrome cardio metabolic risk atherogenic dyslipidemia and so on so he will be speaking to us uh, in this session of evolving concepts in diabetes on non alcoholic liver steatosis linked to reduce frequency of ocular complications in type 2 diabetes over to you sir thank you arun welcome dr vaikal and it's really great pleasure that you know we are meeting digitally after a long time and hope to see you soon maybe next year once everything is fine and saurabh i'm just requesting you i called you also after this session you please stay in this hall only okay I mean, sir because there's a doctor had moved other side okay. over to dr michael sorry michael hermans thank you very much i hope you can all hear me and see my slides This is not visible. You please share the slides. Um. So what? Oh yeah. Sorry, I need to reactivate the share slide. This should be better. Yes, sir. We can visualize it. Is this fine? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you to Dr. Mansi Sabu for the nice invitation. I hope next time it will be live <laughs> and physical. So my topic is is a bit different from my previous one. Uh, everything is in the title. Um, what it refers to is the odd observation that in our cohort of patients with type two diabetes and fatty liver. we found a uh, unexpected decreased frequency of ocular complications that we were not looking for to tell the truth so um the context of that study was that i wanted to revisit the cardio phenotype of type 2 diabetic patients with and without fatty liver using a b ethnic cohort of caucasian patients and patients from africa that are currently living in belgium and to compare them because as many of you must know african patients have a very different prevalence of fatty liver which is markedly reduced and also they suffer very rarely from atherogenic dyslipidemia so that was the background of that study so what we did was to revisit the relationship between uh, fatty liver as a as a cardiometabolic risk factor which according to the bulk of the literature is associated with increased frequency of macrovascular disease now about 15 years ago i did a small uh, study that was only published as an abstract 
in which we couldn't find a difference in the frequency of macrovascular disease based on the presence of fatty liver, then we let it as it was, and we just increased the, the cohort size. And what we did was to analyze the patients with ultrasound fatty liver versus those who had no uh, fatty liver, and just to check their cardiometabolic phenotype. This is what I will do with you, and I, will, I just reanalyzed a few days ago the latest results. So this is uh, just very, very plain. So we had a cohort of 706 patients with type 2 diabetes, and the majority of them have indeed fatty liver. This is the yellow heading. And there were, not, there were no difference in gender. Those patients were slightly younger, but not to a marked degree. They had similar uh, exposure to glucose. There was a slight difference in diabetes duration, but in those patients, we have been able to, to reassess the total exposure to glucose by using the hyperglycemia index, I will tell you later. There was no difference in the ethanol intake, and of course, we, we kicked off, off, out of the study the patients with uh, uh, alcoholism. And as you can see, those patients, are majority of them are physically inactive, but even more so when they have fatty liver. Now, the small cohort of African subjects uh, is shown in the lower part of these slides. And in those subjects, the prevalence of fatty liver is, is about 40% versus a uh, prevalence of more than 70% in Caucasians. So that's, that was expected. And also we had to expel from the study all the black patients with viral hepatitis, which is very common in Africa. Next, we analyzed, and this was not unexpected, their cardiometabolic phenotype in terms of body composition and body weight. And we found what was expected, a much higher BMI, four units of BMI higher in patients with fatty liver, the waist circumference was also higher by more than 10 centimeters. And just to give you an idea, in Europeans, one centimeter of waist circumference uh, is the equivalent of about one kilogram of, of fat. Their fat mass was also uh, higher by 10%, as were their neck circumferences. And not surprisingly, those patients suffer more often from, from sleep apnea. And again, this was expected, their visceral fat was also significantly higher. So that was expected. As were expected, uh, the changes in glucose homeostasis. So starting from top, they had a higher insulinemia. That was the insulinemia that was measured after a washout of all their glucose lowering therapies. And that was used to model insulin sensitivity from HOMA. And they had a markedly decreased insulin sensitivity by more than 30%. So that was again expected as was the almost systematic presence of metabolic syndrome in those patients with fatty liver. They had a 91% prevalence of metabolic syndrome and they scored higher with the metabolic syndrome, mostly as a result of atherogenic dyslipidemia that I will show you uh, later. Those patients with fatty liver, they have an accelerated loss of beta cell function. Uh, we use the hyperbolic product loss rate and that was also significant. Of importance is the fact that the mean HbA1c level was not different, meaning that they had the same uh, current exposure to glucose, but also they had uh, accumulated exposure to glucose, which was similar. For that, we use the hyperglycemia index, which is the percentage above 6% in HbA1c uh, over the clinical course multiplied by the non-diabetes duration. So they had ample time to develop microangiopathies. And finally, they were more uh, often using higher dose of insulin, which is not surprising based on their BMI. Again, this was expected from such a cohort with fatty liver. About cardio uh, cardiovascular drugs and blood pressure, there were no difference uh, between groups except for the use of uh, lipid lowering drugs, which was higher both as regards statins and especially as regards fibrates, which was almost double uh, used in patients with fatty liver. Otherwise, the prevalence of high blood pressure and their blood pressure values was identical, which is good because you have a cohort with the same gender distribution. 
uh, almost the same duration of diabetes, the same exposure to glucose, same blood pressure, uh, which means that for comparison of macroangiopathies and microangiopathies, things will be easy to, to unravel. Mentioning lipids and lipoproteins, again, we found what was expected. So no difference in total and LDL cholesterol. And of course, as you expect from patients with fatty liver and high prevalence of atrogenic dyslipidemia, they had decreased level of HDL cholesterol, increased level of triglycerides with a much increased frequency of AD, almost double. And then they had dysfunctional HDLs. I will not go into the details, but they had less and less functional HDLs. And also they had a smaller and denser LDL particles, which is shown by the ratio of LDL cholesterol to APOB100. And finally, they had a decreased level of lipoprotein A, which was already uh, known from uh, our previous works. So based on that, we would expect them to have more macroangiopathies as well as microangiopathies since atherogenic epidemia is linked to both increased risk of small and large vessel disease. The rest of the laboratory values was uh, also expected, a higher levels of of ferritin, which is often associated with fatty liver, and a lesser uh, level of S SHBG, which is associated with uh, fat of, uh, liver insulin sensitivity. And finally, what would you all would expect is that they have uh, higher levels of uh, liver enzymes as regards ALT. Now, what about microvascular disease and macrovascular disease? Well, let's start with small vessels first. And this is where we've got the unexpected finding of despite those patients having not different overall macroangiopathy frequencies, there was a significantly lower prevalence of diabetic retinopathy, which was highly significant, 31% in patients without fatty liver and only 20% in patients with fatty liver, but that extended also in other ocular complications, which are not vascular complications, such as cataracts, which was almost decreased in frequency by half, and also by ocular hypertonia, uh, glaucoma, which was also markedly lower. This was not the case for other macroangiopathies, such as peripheral neuropathy and uh, mixed micro macrovascular complications such as erectile dysfunctions or the prevalence of ma macro or microalbuminuria, even though there was a lower level of albuminuria as a, a, a continuous variable. So that was highly unexpected. And then we split uh, those macrovascular complications according to ethnicity. So we had that large Caucasian uh, subgroup and that smaller black African patient subgroup. And we found exactly the same uh, difference that were even more dramatic in black patients, even though it was a small group, numerically speaking, their uh, ophthalmoprotection was even more dramatic with almost three times less overall macroangiopathy, almost 10 times less uh, diabetic retinopathy, a virtual absence of glaucoma, and in African patients at least, with the limitation that it was a very small cohort, we had also less a peripheral neuropathy and macroalbuminuria. So a B-ethnic population showing dramatic reductions in ocular complications according to the presence or absence of ultrasound echography. Now, what about macrovascular disease, which was the whole reason why we did this analysis? Well, Contrary to what was expected from the literature, we found absolutely no difference in prevalence of macrovascular disease or specific subtypes. Of course, those patients have long duration of diabetes. They are old, they have type 2 diabetes, obesity, and blah, blah. So not unexpectedly, they have one third of them had macrovascular uh, disease, but this was not distributed differently according to fatty liver. We did the same with ethnicity and found exactly the same. Now, black patients have lesser prevalence of, uh, of macrovascular disease because they are on average younger patients and they have less uh, risk factors versus Europeans. 
So we published those results a few months ago in a slightly smaller cohort. So for those of you who want to have more details about that, I will refer them to that uh, paper that was published with our African colleagues. And if you ask me for explanations for the difference, well, this is a cross-sectional study. We have not the slightest idea. Uh, similar results were published in patients from Asia. Uh, and this is the first study with Caucasian patients and uh, a small group of African patients. So it seems to be observed across ethnicities. And I would be extremely interested to have uh, the same data uh, confirmed or not coming from, from India, since uh, I expect you have a high prevalence of fatty liver in you in your type 2 diabetic patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hammonds. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, and we are eager to uh, know much more detail about the factor why there was reduced risk of retinopathy in uh, those patients with not well if, if i had to put forward some so hypothesis first you could imagine that having retinopathy would protect you from fatty liver there is this is this is absurd there is no known pathophysiology uh, linking the, the eye towards the liver. So we can probably forget that this is just ludicrous. On the other hand, there could be some factors which both promote retinopathy, uh, so sorry, promote fatty liver while protecting uh, the, the, the retina. Now the retina is an extension of the brain with very different cholesterol metabolism, but we found the ophthalmoprotection extending to non-vascular disease, which are not extensions of the brain, such as the, the cataract, uh, the, the, the lens, which is totally unrelated to the retina, and also ocular hypotonia, which is both related to retina and non-retinal complications. Now, one candidate that I put forward in the discussion of that paper could be the LXR, uh, activation or inhibition because uh, that receptor can both promote fatty liver while protecting from, from uh, retinal uh, complications and vice versa. But we, haven't, we have no d data to confirm that, so we will need a mechanistic explanation. But if this is confirmed across ethnicities, that would be a, a, a very uh, interesting way to unravel one of the first cardiometabolic risk factors, which is protective for one type of, of target organ while being detrimental for the other. Even though we did not find an association with macrovascular disease, some of those patients will end up having NASH and liver cirrhosis, but these were expelled, of course, for, from this analysis. All patients with NASH were not included. Uh, in our uh, setup, what we have usually seen is whenever a patient is ending up with micro or macro vascular complications, there will be some changes which we also see in retina as well. That's what we observe usually. Oh, sorry, I missed the first part of your question. Whenever we see patients uh, ending up with micro or macro vascular complications in long-standing cases of diabetes, we usually see uh, some changes as well as both in uh, liver or the retinal or the microvascular change. That's what's the usual scenario we also observe here. So if something, this data is going to give us more insight, like what you said, then definitely we have to see. Yeah, I think I think we have to, to both reassure those patients with fatty liver because it, it might yeah. just be retinal protective. Um, I, I am a great fan of using phenofibrate for, for retinal protection. So I will do that uh, even more so, knowing that those patients may have, by some unknown connections, uh, a liver uh, predisposition to having uh, increased fat in the liver, but also on the other hand, they will have uh, ophthalmoprotection, uh, which, is, which is nice to know. But unless we have a mechanistic explanation, this is just like SGLT2 inhibitors. We, we want to have a nice story to tell, but so far, this is just a cross-sectional study, this is observational. But since there were a, a few papers already from Asia, this seems to be something that went totally unmissed uh, up to now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hans. So, uh, 
डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंडोकोलॉजी एंड डायबिटीज एंड क्लिनिकल फार्मोकोलॉजी at university in croatia he was visiting scientist at st michael's hospital in toronto canada mayo clinic in us moto clinic in czech republic he is a visiting professor at faculty of medicine at university of macedonia he served as a board member and secretary of idf europe and in 2015 and 17 to share my views i had attended her uh, i i had attended sir's lecture in 2017 in abu dhabi when he was conducting an insulin ten, uh, insulin uh, session about something so since then i have been knowing him he served as a board member and secretary in idf europe he is a president in uh, croatian society for diabetes and metabolic disorders associate uh, and chair of idf of young leaders in diabetes program that was i think so the program which was done in uh, abu dhabi then he's published several chapters in croatian and international books he was in, invited speaker at many croatian and international conferences he was in uh, he he participates in teaching of students at, uh, at faculty of medicine faculty of food technology and biotechnology and faculty of pharmacy and biochemistry he received young investigators award by diabetes and nutrition study group esd and rising star award in croatian endocrine society award of international collaboration by uh, macedonia scientific association of endocrinology and idf award for outstanding services so sir dario sir i would like to invite you to further enlighten us about the diabetes yes sir. good good afternoon to everybody thank you very much dr mishra for your kind inter- introduction it was my pleasure meeting you in abu dhabi and also in india when i was in india several times uh, first of all i would like to express my gratitude to uh, my dear friend uh, dr banshi sabu Uh, and uh, i hope that we will see each other again in croatia and in india uh, very soon hopefully so dear ladies and gentlemen uh, in the next 20 minutes i will try to uh, to present the obesity uh, as a problem which we uh, we can uh, notice everywhere these are my disclosures so in the past uh, in the past uh, we had completely different uh, attitude to uh, to weight uh, like we do have right now uh, in the past you can see that uh, being obese was something uh, gorgeous something uh, very uh, very respectful and today we think that obesity is a disease and we know that obesity is disease so we have uh, completely changed our attitude to uh, to the weight but obesity is a chronic disease with a complex etiology i will not go uh, into the details of course uh, we have a problem uh, and we have genetic uh, predisposition but also epigenetics uh, is very important uh, in uh, in being obese Uh, on the other side not just diet and inactivity but emotional factors lack of sleep cultural social culture cultural attitudes but also endocrine dis- disruptors can cause obesity on the other side uh, obesity is associated with many complications you can see it here just few of them uh, but there are many others and we can divide them in metabolic mechanistic and mental disorders and uh, today we we uh, heard about fatty liver we uh, we uh, in this session we had fetal reprogramming uh, what is also important in uh, in uh, and connected with obesity uh, fatty liver is just one small part of uh, of obesity associated complications but also uh, we are we are all aware of Uh, uh, cardiovascular comorbidity in people with uh, with uh, obesity and also type 2 diabetes 
On the other side, obesity uh, is a chronic condition with serious implication for uh, life expectancy. And you can see it here that people who are uh, obese with BMI uh, uh, between 30 and 35, uh, their life expectancy is reduced up to four years. But uh, with BMI uh, above 40, uh, their life expectancy is reduced up to 10, 10 years. Uh, obesity is the second leading cause of preventable uh, death, and we know that it's a, a global problem. More than half of the uh, world's population is uh, overweight or obese, and we can see it here that uh, almost 2 billion people are overweight and more than 650 million are obese. In the uh, United States, the pre prevalence of obesity is uh, up to 40%. And the population of, uh, in European Union is pretty the same. And you can see it here, different countries and Malta, uh, Latvia, Estonia and United Kingdom, they have the highest proportion of overweight and obese women in EU. Uh, you can see it here in Croatia, 16.8 uh, uh, are obese and 30, uh, uh, almost 32% are uh, overweight. Uh, in men, uh, men situation is even worse. And you can see it here, the proportion of overweight and obese uh, men in Europe are uh, pretty high. And Croatia has the highest proportion of overweight and obese men in, in EU, unfortunately. Obesity is a rising public health, uh, clinical and scientific challenges. And we know that we, uh, today we have obesity crisis. On the other side, a number of people with diabetes uh, worldwide uh, is increasing. And uh, according to uh, latest IDF Diabetes Atlas, we know that uh, last year we had uh, more than 460 million people with diabetes. And uh, till 2045, uh, the number of people with diabetes will rise up to 700 million. Maybe numbers are not so important, but uh, when we look at numbers on the, another way, every three seconds, one person get diabetes and every six seconds, one person die due to diabetes related complications. In that case, we know that uh, numbers are important. And we know on the other side that classification of obesity is according to uh, BMI. And we know how to calculate BMI but um, we have a problem uh, when we uh, look only on BMI. In elderly people, uh, we have sarcopenia, and in elderly people, uh, BMI underestimates its cardiometabolic risk. On the other side, uh, athletic body composition, uh, the, uh, BMI overestimates uh, cardiometabolic risk. So it's much more important to, to take into consideration weight circumference uh, instead of BMI. You can see it here, uh, two, uh, two men uh, who had the same BMI, 26, and one of them was overweight and another one was athletic. So um, we, we have to take into consideration racing circumference instead of BMI. So it's not realistic, of course, uh, being uh, athletic uh, and overweight. Uh, very circumference uh, for people uh, are different uh, according to different ethnic specific. Uh, you know that in United uh, States, uh, in Caucasians, and also uh, in uh, people uh, in Asia, is different uh, different uh, way circumference, uh, which is a specific indicator of cardiometabolic risk. So the most important thing, so we, we, we know uh, that we have to diagnose obesity. And according to uh, MKB uh, 10 revision of classification, obesity has its own diagnosis code E66. Here is a diagnostic algorithm. So anthropometric criteria, not just weight, uh, not just BMI, but also weight circumference can, uh, can diagnose obesity which will have a health impact of obesity and also weight-related uh, complications. 
And as I already mentioned, there are many different, different, different clinical components of uh, medical diagnosis of obesity. And we know that uh, when we speak about the, uh, obesity, we know that obesity is almost equivalent of diabetes, of type 2 diabetes, and is uh, equivalent of metabolic syndrome. Uh, at least with pre-diabetes. But also we know that this lipidemia, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver uh, syndrome, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, uh, female and male infertility, and also uh, obstructive sleep apnea uh, are uh, slightly connected with, uh, with uh, obesity, uh, even with uh, overweight. Uh, on the other side, also uh, osteoarthritis as a mechanistic problem, but also in depression as a mental uh, com component of uh, obesity. Uh, we know that obesity and diabetes are parallel epidemics, and we know that 85% uh, of people with type 2 diabetes are overweight uh, or obese. So that's the reason why we call that diabetes as a new epidemic. In relation between BMI and risk of type 2 diabetes is well known, and you can see it here that uh, even people uh, who have normal uh, BMI uh, up to 23, they have increased risk uh, of um, type 2 diabetes, and up above 25 or about 30%, uh, 30 BMI kilograms per meter, uh, square meter, uh, it's very, very high. Uh, risk of type 2 diabetes. On the other side, abdominal obesity increases the risk of developing diabetes. So it's not just the weight, but also gain weight, weight circumference. And you can see it here, about uh, 80 uh, centimeters, and uh, of course, about uh, 90 centimeters weight of weight circumference, the relative risk of uh, type 2 diabetes is very high. Why uh, is so uh, connected? Because adipose tissue is an important endocrine organ. And we know that we have intramuscular, uh, we have visceral uh, adipose tissue, but, uh, and also we have uh, subcutaneous. But the most important is visceral, so can, uh, visceral uh, adipose tissue, uh, because um, the visceral adipose tissue uh, uh, secrete m many, many different hormones and many adipokines. And here you can see uh, that uh, obesity is not just uh, the fashion problem, it's a problem with uh, lots of different adipokines like leptin, free fatty acids, resistance, uh, TNF alpha, uh, interleukin 6, which can cause inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, insulin resistance, procoagulant state, but also uh, can cause uh, in, uh, increased uh, atherosclerosis. So obesity is uh, well uh, connected with atherosclerosis and obesity, uh, the, the type 2 diabetes, uh, NAFLD, uh, hypercoagulability, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and low-grade uh, system inflammation, together with insulin resistance, uh, can cause atherosclerosis. So that's the link between obesity and atherosclerosis. But there are many other health effects of uh, obesity, as I already mentioned, and uh, cancer is also connected with obesity, but also lower life expectancy uh, and uh, limited mobility, social discrimination, uh, and also uh, many different other health effects. And you can see it here, the cardiovascular health effects of obesity, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, hypertension, left ventricle uh, hypertrophy, endothelial dysfunction, systematic inflammation, uh, left ventricle systolic and diastolic dysfunction, heart failure, coronary artery disease, uh, fibril uh, atrial fibrillation, sleep apnea, albuminuria, osteoarthritis, malignant diseases. So we know that uh, obesity is an uh, important cardiovascular risk. And you can see it here that uh, threefold higher cardiovascular risk uh, is uh, attributed to obesity. Uh, with 80%. And we know that many different studies, like uh, Swedish obesity study, uh, nurses uh, health study, which connected uh, arterial hypertension, uh, diabetes, uh, the diabetes, obesity, and healthcare, uh, and also cardiovascular disease. 
And we know that uh, uh, arterial hypertension is six more more common, six times more common in obese patients, and it's uh, linear increases of arter uh, arterial hypertension, uh, arterial hypertension prevalence with BMI. And you can see it here. But the same situation is with uh, coronary artery disease. I already mentioned that uh, that adipose tissue is important endocrine organ. Uh, which uh, secrete many different uh, adipokines uh, um, and cytokines, which uh, can uh, influence on uh, coronary artery disease, like interleukin-6, CRP, fibrinogen, TNF-alpha, uh, PI-1, and many others. Uh, and 30% uh, of circulating interleukin-6 originates from adipose tissue. So it's very important to emphasize the importance of uh, adipose tissue as an endocrine organ. On the other side, high BMI and, of course, abdominal obesity in childhood uh, can be uh, associated with uh, accelerated atherosclerosis in adulthood. And uh, we uh, heard about uh, fetal uh, programming and the importance of intrauterine uh, environment. And we know that epigenetics uh, in intrauterine uh, environment is very, very important and can influence on uh, obesity in adulthood. On the other side, uh, hemodynamics in obesity is uh, also changed. And we know that total blood volume is uh, increased, uh, increased this feeling volume and feeling pressure preload, and uh, also is decreased afterload, uh, which can cause uh, not just uh, heart failure, uh, not just uh, coronary artery disease, but also heart failure. And we know that heart failure uh, is a huge problem in type 2 diabetes, but also is a huge problem in obesity due to left ventricle diastolic dysfunction and left ventricle systolic dysfunction. On the other side, of course, eccentric uh, light, um, left ventricle hypertrophy as well. On the other side, we know that diabetes is a, a cardiovascular disease. And uh, we know that many, uh, many landmark publications suggested that type 2 diabetes may be a cardiovascular disease risk equivalent. And people with, uh, with no diabetes, uh, they have uh, increased, uh, with the diabetes, they have uh, increased risk for myocardial infarction. And it's almost the same uh, uh, as a risk of a patient who had prior myocardial infarction and they don't have diabetes. So we know that diabetes is an equivalent of cardiovascular disease. We can ask ourselves why. Well, uh, it's a good question, but it's, uh, it's a question uh, for next at least a uh, few hours uh, talk. But we know that diabetes uh, and uh, obesity are linked to uh, cardiovascular risk due to hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, but also uh, due to activation of sympathetic nerves, uh, also uh, endothelial dysfunction, glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity, which can cause uh, uh, dyslipidemia, uh, type 2 diabetes, hypertension and increased risk of atherosclerosis. On the other side, many other factors contribute to increased cardiovascular risk in, in type 2 diabetes and also in obesity. And we know that uh, it's not just hypertension and dyslipidemia, but also lipotoxicity and adipose tissue, which is important endocrine organ, as I mentioned, and also uh, genetic predisposition and uh, protein, protein glycation. We know that life expectancy is reduced by uh, 12 years in people with diabetes with previous a cardiovascular disease. So people with diabetes, uh, their life expectancy is reduced by six years. And uh, if they have uh, myocardial infarction, their life expectancy is reduced up to 12 years. So uh, also on the other side, we know that uh, heart failure is underestimated problem in diabetes in, and uh, in obesity. And we learn that heart failure is very important, uh, uh, very important consequence of type two diabetes and also uh, obesity. And I will not go uh, through into the details, but you, we know that uh, diabetes and hyperglycemia per se, or pre-diabetes, can uh, cause uh, decreased angiogenesis, uh, changes in cellular metabolism, and also oxidative stress which can cause apoptosis, necrosis, and diastolic dysfunction. 
which can cause diabetic cardiomyopathy. It's very similar with um, a cardiomyopathy in people who are uh, obese. So there is no doubt that we have to treat obesity and we have to treat the diabetes and we have to treat uh, diabetes uh, as itself. We also can uh, search for any solution. Of course, is there any solution for diabetes? Yes, there is some solutions. Uh, we are not satisfied because we know that uh, when we target obesity, when we target uh, diabetes, and when we target diabetes as a special uh, as a special uh, case, we uh, we know that we have to target hyperglycemia. Uh, arterial hypertension, dyslipidemia, but also glucose variability, hyperuricemia, and uh, lots of uh, different hormone uh, hormones uh, excess. And we learn from EMPAREC trial that we can influence on cardiovascular disease in people with diabetes. And we learned that uh, using uh, empagliflozin uh, in very short period of time, uh, the uh, investigators uh, succeed to decrease three-point maze for 14% and cardiovascular death uh, for 38% and also all-cause mortality for uh, up to 30% and hospitalization due to heart failure. On the other side, the GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, confirmed in leader trial, sustained trial, uh, but uh, also uh, rewind, uh, we, we learned that uh, also uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist can influence on cardiovascular death and cardiovascular uh, risk modification. So that's the reason uh, why uh, in uh, glucose lowering modification in type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, we know that uh, if we have predominant uh, atherosclerotic uh, um, cardiovascular disease or uh, kidney, uh, kidney, current kidney disease, we know that we should uh, treat the, those patients with GLP-1 receptor agonist and SGL-2 inhibitors. But on the other side, we, uh, we know that the proper diet and lifestyle changes is also important in type 2 diabetes, but also in treat diabetes. And that's the reason, of course, we always uh, say uh, it's important to reduce energy intake by uh, up to 1,000 uh, kilocalories per day, physical activity at least uh, 150 minutes per week. Uh, and, but when we talk about diet, we have to ask ourselves which diet to choose. And we know that many different diets uh, are uh, popular. Uh, and you can see it here that we have uh, high, high carbo diets, uh, or, or high proportion of carbohydrates uh, and uh, also low proportion of, uh, of carbohydrates uh, like in Atkins uh, diet. So uh, we have different macronutrient profiles of popular diet and we know that uh, it was a trend uh, in, uh, in treating of obesity. Uh, 1970s uh, sugar was bad, uh, 1980s cholesterol was bad, uh, 1990s fat was bad and 2000 carbs or sugar are bad again. So that's the reason uh, why uh, we learned that uh, it's important to emphasize the importance of diet, but which diet to choose. Uh, I, uh, I found uh, several interesting uh, papers and majority of those paper uh, said any diet can work, but adherence is the key. Uh, so uh, only adherence to diet can uh, can cause uh, the weight loss. And uh, also one uh, study published in JAMA two, two years ago also uh, compared effect of uh, low fat versus low carb diet on 12 months uh, weight loss program. And uh, they found no significant difference in weight loss between uh, low fat or low carb diets. Uh, and uh, neither genotype pattern nor basal insulin secretion was associated with the dietary effects on weight loss. So th the only problem is how to follow diets, not which diet uh, we should uh, follow. So key to weight loss is diet quality, not quantity, uh, because uh, we can, uh, we can uh, combine different foods and we can, uh, we can uh, increase the level of physical activity. And of course, uh, pedometer and uh, also other uh, stimulation for uh, people how to uh, increase the physical activity is important. On the other side, uh, get enough sleep because sleep deprivation uh, can increase hunger, can increase the opportunity to eat, 
because if you are uh, awake, you have uh, you have more opportunity to eat. Uh, alter thermal regulation, increase fatigue, and uh, all those will increase caloric intake and also will reduce uh, energy uh, expenditure. So we will uh, have obesity as a problem. So different uh, different uh, studies show that sleep duration uh, less than five uh, hours uh, is associated with obesity, but also chronic uh, stress is associated with uh, obesity with different uh, with different uh, pathophysiological mechanism, but more or less they uh, cause uh, high cortisol and also activation of. Uh, adrenal, uh, adrenal uh, gland and also sympathetic activation. On the other side, uh, it's important to have cognitive behavior therapy because we know that emotions uh, have uh, important things uh, and behaviors on uh, obesity prevalence. Uh, there are many drugs that produce weight gain, uh, um, such as antidepressants and especially three cycle uh, antidepressants and uh, also um, uh, anti some anti-diabetic drugs like insulin, sulfonylureas and uh, glitazones. And we know that weight effects of glucose lowering uh, therapy uh, are well known. So that's the reason why we, uh, we try to use weight neutral or um, weight, uh, uh, weight uh, positive uh, uh, glucose lowering therapy or glucose lowering therapy, which is associated with weight loss like GLP-1 receptor agonist and SGL-2 inhibitors. That's the reason why even in, uh, in uh, algorithm for glucose lowering medication type diabetes, type 2 diabetes, also the compelling need to minimize weight gain or promote weight, weight loss. Uh, here is GLP-1 receptor agonist and SGL-2 inhibitors. On the other side, when we talk about management of obesity in adults, according to European guidelines, uh, we have uh, several currently available medication for weight loss. And uh, we use uh, lorsetine or Belvic, also Acusemia and Saxenda, uh, which are approved in, in Europe. Uh, and also a bariatric or metabolic surgery, uh, which is very important. Uh, here are mechanism of um, bariatric or metabolic, it's better to say metabolic surgery, because it's not just bariatric surgeries, uh, it, uh, uh, its impact on metabolism, metabolism and uh, metabolic effects are very important. Uh, so we have different altered GRI signals to brain, endocrine, neural, and also uh, altered GI signals to other tissues like in liver and pan pancreas. And uh, here is uh, the list of bariatric surgery and diabetes. And we know that uh, uh, up to 60% of people who, who had uh, gastric bypass and who, who had metabolic surgery, up to 63% uh, they have diabetes, they had uh, diabetes remission. On the other side, uh, 35 to 50% or, or more of the patient who initially achieve remission of diabetes uh, eventually experience recurrence. But it's, uh, it's important that uh, with, uh, with metabolic surgery, we can influence on diabetes remission. And here is the increased risk uh, with the uh, medications or surgery. You can see it here that realistic uh, weight loss goals for dietary changes is up to 10%. Uh, with medication, 10 to 15%. With endoscopic procedures, up to 20%. And with, with bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery, up to 45%. And uh, we know that the benefit of five to the ten percent weight loss is reduction in type risk of type two diabetes, cardiovascular mortality, improvement uh, in blood lipid profile, and also blood pressure, uh, and also improvement in severity of uh, uh, of uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and also quality of life as well. So since the majority of people with type 2 diabetes are overweight or obese, weight reduction is seen as a key therapeutic goal in the prevention and management of type 2 diabetes. Glucose lowering effect which support weight reduction should be the first uh, uh, choice after the obligatory uh, metformin therapy. And we know that uh, it's important to treat uh, obesity. Uh, it's uh, uh, important to, uh, uh, to treat diabetes, but uh, we must, uh, to prevent obesity, 
and we have to prevent diabetes and because we know that prevention is much better and more important than cure like george always said uh, helping others is good but teaching them to help themselves is even better because our goal is to have uh, 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 people who are healthy and who live uh, pretty long with no complication of diabetes and neither obesity so people with diabetes uh, have to treat their disease because that's the only way how to achieve 100 years old life thank you very much ladies and gentlemen Thank you, sir. You have just uh, remarkably summarized each and every part of obesity related to diabetes management. And sir, I think so, uh, summarizing each and every aspect, physiological aspect, pathological aspect, treatment wise, then social issues, non-social issues, summarizing the things very nicely. This is an art which you are famous for and you have connected it very nicely and given us a very strong message. We have been practicing the same in our part also. What I have experienced in my part, just sharing few points as we have got this uh, great opportunity of sharing the stage in common. So, sir, Abhi, uh, what happens in our country when people come to us and we talk about decreasing their weight, the stigma goes again when suppose a person is on SGLT2 inhibitors and suddenly he starts losing some weight. After some time, he comes to our clinic with his uh, uh, relatives or some uh, some. Uh, peers or uh, next to the kin and they always say sir ye weak ho he has gone he has lost weight and not looking now he is looking a weaker one so it is happening in our part that a little bit mind change is there yes losing weight may reduce uh, um, further complications so now i would like to give the charge back to dr manisha sir M manisha ma'am ma'am the stage is yours further you can take up the questions thank you thank you thank all the speakers for a wonderful presentation and i have one question with uh, uh, this is regarding the remission or reversible of diabetes so reversible is very uh, uh, renowned terminology we are using these days so uh, what's your take dr dario in this regard you mentioned the term remission so do you really believe in reversal or remission so mm, what's your you. take Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. Uh, unfortunately, I had some technical issues, so I had to reconnect again. Uh, but it was uh, fortunately uh, after lecture, so uh, excuse me one uh, one more time for it. Uh, so I uh, well, it's a very interesting question, and it's uh, it's not easy to answer because uh, we know that um, it's uh, sometimes it's very easy to treat people who are uh, who have type two diabetes and who are uh, obese because uh, only with uh, with weight loss we can have tremendous effect on uh, on glucose regulation on the other side we have a problem with people who are with type 2 diabetes who are lean and with the high insulin resistance and uh, treating insulin resistance in lean people with type 2 diabetes can be a huge problem and it's uh, um, sometimes very difficult to treat uh, so uh, Pers uh, me personally, I had several patients uh, who, who who achieve reverse of diabetes uh, only with uh, uh, with weight reduction. Of course, in initially uh, we started uh, to treat them uh, very aggressively uh, with medication, sometimes even with ins insulin treatment uh, and with medication. Uh, I remember I started with diabetology uh, and to treat people with diabetes 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, we had only few medications, very few medications, um, uh, oral medications and insulin therapy. So we didn't, uh, we have the huge problem after metformin and SU, uh, few patients uh, had opportunity to, to have some acarbosis uh, with some effect of, uh, of acarbosis on glucose lowering. And also we had uh, glitazone, rosy glitazone in that period of time and nothing else. And right now we have SGL2 inhibitors, DPP4 inhibitors, GLP1 receptor agonists. So we have an important uh, uh, many different medications which can uh, increase weight loss, can uh, can uh, also uh, cause weight loss. And uh, after a few months or a few years, maybe we can stop all medication uh, and they can stay only uh, on healthy lifestyle, uh, of course, following diet and physical activity. So 
Uh, I do believe in reversal of uh, type 2 diabetes, but, uh, um, but also I believe in uh, that prevention of the type 2 diabetes in obese people uh, is uh, more important for that. Yes, sir. Uh, rightly, rightly said. Just I want to add one thing and I want to ask a question also. As sir, uh, what we have been following here, a reversal of diabetes. When we talk about reversal of diabetes sometime earlier, approximately five to six earlier, uh, six years earlier, then there used to be a lather in, in the society. No, no, it cannot be. It is just for diabetes. It is not cure. It is control. But I think so. Now we have started talking and we have started formulating a measures also. So in near coming future, what do you visualize? If, will it be easy for our next coming generation to just cure diabetes? Well, uh, I agree with you. I can say that even right now, it's uh, uh, easier to treat people with diabetes uh, than before. Uh, you can you can uh, see, for example, uh, even with type one diabetes, we have uh, we have pens. Uh, for, first, we had a syringe um, of insulin. Right now, we have pens. Uh, on the other side, you know that uh, even insulin treatment right now is much easier uh, to treat people with insulin because uh, you, we have uh, low uh, glucose variability with modern insulin therapies, low risk of weight gain, low risk of uh, hypoglycemia. On the other side, we have modern technology uh, to measure glycemia and also modern technology to, uh, to, uh, to uh, distribute insulin, uh, like insulin pumps. And also we have uh, SAP as well, uh, sensor augmentative pumps. So I think it's much easier to treat people right now. On the other side, metabolic surgery right now is much uh, improved in comparison to 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, right now, endoscopic uh, bariatric or metabolic surgery is available, which wasn't uh, available before. So I can say that uh, further generation uh, will have uh, more opportunity to better for better treatment of uh, diabetes and obesity right now we have lots of medications for obesity but still those medications are not available in the in uh, in the world and we have a huge problem because uh, of lack of time uh, chronic stress a lack of uh, sleep uh, all those can lead to obesity and also can uh, can be a huge disruptor for diabetes reversal. So I think that uh, in the future, the uh, modern generation will have more opportunity, but uh, they will have more patients uh, to treat. Uh, so it's a huge mess right now. And I think that we have to uh, start to promote a healthy lifestyle and also to promote physical activity uh, in the childhood, because only if uh, you learn in childhood how to uh, how to behave uh, according to physical activity and it uh, if you you adopt as a child uh, if you uh, in childhood adopt the physical activity as a normal lifestyle in that case you will follow that in the uh, in the uh, adulthood but more or less it's not easy parents are working hardly uh, uh, ch children are in uh, in schools they are not we don't have any more so many time for uh, treating them uh, to teaching them how to uh, to have physical activity so if my son will not see that i am uh, i regular have a regular physical activity he cannot learn that in the adulthood so it's a huge problem and i uh, i believe uh, that as you said uh, further generation uh, they will have more op uh, opportunity to treat better people with uh, diabetes and obesity but they will have a lot many many other problems thank you sir thank you for such a nice explanation now just i want to have a next question with rashmi ma'am ma'am are you there yes i'm right here yeah 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 ma'am just as sir just talked about children just i want to go to the fetal life and the genetics, is there anything new on the part of treating at present going on with fetal science and fetal genetics? What is in your concern? What do you want to comment on my this statement? Uh, I'd say it's more about intervention at an early time point. So if, uh, if even pre-pregnancy, if women take care to not have exposures, adverse exposures like obesity, of course, being a very important one, but also alcohol consumption has been shown to alter fetal programming as well. And smoking has a huge impact. So if the mothers take care, and, and definitely the fathers, because smoking definitely leaves this its signature on the, on the sperm. So this will definitely have long-term consequences as well. So intervention, I think, more than treatment is the key. 
I would say. So, so ma'am, should we have very intensive programs to just educate our next coming generation? So, what plans and what things are being done on your part to educate uh, mm -hmm. uh, mothers to take care during pregnancy? I have to make a call back uh, to the recent video that I saw that was uh, produced in the in Pune at the KEM hospital. So they've actually created this wonderful video, uh, which is it is done in Marathi, but I think it's it's a beautiful video that they released about a month ago, which actually informs the public as to how they should take care during pregnancy and how this could prevent. Uh, consequences in, in future life. And this involves some pretty famous actors as well. So I think this these are the kind of steps that if, if it's reached nationally and globally, I think this would make a huge difference. And thank this you. is already underway, of course. Thank you, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Now, just a, a last question, I think so, to discuss in this evolving technology and things. Doc, Dr. Harman, sir, can you, uh, are you there, sir? A last question to you? Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. So, as you know, metabolic syndrome is uh, just evolving in our uh, just next today practice. We always encounter young children, young young uh, uh, people coming to us in generation landing up with metabolic syndrome. And when we go for their lipid profiles and these uh, this liver profiles, we find that they have NASH, non-alcoholic cetogenic hepatitis. So, what do you think? What should be the training program in adolescence only itself? How can we? Uh, just say what is your stay about to prevent it rather than to treat it what is how can we prevent it what is your stay yes sir. yeah the, the main driver of fatty liver is hyperinsulinemia so everything that decreases the insulin levels will work but if they are young persons especially uh, male subjects they could rapidly benefit from an increase in muscle mass because having a higher muscle mass will de facto decrease their insulin levels and you will create a larger organ, not only to capture glucose after meals, but also between meals. Now, it's more difficult to increase muscle mass in, in women due to physiological uh, differences. But again, uh, an increase in aerobic exercise would be easier to implement in, in younger women while uh, weightlifting combined with aerobic exercise would be good for, for for younger male, but of course you can mix both. Now, right now, all the gym centers are closed due to COVID, but as soon as it, it's over, they will have to choose a physical activity that they like, that they can perform either alone or in groups. But I would definitely uh, go into physical activity, not only to, to, to lose weight, but also to increase muscle mass. So that even if their BMI doesn't change, if their body composition improves, they will definitely decrease insulin levels and then they will decrease fatty liver. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So just closing with the closing remarks, I want to invite Bansi, sir, to share his views about... Bansi, sir, I think so. He's not... <laughs> Hello. Okay. Dr. Manisha, yes, please give some closing remarks. I would like to invite our uh, next chairperson to conclude the whole session, Dr. Arun Shankar, sir, sir, please. Yeah, actually, uh, that was a wonderful session. Uh, I was listening from the beginning, like what Dr. Rashmi mentioned about, discussed about the teaching programming, uh, the risk involved, uh, and then coming on to Professor Herman discussing a new thing, which was, in my opinion, a new thing like uh, the presence of NASH in, uh, reduced risk in retinopathy. And to conclude with diversity, that, that's again a very interesting topic and very important and valid topic and very clearly discussed by our my co-chair co uh, in detail. And the, the, the discussion was actually fantastic, uh, very insightful one. So uh, to conclude, the things are going uh, very well, because uh, in uh, diabetes management, of course, these points, the evolving things are very important, just like what Dr. Saurabh uh, discussed, like in the future generation, we are trying to prevent the so-called uh, metabolic syndrome or the lifestyle diseases, which we see are in, see, seeing that is increasing throughout the world. So first, uh, once again, I would like to congratulate Dr. Benji Sabu, sir. Uh, for the excellent organization of this uh, icon and thank you
thank you all thank you thank you thank you all the speakers and chairperson so we are closing the session here thank you thank you, thank you. bye bye Thanks. bye Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I was introducing Dr. Sandeep Rai and Dr. Hemant Dhani. I'm sorry for that. I am completely muted. So, first of all, welcome to this Indo-UK Symposia. And we have for this session report here Dr. Vinay Dandaniya, Dr. Sandeep Rai, and Dr. Hemant Antani. Dr. Sandeep Rai is a very senior consultant. He's a professor of medicine at Mumbai. And Dr. Vinay Dandaniya is a diabetologist based at Ranchi, Jharkhand. And Dr. Hamant Antani, a senior consultant from city of Anand, which is near to Ahmedabad, part of central Gujarat. So over to Dr. Sandeep and Dr. Hamant Antani for introducing our first speaker, and then you can take further proceedings. Over to Dr. Hamant and Dr. Sandeep Rai. Saurabh, please stay here because I'm in some other meeting also. Okay, sir. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Bansi Sabu for having included me in your prestigious conference. Thanks a lot for that. And uh, I've been hearing this conference for last two days now, and you have selected the topics very nicely and it's been very informative. Uh, now it's my pleasant duty to, <clears throat> to introduce the first speaker, who is Dr. Samuel Saidu. He's currently the head, on, head of the research for primary care diabetes Europe, and is also the chair of PCDE study group, European Association for the Study of Diabetes at the ASAD. He is an NIHR clinical lecturer at the University of Leicester. His research, current research interest is on implementation. Uh, uh, I think uh, that, part is, uh, that part is getting good, but I have read his biodata. He is interested into you know, uh, demystifying the, the therapeutic inertia, basically. And, uh, and he's trying to do it at community level for seeing how people can adhere more to medications and lifestyle changes in his area. He's a faculty member of the Primary Care Academy Diabetes Specialist in the UK, board member of the Primary Care Diabetes Society of UK, currently a clinical lead and mentor for diabetes in Leicester. So he will be speaking on changing paradigm to the early sustained glycemic control to prevent complications. I invite Dr. Samuel Saidu to kindly present his Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, do these meetings. Um, it's my third time speaking in these meetings, and every time I come, I really enjoy uh, the group. I thank uh, Banshi for inviting me once again. Uh, here are my disclosures. Right, so the learning objectives of my session will be to justify early combination treatment in patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, and after talking about the justification, I will spend a bit of time uh, talking about the various phenotypes of type 2 diabetes and how to combine different medications uh, very early on in the, the, the disease trajectory uh, in the various subtypes of um, uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. So as you would see, this is a, a shift change from what we've been hearing so far, which has been so much detailed science, diabetes, diabetes and everything else that we've had so far. Uh, the reality is that uh, when you talk about type 2 diabetes, about 90% of the management in most parts of the world is done in the community level and in primary care uh, settings. Um, and diabetologists would only get to see the very complicated cases of diabetes. Within the community or primary care setting where you are the vast majority of patients, 
uh, you do need to educate people to take it very seriously and treat aggressively with early combination therapy. At the moment, that is not what is being done. So this is a paper that um, uh, we, 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 we published in our unit um, looking at uh, the issue of therapeutic inertia. Uh, and it's a big problem across various countries um, across uh, the world. And as you can see, um, you know, for the vast majority of patients, we're just waiting too long for A1Cs uh, above uh, 7%. You know, you're talking about nearly three years before uh, of monotherapy before anything else is added. And if you're talking about uh, dual therapy for people with A1C over 7%, you know, sometimes you know you 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 wait in median of seven point two years before you get any anything added, and and similarly uh, for pay for if you go to a higher target of seven point five, um, you know, for dual therapy it's about seven point two, and for monotherapy it's two years, and so on and so forth. And for all the targets, the various targets, you're talking about, you know, A one C levels being left at very high ranges before we do anything. And this has consequences. In a study we published again about three years ago um, from the Leicester Diabetes Center, looking at the UK primary care database, uh, looked at patients who are newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes, over 103,000 patients, and we we'll split them into two groups. The first group are those who were intensively treated with A1C below 7% within 12 months of diagnosis, and you compare them to those whose A1Cs were not controlled below 7% within 12 months of diagnosis. Follow the two groups up for 5.3 years. And at the end of 5.3 years, what you find is a significantly increased risk of myocardial infarction about 67%, stroke by 51%, heart failure by 64%, and a composite cardiovascular event of 62%. What, you, what we say is, this difference between the, the, the very well controlled and the poorly controlled within 12 months, this glycemic legacy, which is driving all the complications. So we do not want to you know, delay too long before intensifying treatment. So at the moment, this is what we do. You diagnose your patients with type two diabetes, they get lifestyle and you know, diet, you, know, you get your A1C down uh, after a few months, and then it goes up again, and so you add your metformin, monotherapy, and then your A1C come down again if they're adherent, but then it goes up again with time. So this seesaw approach is not just because the patients are failing, it's not just because the clinicians are not you know, titrating hard enough, it's also because of beta cell uh, failure. As we know from UK PDS, every year after diagnosis, you lose about 4% of beta cell mass. Okay, so there are a lot of physiological reasons as well, in addition to therapeutic inertia. So because of that, what we are advocating is to avoid this seesaw approach at a very high baseline from the outset. What you are advising to do, we advise you to do is to go hard enough and control this A1C much lower with initial combination therapy and keep it as low as possible for as long as possible. And if you do that, you avoid those complications that I talked about in the previous slides. So one way of demonstrating this is uh, we published this last year uh, in Diabetes Care. Uh, and what we are advocating is if you, come, if you look at the way UK PDS was recruited, patients who were early in their disease trajectory were intensively treated. Now, if you keep that A1C down for as long as possible smoothly like that, Initially, you get microvascular complications here, and as the years come on, you get your macrovascular benefits as well. We are advocating that it's not just a question of getting this A1C down quickly and smoothly for as long as possible. I try to avoid the fluctuation that I, I, I described earlier on. That fluctuation above a high A1C baseline is also associated with higher cardiovascular risk, and you don't want to do that. So early combination therapy um, is one suggestion that we can, uh, we can implement to avoid the seesaw approach at a very high baseline. And it's not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for the past few years, but we are so very much stuck onto old ways of doing waiting to fail approach in various guidelines across the world. 
This is a systematic review that was published about seven years ago, uh, looking at 15 randomized control trials with a patient population of over 6,693 patients. And they, they looked at uh, studies that looked at combination therapy with metformin uh, uh, versus a stepwise approach. And what they found was that there was a statistically significant weighted mean difference in A1C in the combined uh, combination therapy uh, compared to the stepwise approach. And more recently, as you know, uh, there was the publication of a verified trial which combined uh, vildagliptin with uh, metformin. And as you know from the verified study, uh, you know, the early combination therapy with metformin and vildagliptin was associated with delayed treatment uh, 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 escalation uh, in newly diagnosed patients. And uh, very recently, again, uh, there was, you know, subgroup analysis of that in young type 2 patients who normally we would classify as those that you really need to be very aggressive in their disease tra trajectory uh, because patients with young type 2s have a very aggressive disease. And in this subgroup analysis from Verify, again, they were able to show that uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, reduced time to treatment failure uh, if you do the early combination therapy with metformin uh, and, and uh, vildagliptin. The EDIC trial led by uh, Radu Fronzo has been, you know, uh, going on about early combination therapy for a long time, but we haven't been listening. But I think we should start listening. This study, what they looked at was metformin plus pioglitazone and exonetide combined at very early uh, in the disease trajectory, uh, targeting A1C uh, to be low 6.5. And anything above 6.5 during the treatment period was regarded as treatment failure. So early combination therapy with a triple therapy was, co was compared to stepwise uh, treatment. And what they found was, that the, the early combination uh, therapy uh, was associated with reduced uh, uh, you know, le level of uh, treatment failure and complications, and indeed less side effects. There were less hypoglycemia in the combination therapy uh, compared to the stepwise approach. So based on all this data, uh, what we are advocating in primary care diabetes Europe is to uh, consider early combination therapy to tackle this problem with, uh, problem with therapeutic inertia that we have in primary care. And earlier this year, we published uh, two papers, uh, consensus reports on this topic. Uh, the first was published in uh, Primary Care Diabetes Europe Journal, uh, and the other uh, was also published in the IDF Journal uh, Diabetes Research and Clinical Practice. So what exactly do we recommend? Uh, so like most other guidelines, what we have suggested is before you manage your patient with type 2 diabetes, you need to categorize them in various subgroups. So you know the disease um, uh, uh, burden, uh, cardiovascular disease burden for the various subgroups. And so to simplify the, the, the various phenotypes in type 2 diabetes in primary care, we suggest that patients who have established cardiovascular disease those with multiple cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, smoking, and physical inactivity, those with EGFR less than 60, and those with albuminuria more than 30 per day, 30 milligrams per day, and those who are younger than 40, these patients should be classed as very high risk of cardiovascular disease. Every other patient can be considered as being at high risk of cardiovascular disease. We don't believe that anybody with type 2 diabetes should be at moderate, moderate risk or uh, a mild risk. They are either very high risk, as in this group, or um, high risk. And this is schematic representation. Those with established cardiovascular disease, ASCVD, heart failure, CKD, and those under 40s, they are at very high risk of cardio cardiovascular disease, and everybody else will be at high risk. The elderly frail patients, we put them in a different category because patients who are elderly, it's not so much the risk of cardiovascular disease that we are concerned about, but we are more concerned about the quality of life in these patient groups. And so are treating them to prevent them dying from cardiovascular disease, which may occur several years down the line, is probably pointless because a lot of the medication that we use to treat these patients will be associated with side effects that can compromise their quality of life. And so we separate that group uh, outside of their cardiovascular risk uh, stratification. 
Now into more detail, if you have a patient who is at a very high risk of cardiovascular disease, for example, those with ASCVD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, what we are advising is that you do early combination therapy with metformin plus an SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist rather than stepwise approach. Some guidelines will suggest um, you to go for GLP-1 receptor agonist or LGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit because they don't believe that metformin has got that evidence. Well, we are advocating that in patients with type 2 diabetes, metformin has got a very good evidence base, a lot of experience with it in, in, in primary care settings, and indeed, it's a recognized glycemic control agent. So yes, we are concerned about cardiovascular disease, but we're not gonna forget about diabetes. So we want to advocate early combination therapy with evidence-based cardiovascular risk factor uh, control uh, medications like SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor uh, agonists, plus metformin from the outset. When you do that, you are actually gonna intensively control your glycemia from the outset and keep it as low as possible. But in addition to that, you're also preventing cardiovascular disease just as you would do with adding a cholesterol to these patients. We do appreciate that you will have some patients who will, uh, for example, say, well, doctor, I don't want to have too many medications from the outset because of side effects. Or in some places, there may be issues around cost of prescribing too many medications at, at a go. And indeed, in some areas, there'll be issues regarding uh, concerning guidelines in, in various countries. And so they might not want you to consider combination therapy from the outset. If that is a case, of course, you can go for your metformin for glycemic control, but be quick to add your SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist proving cardiovascular benefit as second line for glycemic control, hoping that you will be preventing cardiovascular disease in addition to that. And we're advocating that you should reserve basal insulin uh, for last and use that with caution when everything else has failed for glycemic control. How about heart failure? Again, in heart failure patients, we advocate to combine metformin plus an SDLT2 with uh, LDLT2 inhibitor uh, rather than doing them uh, stepwise uh, approach. Because if you do that, what we believe you're gonna be doing is to get in good glycemic control from the outset, but in addition to that, you're controlling heart failure with your LDLT2 inhibitor. And as you know from your recent uh, DAPA-HF trial, you don't even need to have diabetes to, you know, to get benefit from an LGLT2 inhibitor. Of course, again, once again, if there is a concern with combination therapy and you want to do a stepwise approach as you've been used to, which we don't advocate, but if you want to do that, of course, your metformin is first line for glycemic control, but don't hesitate to add your LGLT2 inhibitor quickly to your metformin as second line, even if glycemic control is achieved. Avoid your pyoglitazone and saxagliptin and use basal uh, insulin with caution in these patients. Similar approach with chronic kidney disease, we advocate early combination therapy with metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor rather than a stepwise approach if the EGFR uh, will, 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 will uh, permit you. Uh, metformin as first line if the EGFR is more than 30. LGLT2 as second line if you do prefer to go uh, sec uh, you know, stepwise but just be careful of the EGFR target because various SGL2 inhibitors have different EGFR targets depending on which country you are prescribing from. And then uh, slowly add your GLP-1 receptor agonist. Uh, and uh, remember to discontinue your glyanides and uh, SCUs uh, because of risk of hypoglycemia if um, your, your glycemic control is, uh, is within reasonable limits. So how about your patients? Um, who are at high risk. So I have gone through the patients who are at very high risk. So the rest of the patients, we will class them as being at high risk. So this will be the rest of your patients uh, who do not have established cardiovascular disease, they don't have kidney failure, and they are not young type twos. So for those patients, go for your early combination therapy with metformin plus whatever you think is appropriate. Of course, if the patient is obese, you might want to add a GLP-1 receptor agonist to your metformin or LGL2 inhibitor to your metformin rather than stepwise approach. Um, and try to you know, uh, avoid uh, using 
you know, uh, agents that will make you put on weight if the patient is obese. For patients with NAFLD, we advocate adding uh, pioglitazone to your metformin from the outset. If you do want to go uh, slowly, metformin first, and then add the rest uh, as appropriate. Basal bolus insulin should be reserved as a last resort for patients who are failing uh, with everything else. So I've talked about obesity. Uh, just be careful, um, you know, of you know, pioglitazone, uh, glinides, and SUs, and uh, most insulins because they, or, or all insulins as they will, uh, make you put on weight. You might want to consider uh, fixed ratio combinations of insulin and GLP-1 receptor agonists in patients with high baseline A1C at onset. With that combination, you will be needing to use less of the insulin, uh, and for that matter, reducing the chance of getting hypoglycemia and weight gain. And because you are combining with insulin, you'll be needing to use uh, less of the GLP-1 receptor, GLP receptor agonists from the outset and titrate to slowly, thereby uh, uh, reducing the, the nausea side effect that is associated with GLP-1 receptor agonists. So again, in the elderly frail patients, you know, uh, maybe, just maybe, preventing cardiovascular disease may not be their priority. If you discuss with your patient, you might find that improving their quality of life might be the, 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 their preference. And for those patients, a DPP-4 inhibitor is a safe option to use, uh, to consider. So in summary, um, stepwise approach in glycemic control has not consistently led to reductions in complications as we saw in the data that are presented uh, uh, from our real world evidence in Lesser Diabetes Center. Uh, early combination therapy uh, is safe uh, and can reduce therapeutic inertia, and we should not shy away from, um, you know, uh, you know, for, for, from changing our, our our way of practicing. We have been used to the waiting to fail approach for several years, and most guidelines have advocated that. But in recent times, the guidelines are now changing slowly. Uh, the ADA EAC, EAC consensus report also updated recently. They have also advocated initial combination therapy where appropriate. And we in primary care diabetes Europe are advocating this for our patients. Patients should be categorized in different uh, treatment phenotypes so that you can choose your combination therapy uh, based on their various phenotypes. And the various ph uh, pharmacotherapeutic suggestions uh, for combination therapy should be considered in the different categories. Thank you very much for listening. Informative presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sedu, for this very informative presentation. And uh, you have really outlined uh, very clear cut ideas as to how to start treatment when you get a patient in the clinic. Uh, uh, this was a paper, I think, with Dr. Kamlesh Kunti, where you are advocating multiple drug to start with the combination rather than to start with single drug. So I would, uh, uh, we'll go to the next session and I would request my co-chair, Dr. Hemant, to kindly introduce the next speaker and we can take uh, the questions at the end of the session in the discussion part. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I thank Dr. Bansi for involving me in this wonderful uh, academic fist. And we have Dr. Harit Butch, uh, who is pretty well known. He's a current and his, uh, his responsibility is as SS tutor and clinical supervisor for foundation trainees. And uh, well, his reasons for being mentor is he's uh, impressed with the program, he's keen to impart knowledge and experience, and he's keen to interact with new and young consultants. His specific areas of professional interest are endocrinology and inpatient diabetes. And the, he, the first year he appointed as a you know, substantive counsel was in 2002. So he's from UK. So it's my great pleasure to invite Dr. Harit Booch, who is going to talk on a subject which is not routinely touched upon. And that's why I'm very looking forward with a lot of uh, excitement about diabetes and bone. Dr. Harit Booch. Harit, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I think I, I hadn't unmuted myself and I hadn't unmuted the video of, for, for the, the system both. I hadn't spoken anything, but I'm struggling to uh, share the screen um, because it says somebody else. Ah, oh, okay. I think it will let me do it now. Um, is that? It is, is seen it? now. It is seen now. Okay. 
thank you very much for uh, the, the, inviting me to this uh, talk and uh, to the organizing committee, uh, and particularly to Banshi Sabu. Uh, however, I have to say that the gratitude that I feel for Banshi has been significantly diluted by the topic that he has given me. Um, it, it is one of those topics which is probably the one quite uh, lacking in evidence, maybe lacking in interest for a lot of people. Um, so I think Banshi, thank you uh, very much for giving me this topic. Um, however, um, I have to say uh, the other issue is that I'm not uh, 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 involved in diabetes to a, a large extent. Uh, but my involvement with bone is mainly through uh, our joint clinics with rheumatology uh, for management of uh, endocrinological osteoporosis and primary osteoporosis. So in the, in the United Kingdom, the osteoporosis comes under the purview of rheumatology uh, and, some, and in some places endocrinology like at our center. Um, I work in a, in a large district general hospital called New Cross Hospital in a place called Wolverhampton, not too far from. Um, and the most famous part of Wolverhampton is the football club, which is symbolized by the little logo at the left bottom corner of my slide, which is Wolverhampton Wanderers. So that's the only interesting bit of my talk, I, I think. Uh, but I shall try my best to give you some information that is out there. Um, so I'm going to answer some of these questions. Does diabetes increase fracture risk? If it does increase fracture risk, in which particular subgroups? What is the mechanism? Which of these patients need treatment and with what particular agents? Uh, and this is my biggest disclaimer is that the, the, there is very few, uh, there's very little evidence which is robust, very few prospective or even controlled trials. And most of the conclusions that everyone, including myself today, have drawn are from observational and epidemiological data. So compared to the kind of data that was presented previously, uh, this, is not, this is not going to be that sort of information. But a lot of these studies have been published, uh, have been uh, performed in a large number of patients. So there are some safe conclusions we can safely draw. So with that background, now the background of the topic, I mean, these are the things which we definitely know, and it's not controversial. We all know that the age of the population is rising. We all know that osteoporosis is commoner in older, older individuals. The risk of osteoporosis goes up, uh, with osteoporosis goes up the fracture risk. And I think we all know, but probably is not well known enough, is that a fracture is a serious health risk. So a person with hip fracture, one in 10 die in one month and up to three out of 10 die in one year. And in addition to this, it also leads to a significant degree of morbidity uh, and functional impairment, which in turn has a significant impact on the, uh, the care arrangements, especially in the Western world. What we also know, and I'm sure all of you would agree in this audience, is that thanks to the effort of a lot of people working in diabetes, the, the average age of uh, uh, survival age of both type one and type two diabetes is getting longer. And we, we have a lot of people who are old and have diabetes. So then if you put all these facts together and then if diabetes increases fracture risk, you can imagine the magnitude of the task ahead of all of us in terms of fracture risk. I'll just start off with a couple of pages. Very brief. Well, one of them, a 78 year old lady with a long standing type 1 diabetes, no other relevant known osteoporosis risk factors. And these are the ones that 
are in the FRAX risk score, you would know, uh, with a DEXA scan result, which I think is quite acceptable, at least at the hip for a 78 year old lady, ends up having a hip fracture two years after DEXA scan. And that just goes to show how these conventional factors could not predict, predict hip fracture. This lady ended up with incomplete recovery of mobility and in a care home. The other patient was a 66 year old man having had diabetes for half of his life, but had no risk factors for osteoporosis uh, or for fracture, has hypoglycemia, has a fall, has a hip fracture, admitted to hospital, three months stay with post-operative sepsis and delayed recovery. He did recover fully, but after a lot of morbidity. So I think these sort of patients are well known to a lot of you. Both these people had hip fracture, despite their, their overall risk profile in the conventional sense being below the intervention threshold. And this particular story is, I have to say, not exclusive for diabetes because um, bone density is not that great a sense, at its sensitivity in picking up uh, fracture risk. Um, but it's certainly very typical of uh, people with diabetes. So if we look at type 1 diabetes, and there is a very large uh, meta-analysis uh, published about four or five years ago now, where you can clearly see that the fracture risk has a statistically significant increase uh, in compared to background population. And this is actually seen in a number of these smaller studies which constituted this meta-analysis. So I think it, there seems to be a convincing evidence for an increase in fracture risk in type 1 diabetes. It can, the same can be seen by if you look across on this table in the top row of type 1 diabetes, you can see a significantly high odds ratio for any fracture, for vertebral fracture, or for hip fracture. But what you can also see that the evidence is not so robust in type 2 diabetes. There isn't really convincing data on vertebral fracture risk. There are some people who have shown higher risk. There are others who have shown that it's not increased. But the hip fracture risk is generally considered to be uh, statistically significantly higher in people with type 2 diabetes uh, I'm sorry, I haven't put down the confidence interval there, uh, but it is significant. So I think uh, even in type 2 diabetes, hip fracture risk is higher. So in conclusion, the fracture risk is higher in individuals with type 1 diabetes and to a lesser extent in patients with type 2 diabetes. And then if you throw in other important bits of information, that hip fracture tends to occur in patients with diabetes 10 to 15 years earlier than, when it, than what happens in non-diabetes individuals. And the outcomes of the patients having had fracture is also worse in individuals with diabetes. And both of these things were actually nicely illustrated in the two patients that I presented. So with all these bits of information, if you throw it into a pod, I think it clearly shows that there is a significant challenge for all of us in, in this relatively uh, new aspect of diabetes uh, and the implications of having diabetes on bone health. Now, clearly we need to do something for this. We can't do something for everybody. So not every person of diabetes would need management and therefore, we need to identify those who are at the greatest risk. So if you look at the age distribution, although the increasing age increases the risk, if you look at the youngest group of these four cohorts, they have the highest relative risk as compared to background population. And the reason for this is not difficult to understand because these younger individuals have a very low risk profile outside the diabetes sphere. And as they grow older, their back, the risk of the background population goes up and therefore the ratio comes down. So I think the risk does go up with increasing age, but as a diabetes specific issue, the younger individuals are the ones where the difference is the most stark, and possibly in males. 
Those who have higher, a longer duration of diabetes are at greater risk. Uh, but the association with glycemic control is rather murky. It isn't really clear as to whether the two are linked, but certainly in type one diabetes, it has been shown that longer the, sorry, worse the control, the more likely is the fracture. There is no clear cutoff which has been identified, but there is one study which separates patients across the target of 7%. One would expect uh, diabetes complications to be a factor. So it's not surprising that those who have microvascular complications have higher risk, but nephropathy is the only complication which has been independently uh, defined as a predictor for fracture risk. The rest of them are, may have other confounding factors. So in uh, brief, it's the people with uh, long-term diabetes, those with poor control possibly, and certainly those with microvascular complications. And these are the people whom we should be probably targeting. What about the drugs which are used for diabetes? And I think you can probably uh, guess that uh, in the, the ones in green zone, the metformin and the incretin drugs, they have a neutral impact on fracture risk, mainly because through various mechanisms that seem to be leading to bone formation. Uh, and, and that sort of brings up the effect to be neutral or maybe slightly positive. However, uh, insulin and sulfonylurea are being shown to increase the risk. Uh, no mechanistic explanation in terms of effect on bone. And this impact on fracture risk seems to be largely derived from the other actions of insulin, i.e. causing hypoglycemia and falls. It is also important to remember that the patients who are chosen for insulin are de facto higher risk group patients. So they're older with comorbidity. Um, on the other hand, thiazolidinedion is shown to have a direct effect on bone through these PPAR gamma agonist effect, uh, reducing to some extent the osteoclastic, uh, osteoblastic function uh, and reducing bone formation. The one I have left blank is the SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, these are the newest kids on the block for diabetes patients. And they seem to be doing almost everything. Uh, I'm actually surprised they are not being used as anti-COVID drugs. But what the, the impact on the bone is interesting because the initial impression was certainly uh, formed on the basis of this particular study called CANVAS, which looked at the impact of canagliflozin on cardiovascular outcomes um, and its benefit in those patients, where there was a clear difference um, uh, I must remember to use the arrow. So there's a clear difference here where canvas show increases the fracture risk. While what is also noticeable is that all the other non-canvas canagliflozin studies, there was no statistically significant impact on bone risk, on, on fracture risk. So what could be the mechanism? Well, one of the mechanisms floated is that once the kidneys try and lose glucose, the phosphate is retained and that raises the PTH level. So that then leads to increased fracture risk. However, one has to focus on these factors and that to a large extent mitigates the impact of canagliflozin. So if you look, most of the fractures in this particular study happened in the first one or two years of its use. And it's very unlikely that a direct effect on bone is could be responsible. It's much more likely, although hypothetical, that it's the volume depletion effect and leading to falls that could have caused these fractures. Also, these people had a higher cardiovascular risk, higher use of diuretics, all these factors predisposing to uh, adverse bone outcomes. And when the fractures did happen, they happened in the non-spine, not non-hip areas. And this support for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors is then brought out by several other meta-analyses which have been published subsequent to the CANVA study, which have all shown that none of these drugs have a statistically significant impact on um, the fracture risk when used with metformin. So these are all these four groups were 
using metformin and compared with other oral agents for fracture risk, and none of them had a, uh, had a significant impact. But even within this, you can see canagliflozin had the highest odds ratio. So I think in conclusion with the SGLT2 inhibitors, one can probably say that common sense would guide you to avoid canagliflozin in patients who have a very high bone risk uh, or fracture risk, uh, at least until further data is available. So the next question is, how, do, how does diabetes affect uh, fracture? Is it through bone density? Well, the bone density is certainly reduced in type 1 diabetes, but then you find that the fracture risk is disproportionately high to the degree of reduction of bone density. Um, and also in type 2 diabetes, the bone density is in fact higher than in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, higher than in background population. Especially if you look in people who are younger and those who are obese with type 2 diabetes. So if bone mineral density cannot explain the fracture risk, what are the other factors that are contributing or causing uh, uh, fracture risk to uh, go up? Excuse me. <clears throat> so the, the focus actually squarely falls on something called uh, microarchitectural quality of the bone. And this is the, this is a very well-known factor, which also is uh, responsible for fractures in several other situations, along with bone density. And in population with diabetes, there is a lot of evidence based on rather sophisticated uh, analysis of the bone through MRI, through volumetric bone mineral density, and biochemical markers assessing the advanced glycation end products, which all point to poorer architecture of the bone. One of the uh, methods which can be used more routinely rather than these relatively less used methods is that of the trabecular bone strength, which can be measured off a DEXA image. And it has been clearly shown that if you use TBS in place of bone density, you can predict fracture risk much better in type 2 diabetes. And this, again, squarely puts the blame on microarchitectural changes in the bones. Some evidence also that the bone turnover is reduced, but not convincing enough to say that the osteoblastic function is disproportionately reduced. But the bone markers, uh, the biochemical markers for bone turnover are all reduced, both for bone formation and for bone resorption. However, in the midst of all this noise, one thing which we should not forget is the increased risk of falls in people with diabetes. Now, I think you will hardly ever hear falls to be uh, at the front line of all the publications because none of the pharmaceutical companies produce anything to reduce falls. But falls is one of the strongest factors in causing fractures in elderly population. And if you think of the population with diabetes, especially the older population, uh, there, is a, there are significant factors that can drive falls. So hypoglycemia, the muscle and neuromuscular changes, uh, other complications like visual impairment and the presence of comorbidity. So I think falls prevention should probably get a, a lot of more fo lot more focus than what it usually receives. However, if you look at purely from a bone point of view, microarchitecture is the is the guilty party. So then the next question is what can we do and in which patients? And I think it's the second question that is more important to discuss. Which are the patients with diabetes? How can you decide in an individual person? whether to intervene or not, not to intervene. The worrying feature is if you go by the standard criteria, you're going to significantly underestimate the risk of fracture. And you can see that in this particular, this is a very nice study on a large number of people where it was clearly shown that for the same standard deviation of minus 2.5, 
the gap between these two red lines clearly shows the difference in fractures. So if you use the minus 2.5 as the standard cutoff, you will underestimate fracture risk. The dotted line is for people with diabetes and the continuous line for non-diabetes population. And the same applies to this one here where the FRAX risk score is being used and the same gap can be seen in the perceived risk and the actual risk. So it is not enough to use conventional criteria for making a decision on intervention. So what can we do? So three additional factors have been suggested. So we can use one of these three. So you could consider diabetes in place of rheumatoid arthritis on the Frix FRAX calculator. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think so, a lot of you may be familiar with the FRAX risk calculator. A rheumatoid arthritis deserves a tick. So the diabetes can be used in place of rheumatoid arthritis, both type one and type two. Or you can add 10 years to the patient's age, or you can reduce the T-score by 0 0.5. So if the T-score is two, minus two, then use minus 2.5. And in this particular study from Canada, uh, it was very nicely shown that all these three factors are reasonably successful in predicting fracture risk in diabetes population, certainly much more than using conventional criteria. <coughs> So, uh, and, and all these are relatively straightforward criteria, which all of us can use in our offices. One thing I would like to emphasize though, is whilst DEXA and T scores, uh, sorry, DEXA and uh, FRAX are not useful to decide in the uh, intervention on conventional basis, once you decide the threshold, Within population, DEXA and FRAX are equally useful in diabetes groups. So to decide escalation of treatment, response to treatment, follow-up of patients, uh, to assess the gradient of risk for all these factors, DEXA and FRAX are equally useful in diabetes as in non-diabetes. It's just in the intervention threshold that you need to modify. So this is a quick summary of what I've just said. In a in, a, in groups of people with diabetes, <clears throat> if they have fractured, give them treatment like we usually do. But if they have these diabetes related clinical risk factors with or without other risk factors, then you can either use a DEXA scan using a T-score of minus two, or you can use FRAC score independent or with DEXA using diabetes as rheumatoid arthritis and adding 10 to the age. And if they then meet intervention threshold, you treat them. If they don't, just follow them up every two to three years, like you do for any other patient group. Well, after all that, what do we do for these patients? Well, we give them lifestyle measures. So what constitutes lifestyle measures? Well, the usual stuff, don't smoke, uh, don't drink. Um, well, I can't say don't drink. I'm from the state of Gujarat. That's why I say don't drink. But I think you're allowed to drink less than three units, but uh, not always advisable. Uh, one, one thing you need to be careful is when you advise people with diabetes to lose weight, as far as possible, uh, advise them to do weight bearing exercise. Because many people believe that this uh, significant weight loss, which a few people do achieve, can adversely affect the bone health in a short-term sense. So if they exercise along with weight loss through dietary measures, that would be a good mix, uh, which is usually the case for anybody, but particularly for our bone health. Maintain vitamin D above 75 nanomole per liter, optimize glycemic control, which is as we saw earlier on, it's quite easy, give them combination treatment and avoid incriminating diabetes therapy wherever possible. Now, what specific treatment agent? Well, this is where the fundamentals of this talk is weak because I have nothing new to say in terms of what agents to use. Because it was believed that the very mechanism of adverse bone health being more in terms of microarchitecture than bone density, the drug use will be probably different. 
but it isn't because all this data derived from post hoc analysis of osteoporosis trials for non-diabetes patients shows the same thing as what is shown in diabetes individuals. Use oral bisphosphonates. You can use raloxifene, we don't use it particularly here uh, in the UK, uh, but both of them increase bone density, both of them reduce fracture risk, just like any other diabetes population, despite grave theoretical constraints, because you, there is no bone, you, oh, these drugs are anti-resorptive agents, uh, but it does increase bone density, and maybe that's why they reduce fracture risk. There is no evidence for intravenous based phosphonates, but there is no reason to believe it won't work. Again, same with denuzumab, which is being used increasingly in this country. Teriparatide, an expensive drug, uh, which logically for a microarchitectural pathology and one which has reduced bone turnover should be a dream drug but it has not been shown to be significantly more effective, although there is hardly any work, uh, serious work being done on this so far. Um, and nor is there enough evidence to recommend any of the newer agents which have not, which are not uh, particularly been uh, used so far in any case. So the advice is use a diabetes specific intervention threshold and then treat like any other non-diabetes person. And that's all I have to say. And I would just conclude by saying that the fracture risk is high, discordant to bone mineral density. So don't only rely on the bone mineral density. The risk appears to be higher in the kind of people we would expect it to be higher, long-standing, poorly controlled diabetes, complications. Intervention threshold is the key. Use any of the three criteria that I mentioned, but probably using diabetes in place of rheumatoid arthritis seems to be the most logical one. Uh, and this is, it is a little bit of a, uh, work we are doing on the cost analysis uh, on using each of these three criteria. Uh, hopefully in the future we'll be able to come up with the answer for that. And the last thing to say is that the treatment options are rather similar for people with diabetes as those without diabetes. Uh, and I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. I hope I haven't taken longer than my time. No, I think you're fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harit, for a very wonderful and lucid lecture. I, it's, it's a topic which we generally don't touch, but you really covered it very well. And it was mainly clinical so I think most of the clinicians would be helped by whatever you said. So may I just uh, invite Sandeep again for introduction yeah. of the last speaker, please? Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome Dr. Mithun Bharatia. He's very well known, especially in the Northeast region. And uh, he's trained from uh, UK. He's done his MRCP from UK and then his specialist training in diabetes and endocrinology from UK. He has been a, a Mayo Clinic scholar. He has done a FECSM from Amsterdam and very difficult to pronounce Zorg Neoti Newman Prize 2013 for his work in diabetes, testosterone and erectile dysfunction. And he represents uh, India at the worldwide AGP Clinical Academy very well known as sexologist in the Northeast and for all of us. And uh, waiting to hear from you, Dr. Bhartia, invite Thank you to you. kindly make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rai. Thank you, uh, Bansi Bhai, for the kind invitation. Thank you, Vinay Bhai. He's an, he's a, both of them are elder brothers. And I think having two elder brothers like this, I, you can make any mistake and you know they will cover you up. So it's a pleasure always here. Let me also tell you, I say two common things with the two previous speakers. I'm in an Indo-UK symposium. I'm trained both in primary care. I'm a GP, I'm certified as a GP in UK. And I have been, been a consultant very near to where my previous cons uh, speaker has been. I trained in West Midlands in Birmingham and I was working in QE. So I have a common uh, point between uh, in an Indo-UK symposium, if I'm wondering what I'm doing here sometimes. So uh, I think that's past. Uh, thank you. I'm going to talk today about sugar monitoring, the untold secrets. Can my slide be seen? No, no, no. no. Okay, let me just. Show. Slightly earlier stage of development of <coughs> the So these are hard endpoints demonstrating a forty percent. Sorry. Okay. 
Okay. Share the screen. You can share. Yeah, I'm just trying to. Add it on to standard of care. And what you can see here. Mithun, now you can't do this. Eh? I know this is getting a little embarrassing, but I'll do it. Just... <laughs> okay, I now I'm here. Bansi, he missed his dry run. No? Okay, is it working now? No, it's not working. <laughs> okay, but I have emailed the slide set. Uh, just... Sir, uh, may, may I uh, share your slide? Huh? He wants to share, share your slide. slide. You can see it, it, he wa I want me to. He wants you. He wants to share your slides from his end. Oh yeah. Okay. Fine. That's fine. Mithun, you send the slides. Yeah. 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 Always. Okay. Yeah. I will just try once more, and if not, yes. this slide I'll stop. So you never copied me, eh? Mithun, is this some kind of dysfunction? Are they? I. <laughs> you are expert in managing dysfunction. You are becoming. So the this is the this is the last moment dysfunction. You know, every <laughs> last moment dysfunction. And suddenly, you know, Hemant, we have a Gujarati who came and he helped me. So it is visible. Gujarati, me, not in India, me, it goes. In India, me, yes. Thank you. So now you can take please, Mithun. I think my uh, somebody is sharing my screen, right? Okay. So I'm going to talk about sugar monitoring, the untold secrets, and what I'm going to put emphasis some practical take home that I learned uh, while also making the presentation and from my practical experience. So I shall try to keep my focus because a lot of talks has been happened since yesterday on glucose monitoring. Next slide, please. Now, glucose monitoring is a basis of how we actually look at diabetes because that's all tells us whether I'm ek medication kaam kar raha hai ya ek medication kaam nahi kar raha hai. So, and sometimes, and what has happened, we used to look at numbers. Now we look at graphs like ECGs and it helps us decide whether we are in the right momentum in a shared approach with the patient. Next slide. Now, when did this all this started? I think there are two Apple moments that has happened in the history of diabetes like Newton and Steve Jobs, we've had two big moments and one is the HbA1c discovery. Now, for which Samuel Rebar, he is, everybody knows HbA1c, very few people know Samuel Rebar. He was an Iranian scientist who was, who was reading about, who was doing research on hemoglobinopathies and suddenly he found another spike happening in the graph. And when you look back, all of these patients were diabetic and that was the Eureka moment that he had and that is what he devoted his entire life to. And he was in 2012, he was you know, certified by or he was honored by the ADA for this contribution in HbA1c. Now, HbA1c is very simple in terms of I look at hemoglobin as a ball. I put favicol in it, send it in the body. What comes out is how much the favicol is sticking to this ball. But the discrepancies will happen if there are some discrepancies with the number of balls that you have. So, and that may have an effect. We are aware of the common, all these common reasons that can increase or decrease HbA1c because we often get a mismatch of HbA1c and blood sugar when we are doing our own clinic. Next slide. Now, this could have be there for a variety of purposes that are there. Number one, it could be there because our patients do a lot of term called doctor shopping. You know, they may, if I'm in Amdama, they might go to Bansibai, then they might go to another doctor after a month who has changed some medication, patient often don't tell us what has been done. So that could be one of the discrepancies that can happen with HbA1c and fasting and PP that we commonly do. But another common thing that one needs to understand is that we do this graph. This is a D10 HbA1c graph that we all do. I think we should at least glance the graph, not go by the numerical value that is you know given on the HbA1c. For example, you must know what the total area of the curve is, and that should be within the parameter. You should look at the variant window because the variant window is more than 20 to 40. This graph is unreliable. You must look at hemoglobin F, which if it's more than 6%, more than uh, so if it's more than 10%, it is unreliable. If you look at the unknown quantity in this graph, it should be less than 6%. Here you can see 0.4. If this is more than 6%, then this whole graph is unreliable. So I think a fleeting glance on the HbA1c graph that produced often will help us understand whether this is a true HbA1c or, or HbA1c or not. Next slide. The other term 
which we often use intertwined with each other is glycated hemoglobin and glycosylated hemoglobin and that is a belief that it is equal glycated hemoglobin is equal to glycosylated hemoglobin now strictly by purist they are not equal because hba1c is a glycation at a1c we have hba1a hba1b hba1c and others so and the reason why it took all the long time for it discovered because it was a non enzymatic reaction if it had been an enzymatic reaction we would have known of hba1c long ago so pure term to talk about is glycated hemoglobin not glycosylated hemoglobin because glycosylated hemoglobin will use all the uh, glycation of all the other hba1a hba1b and others as well now a cornerstone of our diabetes management is blood glucose monitoring system when by finger prick now when we are looking at deciding what we ought to know a blood glucose monitoring there are certain factors we should know when a medical rep is coming to our office and how we are going to interpret this blood glucose readings that are coming to us a is it available is the strips going to be available what are the interfering sub, uh, substances at what level of iso it is certified next slide please and how is the accuracy and reliability of this so this is a very important graph and i'll bring your attention to this look at two things of this bulls eye if you are near the bulls eye so let me do this if you are look clear to the bulls eye if your blood glucose by finger prick is uh, is very close that that means it is very close to the blood glucose in the lab so it is highly accurate and precision means if i am going to check all my five fingers at a time it is going to come with the same reading so are they precise always are they coming around the same time so what we ought to know is that we don't need high precision we need high accuracy that is it is equal to the lab glucose and it is also high precision that is every time you are going to check it in your fingers 5 minutes apart or say at the same time you are going to get the same readings and there is going to be less variation so this is an ideal glucometer that should be the next slide please now there are next slide so there as i said there are certain factors that we look at as i said precision bias arter interfering substances altitude hematocrit and this all together combines the total analytical error of a glucometer next slide please this is an important parks consensus error the grid and what do you want to see whatever we are getting some variation is it clinically accurate or not and what we want measured blood glucose here actual blood glucose here and we want everything ideal in the a around not in the a, a, not far away as close as it's to the a that means it's not going to have any clinical effect on your management whatever the slight variation is there some people say a and b but as close to a you are that is better next slide please we are aware of this potential interfering substances that can interfere with the blood glucose monitoring however with the newer systems there is less interference with this with this interfering substances next slide but i would bear your yeah next slide i think something very important to look at is the strip expiry date because very often you may not be doing the glucometer check or the patient buys one or it's your uh, a receptionist or your nurse is doing it it is very important to know the expiry date of this glucometer and counsel the patient because we have varying degrees of patients in our clinic who come somebody may to check it very often some check it very sparingly and the glucometer may be out of date when they actually really needs it because it can cause potential interference with the results next slide please and also a hand should be dry there should not be sugar mithai kha ke nahi dekhne ka certain parameters have to be kept up, uh, when you are going to check the blood glucose meters now next slide we have iso standards to look at the glucometer so so and i think there is a important factor that in india kuch bhi waste nahi karta you know they come to us they have some medicines left over they tell us sir let's us use those medicines first and then we will change the medication that you are there because we already have that stock so nobody wants to throw away the glucometer strips that are there in front of them so you can advise people who are actually buying who are sparingly used to buy smaller 
you know, not big boxes of glucometer, but smaller boxes of glucometer so that they do not endure the pain of throwing it away because in reality, they're not going to throw it away. Any glucometer that you are going to find out, I'm not going to go to the details. It's important to know whether it is 2003 standardized and 2013 standardized. 2013 is far more reliable. Important things to understand here is 95% of results is within 15 milligram if the blood glucose is less than 100 or 15% if greater than 100. That means if I check the glucometer sugar now, it's at 100. The person is anywhere between 85 to 115. That is allowed in terms of variation. And the older standards was quite bad. And also, as I said, as I showed you, parts error grid, it should be between zone A and B. Ideally, if you get something that comes in your clinic with zone A, I would really prefer that. Next slide, please. Now, there are two ways in which glucometers test sugar, two mechanistic action. One is the GOD system and the other is the NADS system. The GOD system are prone to oxygen interference and this could be a potential limitation with regards to use, but it's a reliable system. Next slide. The other is the NADPH GDS system, which is an NADPH independent quinoprotein class of oxidoreductase enzyme. Next slide, please. I think in COVID scenario, something to think about is perhaps maybe the GOH meters that you could be using, which is dependent upon the oxygen. If the uh, partial pressure of the oxygen is going to change in these patients, maybe that may not be that reliable as compared to NADH, uh, NADH or the GDH monitoring system. Next slide, please. Let's come to the CGMS, or as I said, which is the second apple that was, as I would say, in the issue of glucose monitoring. And I have learned that my diabetes management and my management has changed while doing CGMS. A lot has been spoken. We know all about this graph and we talk about time in range. So CGMS is, is going to measure interstitial fluid. Now we have we measured fasting PP, we measure HbA1c. This measures interstitial fluid that is there, which is slightly different from the blood glucose meter. Next slide. Now, CGMS, next slide, please. It also has criteria based on ISO as, as there are therefore stringent criteria. Now, when we do an AGP, we get an estimated A1C and there was a lot of who and cry when we got this estimated A1C because people were difficult for them to accept that there was a mismatch with HbA1c as compared to A1c. And the problem in life is when it, something sounds similar, you want it to be very, very uh, same. For example, nobody has a problem if they check their glucometer values and HbA1c values, it's accepted they are measuring two different things. But the moment the word is estimated A1c, it sounds like A1c. So there must be a match with HbA1c and estimated A1c. And there's an extremely good paper by Richard Bergenstein, which was published in Diabetes Care, which suggested only 19% of there is a correlation between A1c and HbA1c. And he introduced a new term, glucose management indicator. So if you're going to now use a glu term glucose management indicator, now nobody has a problem with A1c because there's glucose, lab glucose, there's HbA1c, there's glucose management indicator. It sounds differently. It's a psyche of how we look at things and it's far more acceptable in that way. Next slide, please. Now, CGMS readings, you must understand it's measuring something else. If I look at the Libre Pro, which is the professional version, there is a lag. So what you are measuring now, there is a 17 minute lag. The instrumental lag is 13.5 with a physiological lag of five minutes. So what you are checking in your blood glucose and what you are checking in your lipid, there would be lag. There will not be the same readings because that was the next question many people had. And as glucose is fluctuating, the change in interstitial, when in glucose was increasing, the change in IGS is less than blood glucose, while it's decreasing the change in IGS is greater than in blood glucose. Next slide, please. The other thing to be kept in mind is when we are going to actually look at inpatients, there is no data with CGMS studies. In fact, patients who are ill, who are unwell, there's going to be variation of the interstitial fluid and CGMS presently, there's no validated data. The other concept that is often spoken about when we come to CGMS is MARD. MARD is the mean absolute relative difference and is the most common matrix presently in CGMS. What it is trying to measure, it's trying to measure the average of the absolute error between all the CGMS values and the matched reference values, which is measured by YSI, yellow spring in, uh, instrument, which is the way lab glucose is measured in 
ex experiment or laboratory control readings so which is they are looking at the absolute error between the two now is mard a good because you'll find cgms people coming and tell you my mard is this my mard is that my mard is better than the, that cgms somebody will talk about this way or the other way in principle a smaller a larger mard is bad a smaller mard is better but is mard reliable let's look at the next slide a newer concept that is there because there is some data which says that there is they are not always a reliable of cgms in indicator and significance and reliability of mart for the accuracy of cgms these two extremely good papers people can read about if they are in interested next slide please this is the other thing that one one should be actually aware of which is the mart reliability index i talked about accuracy and precision so even it takes into account the accuracy of the readings of the cgms the precision of it as well as the precision of the lab ysi so this is a mard reliability index is a better terminology that you could ask a uh, people that will help us distinguish whether the mard is kind of a cover of it or not next slide please now we have a newer uh, wine uh, i would say a newer packaging of the wine which is an extremely good way uh, time in range the concept of time in range and we want 70% of the time we have divided into time above range time below range and time in range and we want majority of the time the person is in 70% in time in range next slide now this is the goal that has been there that as i said and then less than 4% below and then minimize each time above 1 meter milligram next slide please so time in range is a concept which has come and they have defined the normality between 70 to 180 these two ex exceedingly good papers one by richard bergenstein and the other by villar study where they studied the healthy persons and they looked at what is the normal variation that is there and they found that they recommended 70 to 140 so 70 to 180 the time in range consensus guideline next slide is a consensus guideline that has been there with a pragmatic view as 70 to 140 is unachievable and i think we we will shall be presently there is no indian data but i'm sure we will get more indian data to talk about time in range but something to understand that it's a consensus guideline and the normal healthy studies so 70 to 140 a very good concept that is coming out is a new concept like time in range is point in range which is very similar they have divided into 70 to 180 that those that part remain same the point in range is come by glucometer measurements and this is by kutrozola et al and this has been published very recently in september 2020 by looking at smbg data in a structured smbg fashion next slide please and they found that there is a significant correlation between hba1c and point in range which was calculated by integrated digital technology next slide please next slide so as i said they've uh, they are looking at point in range point below range point above range and glycemic variability next slide please so they looked at the new matrix which were uh, collected over two months and two weeks before was the last hba1c and the two months reflected approximately the hba1c value and the two weeks was in analogy what is currently suggested with the use of cgm next slide please and similarly as with hba1c and time in range we say that itna percentage movement corresponds to the movement in hba1c the point in range every shift in point in range by 10% corresponds to a change in hba1c of 0.4% so in people who can't afford cgms in people where there are pragmatics of training gl blood glucose monitoring has been used we have been using it we have been using it for yester years it's just a way of using it in a structured manner and perhaps we'll have more data of point in range as to how useful is that next slide please the other concept that's i think my last two slides the other concept that i would like to spend some time is that type 1 diabetes if you look at cgms it's an extremely good way because there's a lot of intra day and inter day variability that exists when we look at type 2 diabetes generally speaking a low day to day variability with the repeating pattern once identified can be addressed if you have identified the pattern from this view point in mind if we have i think we have been told that as a new cgms device called sugarwit cgms device 
which has been launched in the US, which will do daily CGMS. So perhaps if it comes in a cost effective manner in India, it, we will have a widespread use of CGMS that could be done for one day or two day or three day in patients whose lifestyle and whose meal pattern and whose medication pattern is preserved and not erratic. Next slide. And I think I would conclude my talk by saying is that make new friends, but keep the old. The new friends are silver, is a new fashion. Everything will come, the new, uh, newer, newer things will come. But the old friends are like gold. We started with SMBG. We are getting new data with SMBG. CGMS is an extremely good concept to be used for patients who have a lot of variability in type 2 diabetes. If we get one day CGMS that are coming, it might really be the game changer for India. With that, I would end my talk and I apologize that I've not been able to do my own slides. But thank you so much once again and I'm happy to take any questions that are there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mithun, for uh, a very informative presentation for day-to-day -day practice. And uh, uh, I think now we, we are open for discussion. I can't see any questions. If my co-chairperson can see any questions there. Uh, no, I don't see any question, but I think we can start the ball rolling. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, any yeah. so we, I, I I can I ask a question to my previous speaker, Dr. Butch? Please go ahead. Yes, sure. Yeah. Dr. Dinesh Agarwal. So, um, the, you said about vitamin D greater no. than 85. Is there evidence or it's just an extrapolation of data? Well, there is evidence for vitamin D more than 75 in non-diabetes, but the rest of it is extrapolation. Okay. Uh, what they say is not to give... Um, you see, a lot of places in the United Kingdom, they give large doses and then forget about it. And that it just swings up and down. But the, the general, the, the evidence is for continuous level of more than 75 or you, I think the 60 to 75 is a bit blurred, but rather than the standard practice of giving a lot of vitamin D and then not giving anything to make it cost effective is not what was recommended. Okay. Uh, Sandeep, I see one question uh, for Mithun. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. The question is that should we replace the glycated hemoglobin by fructosamine? Okay. So, Dr. Hazra has asked this question. So, it's a very yeah. good question. When I was training in the UK in pregnancy, uh, we used to do fructosamine there. Uh, the, concept, the, uh, the concept of that was that HB1C takes three months to average out and fructosamine you will get the movement in the fructosamine will be earlier to detect. However, what we have to understand is the HbA1c, even though it reflects the last three months, the preceding month contributes 50% of that uh, three months average of HbA1c. So, and plus fructosamine assays in India are varied. You may not be happening in your town. You will have to send it to us some lab, which it will go. There is something in the Google if you want to do it, but Precisely from practicality purposes, I don't use it and I don't recommend uh, using fructosamine in daily life. HbA1c also can be used. Uh, you have to be pragmatic to understand we are looking at the last one month if you really want to use that uh, for, for that. Can I ask you one more thing, Mithun? <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah. What is your opinion about the glycated albumin? Because, uh, you know, we are hearing a lot about it. I think I have been hearing about it quite a long time now. So I think it will uh, still not something that would happen in daily practice, something that would come away. I think if we are really stuck with an HbA1c uh, because of hemoglobinopathies or there is a discrepancy between HbA1c and the fasting PP that we are doing, go for a CGMS. Mm -hmm. uh, it will answer the question very well. So this is what I do in real life. If there's a discrepancy between the two, it's not matching. I go for a CGMS. If it is matching, I stick to that to, you know, to have a cost effective decision for the patient. Somewhere right. that I've drawn the line somewhere there. Fair enough. Yes, Doctor, yeah, here? please. Dr. Mithun, in India, seeing the economic condition here in India, uh, you very nicely showed a recent study where this uh, seven point glucose uh, testing by glucometer, how well does it co correlate with CGMS? Because in India, it's not possible to do it again and again. 
I mean, if you want to see with change of medication, time in range, once a person will do it, but uh, you know, if you want to repeat it and do it again and again, it's not possible. So how well does it correlate? I mean, you have read that paper, it's a recent so paper. The papers uh, showed a good uh, relationship. Uh, it is not an Indian paper. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, after the meeting, Bansi Bhai, and I'm going to put in a grant for RSSDI uh, to try to take out more Indian data because I, you are very rightly said, we can put up a CGMS today, patient can afford it today. Once we have changed the medication, it's going to come back in a month's time. We yes. shall be doing SMBG only. That's, let's be pragmatic. And the patient so may not agree. A, yeah. So that is something which we are going to do. I, in my clinic, there is a rule that a patient comes to me. He has to come to me with a structured two-day SMBG readings whenever he comes. Yes. So at least I can make some sense with what he has come. I don't do fasting and PPI. I kind of abolished that in my clinic. Um, so my clinic starts quite late for that purpose also, and there's less messy. But, you know, the people do a lot of tricks when they do fasting. People, they will stop the medicines. So sometimes I, I really got tired coming from the UK, trying to adapt myself. And I think I was very rigid on HbA1c. My rigidity has gone down, uh, as you said, with uh, hair coming in and hair losing out from my head. On You know, I want everything to be done prim and proper in India. I have learned uh, ways of practice. Uh, and to draw a line somewhere, you know, that is acceptable for my practice, uh, not leaving up things uh, that I would like to be left. So I think there's a compromise level I've learned uh, coming from the UK and practicing now for the sixth year now. So somewhere I've drawn the line between the two. Yeah, I think Dr. Harit wants to come in. I can see a raised voice, raised hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I would never raise my voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what I wanted to say about fructosamine is uh, my colleague, who is my mentor, um, he has done so much work on the glycation gap between HbA1c and fructosamine. Um, I think fructosamine is of immense benefit in a lot of patients where you would not expect it to be helpful, but there are no clues to predict a discordant HbA1c. There are certainly a lot of people like you mentioned about the um, hemoglobinopathies and where you can actually predict the HPMC to be in, inappropriately low. So I think when you can do fructosamine, I perfectly understand your point that in India, it's a nightmare because I have worked in India myself for one year in 2013. And I initially started requesting fructosamine before I stopped, quickly stopped doing it. But I think the where you can use, and this is something which I think can be developed in India somehow, Banshi will manage if you ask him, uh, that the fructosamine is particularly helpful. I think we routinely do now for every patient, both HbA1c and fructosamine at least sometimes. There are so many issues like non-compliance with treatment and recent startup of treatment, uh, etc. I mean, there are a number of examples that can be Harid Bhai, I would agree. I think the problem is uh, the cost of fructosamine would be roughly equivalent to a CGMS Libre. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. So I would rather get far more information putting a Libre Pro professional up for that patient. Okay. Uh, rather than uh, you know, I get far more information out of that. So that, that is, is where true. the line. Is. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. If that is the case, I didn't realize that the costs were, could be matched because for us, it's just a tick box for doing fructosamine. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, as I said, I was in a lot of, you know, when I came to, I, in every clinic, I needed my albumin creatine ratio, my HbA1c, my lipid profile. Somehow I've learned to spread the load apart for the patient. And yeah, uh, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, thank you. I think I have a question for Dr. Samuel. He's uh, just very silent for quite some time. Hi, Samuel. Hi, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I, I really want to ask you one question. You know, many a times now, especially in India, of course, it's happening everywhere, is uh, people around 35, 36 years of age coming to you with diabetes with A1C, let's say 9%. Now, there are certain papers which came in Lancet and Diabetes Care, and you yourself have done a couple of papers which you showed. Would you consider giving them insulin right away? Because the data showed that, you know, there was a remission in diabetes at the end of two years in 42% of the patients. So what would, what would be your take uh, for the patients like this? Uh, yeah, 
a good point. Theoretically, that sounds right. I think the paper you're talking about uh, came out a few years ago now. It, it was a Chinese, it was an easy Chinese paper where they started off with insulin right from diagnosis and uh, they were able to to show some very dramatic improvements um, with restoration of beta cell function. Uh, theoretically, it sounds good, but um, certainly in the UK, I don't know about India, uh, approaching my newly diagnosed young patient with a needle from the outset uh, is a big challenge. Uh, when I get very high A1Cs, sometimes I'm able to scare them uh, into going to an injectable from the outset, get an A1C down quickly, and then I can revert to orals. I have certainly done that uh, in the UK with my minority patients. Uh, the, the culture is slightly different with minority patients. The, the approach to consultation is doctor knows best. So if I see you young, less than 40, A1C, very high, and I'm really scared of you know, complications, even if you're not osmotic, and I tell you, hey, my friend, your glucose level is so high, uh, you're gonna end up with an MI or a stroke or kidney failure or amputation. The only way out at this stage is to go for a needle. From the outset, we can always go back to hours later once we control it. They will normally agree. And when I do that, within three, three months, I can get the A1C down quickly, and then you can change them to orals if you want to. Um, there is certainly good evidence to go aggressive. The only problem is getting patients to adhere to needles from the outset. That's a challenge. I think Dr. Samuel, I, yeah, go, go ahead, Bitum, go ahead. No, 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 Vinay, you say. Dr. Samuel, I was actually very, very interested in your presentation regarding early combination therapy, especially with patients with heart failure and patients with CKD and CAD. Can, uh, we have a lot of fixed drug combinations in our country and uh, we use them very, very commonly. Can we have drugs like ACLD2 inhibitors, metformin, FDCs for heart failure patients so that initiating uh, early uh, therapy would be easier for these people? I think ideally that should be the right the right approach to have the medications uh, as as fixed fixed uh, dose combinations so metformin plus something else uh, from the outset so that you you would straight away leap over the problem with therapeutic inertia from the clinician point of view. Yeah. I think that the challenge usually will be for prescribing advices uh, is the different components of the fixed those combinations have different threshold of renal tolerance. Uh, metformin, for example, in the UK, they advise us to start, you know, uh, reducing dose if the EGFR is going less than 45 and stopping the dose if it's less than 30. And if it's combined with, you know, um, a DPP4 inhibitor, for example, linagliptin, there is no renal margin. And so when they have the combo product and the EGFR is going down, what do you actually do? You can't stop one yeah. and leave the other because they are together. And so that becomes a challenge. And because of that, uh, a lot of people don't like using the combo uh, medications in the UK. But if, if you are comfortable with that, the pricing is exactly the same as the unit price of the more expensive one. Uh, and and it's, it's a good approach. Now, the fixed ratio combination when it comes to insulin, uh, and GLP-1 receptor agonist is rather um, more attractive. Unfortunately, it's not very well marketed in the UK. Uh, we, we don't even have the, uh, the uh, Aglalexi. We just have the, the, the Novo product, the Aglera. Uh, and even that is not very uh, widely used across the UK. It's only certain uh, areas that you have it. So Vinay, I will, I will give you some background <clears throat> because I've, Samuel, I've also, I was a GP in Canterbury for four years. So uh, in, in UK, the primary care trust holds a key, what they will put on formula really, they will decide for that area, like government of Gujarat has decided that you can only prescribe this, this, this in your clinic. You cannot, you have to be in formulary with those medications in your uh, computer system only. And generally, typically speaking, they do not like combination medication. <coughs> Number one. Number two, they do not like very expensive medications because everything is free there. So there's a lot of rationing of resources that has happened 
to decide the best buck for their value that they do. So that is how uh, the challenge is there. And very often, you know, uh, I'm sure Samuel has to also fight for his patients with the PCT to get the best thing out because it uh, can be a fight. When in terms of the relationship, there is primary care, the patient says, my GP, my doctor, my doctor. Hai. When he goes to secondary care, it's not he's just going for an opinion, takes an opinion, comes back. The bonding in secondary care is very fleeting, whereas the bonding in primary care, he actually believes, uh, you know, in the womb to tomb concept that is there because they're going to be there in their practice for a long time. So, no, I, I have a very, we are, uh, very, very the relevant. time limit. Can yeah, just I... a small question, one small question. See, yeah, uh, please, please. A, a very, very relevant question, Mithun. I yeah. mean, how should a patient decide which glucometer to purchase from the market? What should be the criteria for picking up a glucometer from the counters? Because most of the people are buying online, Amazon, or maybe from the counters, or maybe they are buying even from the uh, in-flight shoppings as well. So what would you suggest that the patient should actually look into when they are purchasing a glucometer? I'm talking about the validated glucometers, which will okay. give them a uh, appropriate reading, which you are talking about. So I think three things which I have also learned to do is that because I don't stock glucometers in my clinic. So I asked them, I said, it must look at the data. It must be 2013. Number two, look at the price of the strips. Don't look at the price of the machine because that is where you're going to get fleeted up. Look at the number of tests that you do. That's based upon you buy a pachaska, ya 20 ka, ya, you know, the, the amount of things you, you, you buy upon. And also if it's from a reliable place, you learn the glucometer testing from that pharmacy that you are buying. So that if there is a discrepancy, you can put it back on his hand and he will sort it for you out. If you buy it from online, sometimes there is no hearing. You may get 500 rupees less. So that's why I said you buy from a pharmacy near your house who you know, so that you can go back and haunt him if there is a big discrepancy and they will help you change it. That is what I, uh, I try to follow with that. About validation of a meter, I mean, there are a lot of companies which are marketing glucometers. So how do you know which one is validated and which one is not seeing a glucometer? Yeah, so I think the branded glucometers, the branded companies like AcuCheck, they are quite reliable in my experience. Um, a lot of uh, Dr. Moorpens and other things, I find a lot of variability that exists uh, that are there. So I give them one touch is also quite reliable. So I ask them you one touch. If you ask me, I said one touch and IQ check. Any one of them will do. But you look at the price. And the, uh, if you do not want Bluetooth Bluetooth technology, if you're not at computer savvy, don't waste that extra 500 for that yep. machine, which is not which is Makes not. Makes sense. Yep. Uh, Mithun, can I uh, you know add on to this? Yes, sir. sir. I think uh, there is a clear cut uh, you know guideline now that you have ISO 2013 standards. And yes, all the meters that are uh, ratified to ISO 2013 standards are, uh, you know, okay, good meters. And their strips also have to be, you know, conforming to that standard. It is not that just uh, the meter is standardized now. The strips also have to follow that, you know, standards of uh, manufacturing. So all the meters which have ISO 2013 conf uh, configuration, they are okay, good meters. Thank you, Dr. Makkar. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Mithun, uh, Dr. Dandania. And I want to profusely thank the three speakers, Dr. Samuel, Dr. Harit, Dr. Mithun, for very informative, interesting presentation, which will be of great use to all the listeners and practitioners of diabetes. I also want to thank my uh, co-chairperson, uh, uh, Dr. Adnani, for uh, for being with us and uh, assisting us and all the other people who have been participating in this uh, great Indo-UK symposium. And uh, in the end, not the least, I want to thank again, Dr. Bansi Sabu for giving us a chance to participate in this prestigious conference. And the technical and team, Hardik Bhai, and its team for making this meeting very, very Yeah, Hardik always, yeah. Hardik yeah, is yeah, the yeah. backbone. Hardik is the backbone, yep. yeah. yeah. So Hardik is, yeah, thanks thank to Hardik and his team. And yep. uh, uh, now I'd like to hand over to the, for the next session, to the rapporteur who's in the, for the next session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you. We have finished in time. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. You are audible. Hello. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, this is Dr. You. Nitin Goswami uh, from Ahmedabad, uh, reporter of the next session, sir. Okay. Uh, our yes, next sure. session is Diabetes Care Symposium. Uh, for the symposium, we have two eminent chairpersons, Dr. Rajesh Sehli, sir, from Rajkot, and Dr. Deepak Yagnik, sir, from Kanpur. Uh, I will hand over this to, to Dr. Teli sir and Dr. Agni sir for the further proceeding of the session, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nitin. Uh, uh, welcome to this uh, last but not the least session of the day and uh, this year diacon. Uh, today we have three eminent speakers for this particular session. The first speaker is Dr. B.M. Makka. Dr. B.M. Makka is director for Dr. Makkal's Diabetes and Obesity Center in New Delhi, Honorary Secretary RSSTI 2017-19, to the ex-chairman RSSTI Delhi Chapter, Member Executive Board, Diabetes India, Honorary Secretary of... Uh, Indian Obesity Network, Member AAC International Committee 2014-16-17, and AAC Professor Business Committee, AAC DSN International Work Exposure UC. San Francisco Cleveland Clinic, John Hopkins Oxford Diabetes Center, Mayo Clinic. He is a course director for Cleveland Clinic Advanced Certificate Course in Diabetes 2010 till date. Publication in books and national and international journals are n number of publication Dr. B. M. Makka have in his portfolio. And at the end of the introduction, I say he is a gem of a person. Over to Dr. B. M. Makka for his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Yagnik, for those very, very kind words. Uh, can I share my screen? Sure, sir. So is my screen uh, visible now? Very much visible, sir. Thank you, Bansi Bhaiya, <laughs> Pranam. At the outset, I would like, like to thank uh, my dear uh, younger brother, Bansi, for uh, you know keeping me involved in so many presentations. I think uh, this year, since he has been sitting in his clinic most of the time and not traveling out of Ahmedabad, he has done the maximum ac academic activity that anybody can do in a you know calendar year. And, uh, <laughs> I think uh, we, if we try to you know, apply, he will get uh, it recorded in Guinness Book of Records also. <laughs> so I think, Bansi, we should consider the number that we have done and uh, apply for Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> for me, you know, you are coming and talking in my meeting. That is more than a award, you know, Dr. Makkar. And all of you are very close to me as a brother. So we are like so a family. Think, Every uh, day we would like to listen from you a newer and newer topic. And this is a very, very interesting topic. We, we thought of that. Now again, we should have a, somebody should talk on a sulfonylurea. So that is what we had asked Dr. Makkar to deliver a talk. So thank you once again. And I will start with my topic, which is the resurgence of sulfonylureas on the backdrop of recent advances. I uh, actually, uh, there is a disclosure. Uh, this is the wrong slide here. So this is a Abbott sponsored uh, session and uh, I am on their speaker panel as well as on their advisory board. So uh, briefly, you know, uh, starting from the uh, concept, we have uh, the sulfonyl ureas because belong to a category of secretovox, which are the medicines that stimulate beta cell two secrete insulin and because of this property actually they are thought to exhaust beta cells now if you look at the usage of various uh, anti-diabetic agents over last uh, you know decade and half this is the data from 2005 to 2016 there is some decline in the usage of sulfonyl ureas which has come down to something like 46 percent from 60 percent and there is an increasing share going to DPP-4 inhibitors. And there are some concerns with use of sulfonyl ureas, which appear during this period. We know that sulfonyl ureas are one of the most potent anti-glycemic drugs and give you a maximum A1C reduction that any oral agent will give. 
and they have their own benefits that they provide not only effective glycemic control, but there is evidence of reduction in the microvascular complications. They have the extensive experience in clinical practice. We are using them for almost 60 years now, and they are pretty inexpensive drugs. But there are some limitations uh, which have come up over the last two decades. One, there is risk of hypoglycemia, though it is uh, pretty much low with the modern sulfonyl ureas. Then there are concerns relating to weight gain with sulfonyl urea usage. There is, uh, you know, concern about limited glycemic durability of the control and evidence of long-term CV safety. But I think the last three are more of uh, myths rather than uh, the real concerns. And I'll show you, you know, sufficient data to dispel these myths related to sulfonyl ureas. So we know type 2 diabetes is characterized by insulin resistance and compromised islet cell function, which leads to a decrease in insulin secretion. And this insulin decrease in insulin secretion is progressive because there is a progressive loss of beta cell function, which occurs during the course of disease. So if we are looking at progressive loss of insulin secretion, actually the insulin secretagogue therapy, which is focusing on increasing insulin secretion from beta cell, is a logical part of therapy of type 2 diabetes. And sulfonyl ureas, we know, have been mainstay of diabetes therapy for almost six decades now. So what are the real concerns? One is uh, the improved understanding of uh, pathophysiology over last two decades has led to introduction of a number of new oral agents. And because of that, there have been you know, some concerns that they will sulfonyl ureas will lead to progressive decline in beta cell function, possibly have some adverse CV events and uh, adverse cardiovascular risk and adverse risk for mortality. So in this presentation, I will take you through whether they cause beta cell exhaustion and will have poor you know, long-term control, uh, whether they are you know, major risk for hypoglycemia, what is their cardio cell activity, what is the mortality risk and cardiovascular outcome data related to sulfonyl ureas and what is the risk of weight gain, and finally, I'll take you through the recommendations from various guidelines. So first of all is the beta cell exhaustion concern. Now we know that sulfonyl ureas act through a specific receptor on beta cell stimulating the insulin secretion. And because of this action, mechanism of action, they are, you know, it is thought that they will exhaust the beta cell because they are repeatedly stimulating it slogging them uh, for increased insulin secretion and will lead to beta cell exhaustion. Now, question is, do beta cells get exhausted in type 2 diabetes? Answer is yes. But do sulfonyl ureas accelerate beta cell exhaustion? The answer is no. And we, we have enough data to support this from UK PDS and ADOPT studies. We know from you know, DCCTA and UK PDS that there is a progressive decline in insulin secretion with passage of time. And this progressive decline leads to uh, progressive worsening of glycemic control irrespective of the therapies used, which was clearly shown in UKPDS study. And because of this, uh, you know, there is a concern about the long-term efficacy of sulfonyl ureas also. Now we have enough studies with where the newer sulfonyl ureas especially have been compared with the modern drugs like DPP-4 inhibitors. So this is data over two years comparison compared to Vildagliptin. There's no difference in the uh, glycemic control at end of two years compared to Saxagliptin, similar glycemic control provided by glipizide added to metformin at the end of two years. And we have data, you know, this was a study which looked at comparison between SU, DPP-4 inhibitors or glitazone added to metformin. And for this was uh, patients followed up for five years and showed that dual therapy th failure at one year was only 15% with sulfonyl ureas, 23% with DPP-4 inhibitors, and 8% with glitazones. And the adjusted multivariate model showed that compared to SU group, adding DPP-4 inhibitors was actually associated with the increased risk of treatment failure. This was another study which looked at treatment intensification of metformin with sulfonyl urea, DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and insulin, and looked at the mean time to insulin dependence. And the results clearly showed that sulfonyl urea usage was associated with the longest time to insulin independence, you know, providing a strong evidence for long-term durable control. 
Now, not all sulfonyl ureas are similar, and the modern sulfonyl ureas score better on these uh, aspects. And this is the retrospective analysis of patients who were on glimepiride, uh, glibenclamide versus glyclazide, followed up for almost 15 years, and showed that glyclazide usage was, you know, associated with a very long uh, duration of glycemic, uh, durable glycemic control, and led to almost 15 years, uh, you know, durable control before usage of insulin was required. Now, we have sufficient four years data with, you know, uh, sulfonyl ureas versus uh, DPP-4 inhibitors and SGLT-2 inhibitors. And this is EMPA versus glimepiride added to metformin. At the end of four years, there is hardly any difference in A1C uh, reduction. Similar results from uh, uh, for dapagliflozin added to metformin versus glipizide added to metformin. And now we have Carolina data over six years period, if you look carefully, there is 0% difference in the weighted average mean of A1C reduction at the end of six years of follow-up. So they have pretty good long-term efficacy compared uh, with any of the modern molecules. Now, there is a risk of hypoglycemia associated with sulfonyl ureas, but the newer or modern sulfonyl ureas are associated with a smaller risk, much smaller risk of hypoglycemia. This is a study where uh, sulfonyl urea usage was compared with citagliptin, uh, glycoxide versus citagliptin in patients who were do fasting during Ramadan and looked at the incidence of hypos. Uh, and this study was uh, sponsored by MSD, which is the manufacturer or the uh, patent holder for citagliptin. The study showed there was hardly any difference between hypos, uh, between citagliptin versus glycoxide. Though glimepiride had uh, slightly higher incidence of hypos and highest was seen with the glibenclamide. And similar data was shown by one of the studies done by our friend, Dr. Arvind from Bangalore. Again, you know, glycoxide showing similar uh, risk of hypoglycemia as citagliptin. Now, this is a data from a Carolina study. And if you see clearly, the risk of severe or moderately severe or any hypoglycemia risk is high with sulfonyl ureas, which was glimepiride in this study as compared to linagliptin. But if you look at the severe hypoglycemia risk, the total number was only 0.5 per 100 patient years. And the very severe risk uh, or the hospitalization due to hypoglycemia was only 0.2 per 100 patient years with gl glimepiride usage. Though it was higher than linagliptin, but the number was so small that actually, you know, this is a very calculated risk when you're taking, when you're using sulfonylurea. Coming to the cardio selectivity, there has been some issue that there was some experimental data showing that uh, sulfonylureas may be, you know, abolishing the ischemic preconditioning, which is a powerful endogenous mechanism by which heart protects itself from the uh, repeated, uh, you know, lethal inserts after repeated ischemic uh, exposures. And the data is now very clear that glimepiride and glycoxide, which are the most commonly used sulfonyl ureas now, do not abolish my mitochondrial protection afforded by the ischemic preconditioning. And we, if you look at the, you know, uh, myocardial infarction data from UK PDS, 10 years follow-up, Actually, you know, UKPDS initially did not show any macrovascular benefit, though there was a trend, but it was statistically non-significant. But 10 years UKPDS follow-up showed that sulfonylurea insulin arm also had a significant reduction in the risk of myocardial infarction, which was 15% and statistically significant. So there was no increased risk of uh, CV or macrovascular outcomes in patients treated with insulin or sulfonylurea. Now, coming to mortality risk and CV outcomes. UKPDS, again, look at the comparative, you know, uh, endpoints uh, in chlorpropamide, glibenclamide versus insulin. Any diabetes-related endpoints or microvascular endpoints, all three therapies had equivalent risk reduction for all major clinical outcomes compared to conventional therapy. No evidence of any deleterious effect on myocardial infarction, sudden death, or diabetes-related deaths. UKPDS follow-up, decrease in death from any cause, even in sulfonylurea arm, uh, as compared to the placebo or the conventional arm. 
advanced study was basically a study looked at the long term usage of uh, uh, glycolazide on the macrovascular outcomes. 91% patients in the intensive arm treated by uh, glycolazide targeting a A1C to 6.5%, no increase in cardiovascular risk. There was no increase in the major uh, cardiovascular endpoints in advanced trial. Now, always a question whether sulfonylureas have a CV out outcome trial. The answer is no, but sulfonylurea or glimepiride, namely was a part of CV outcome trial done with lenagliptin called Carolina trial. And Carolina evaluated the CV safety of lenagliptin versus active comparator, which was glimepiride in this trial in uh, patients with relatively early type two diabetes with increased cardiovascular risk or those with increased CV risk and established CV complications. Study involved 6,000 plus patients, randomized one is to one to lenagliptin versus glimepiride, followed up for almost six years. The primary outcome was 3-point MACE, secondary outcome was 4-point MACE and other metabolic parameters. Median time in the study was 6.3 years and median treatment exposure was 5.9 years. No, time to a first occurrence of 3-point MACE, no difference between lenagliptin versus glimepiride. Individual components of MACE, no difference between glimepiride and lenagliptin. CV mortality, no difference versus lenagliptin. And all-cause mortality, again, no difference versus lenagliptin. No difference in individual components of uh, you know, endpoints in lenagliptin versus glimepiride. And not only that, if you look at the durability of control, 0% difference in the A1C reduction over a period of six years follow-up. Glucose loan, introduction of glucose lowering medications post baseline, very similar whether it was the lenagliptin group or the other group or glimepiride group. And change in body weight, which is a concern, only 1.5 kg gain over six years follow. So it is not a major concern again. Now let us look at the data for weight gain. UK PDS 10 years follow up. Only 1.7 kg weight gain in patients treated with glibenclamide compared to the uh, conventional therapy. Now, if we look at you know uh, data from various studies, the data has clearly shown that SUs can give you a weight gain in the range of 1 to 1.5 kg max. And if it is combined with metformin, again the weight gain is less than 2 kg. Now, once we, you know, this whole concept of weight gain and weight loss started once we started getting trials from DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 analogs. Now, this is a comparative data with uh, glimepiride versus uh, uh, vildagliptin added to metformin. And the study showed that there is, you know, weight neutral or weight neutrality seen with the vildagliptin versus weight gain with glimepiride. Now, what is weight neutrality? 0.8 kg weight loss. And what is weight gain is 1.1 kg weight gain. So I think the perception has to change. When we say the 1 kg weight loss is weight neutral, then 1 kg weight gain is also weight neutral. It is not weight gain. And as I showed you Carolina data just now, there is only 1.5 kg weight gain over six years follow-up. Now look at the four years follow-up data versus empagliflozin only about 1 kg weight gain versus dapagliflozin, 0.73 kg weight gain over four years follow-up. Advanced study at the end of five years did not show any weight gain in patients treated with uh, sorry, glycolazide uh, uh, for more than five years. So their weight gain is again hardly an issue. So most of these concerns are misfounded, especially when we are looking at glimepiride and glycolazide except for the hypoglycemia risk, which is a modest risk and can be you know, uh, taken care by a proper uh, up titration of uh, sulfonylureas in clinical practice. Now, if you look at the guidelines, all guidelines recommend as first-line therapy being metformin. And if you look at the ADA guidelines published uh, a week or 10 days back only, clearly says that we need combination therapy because long-term maintenance of glycemic targets Monotherapy is usually not effective and the combination therapy is required. And it recommends again stepwise addition to metformin. Now, there is clear that once the metformin is the first line drug, you have, after that you have to look at the 
second when you are looking for the second agent you have look at, at the clinical characteristics and especially the presence or absence of ascvd and renal failure and other after that you have to take care of the other factors including patient preferences also so if the patient has established ascvd or risk for ascvd or heart failure or renal disease a sglt2 inhibitor or a glp1 receptor agonist with proven efficacy should be added irrespective of the a1c levels now if this is not the consideration there is little evidence to support one combination over other and you can choose any of the six options which is su glitazone dpp4 inhibitor sglt2 inhibitor insulin or glp1 receptor agonist and this is the table from the current 2021 Uh, ada recommendation clearly says that sulfonyl ureas have high efficacy they have neutral cv outcome cv effect they have no effect on no adverse effects on uh, heart failure they have low cost which is a big advantage in indian setting they are oral agents which is again an advantage as far as the progression of ckd is concerned they are neutral they can you know the newer sulfonyl ureas can be used in patients with ckd the concern about heart uh, cardiac risk is based on the tolbutamide data now imagine tolbutamide is not being used anywhere in the world yes there is concern of hypoglycemia which is very modest and weight gain i think you know uh, this gain mentioned here needs to be changed and possibly will change in the next guideline now we have our own rssdi esi recommendations published early this year and again this recommends a patient centric approach choice of anti diabetic agent should take into account patient's general health status and associated medical conditions and for all type 2 diabetes patients the first line is metformin after that the hierarchy of therapy is depicted in the clockwise manner in this circle and if you see the patients who have financial constraints or severe hyperglycemia su remains the first choice you know in these patients and su are one of the choices in all other category of patients also except where there is high risk of hypoglycemia so su's still you know appear as one of the important agents and now i'll show you very compar simple comparison between su's and newer oral agents which is sglt2 inhibitor and dpp4 long term data we have maximum long term experience with sulfonyl ureas reduction in chronic complications we have only sulfonyl ureas as monotherapy data showing a reduction in chronic complication we don't have drug reduction complications that are with any of the newer agents reduction in cardiovascular risk when used as monotherapy again data is only with sulfonyl ureas sglt2 and glp1 or dpp4 inhibitors have data as add on to standard care long term safety we have decades of experience using sulfonyl ureas adverse events except for modest uh, hypoglycemia risk we hardly see any modest you know adverse events with sulfonyl ureas everybody including general practitioners use sulfonyl ureas and very comfortably and cost is a big big advantage especially in indian conditions where uh, you know a patient has to pay out of pocket and more than 70% of our patients are not very well off so to sum up my presentation modern sulfonyl ureas remain an important option as add on to metformin for diabetes management they have high efficacy in lowering glucose they have long term safety data they are safe in cardiac and renal patients they reduce long term microvascular and macrovascular complications they are economical offer the ease of oral administration virtually no interaction with other oral agents the beta cell exhaustion and weight gain are actually theoretical anxieties and you know should not be considered any more and hypoglycemia is actually too much of an effect of drug rather than a side effect So with this, I will close my presentation. Thank you so much for being patient listeners on the other side, and I'll be happy to take any questions. I think we will be at the end of uh, this presentation, this session. You can invite the next speaker, Dr. Rajesh. Yes. May I get the information about the next speaker? Yes. Dr. Tejesh is the next speaker. Someone from the RX events to share the slide of Dr. Tejesh.
Tejas is there. I think Tejas. Yeah, I can start. I can start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tejas, your introduction is very important. You know. Yes. <laughs> I am Doctor Ban. <laughs> I know, but you know. Uh, if I if I could introduce Tejas while the slide is coming. Yes, you can. Yes. Please. Easy. You know. The pleasure of introducing should be given to Dr. Rajesh Delhi also. That was the reason, you know. But you That's can quite all right. That's quite all right. Uh, you may proceed without the slides. <laughs> yep. So, Dr. Tejas Shah is a consultant diabetologist in Mumbai. He has been practicing there for a long time. I think the slide set has come. Uh, I think uh, coming up. He is a known national faculty across all formats. He is a elder brother. He has fished me out in a lot of troubles, but I could say one thing for Tejas, which is over and above any meetings, he's a man with a golden heart. This I can tell up front, and I and I've always seen him, and he has a, he's a man with a golden heart. I think that is what the introduction. I always think of Tejas rather than any degrees, anything that you know one can acquire. I think that would be my introduction. Thank you, thank you so much, Mithun. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, should I share my screen? Yes, yes, please. So we request Alex Evans to yes, please start it. Uh, yeah. First of all, a big, big thank you to dear, dear Bansi for having me and inviting me every time for these meetings. I think uh, if uh, he's a man with I don't know how many thousands of watts of energy that he can, he's able to do meetings after meetings with with such elan and with success. And really, a big congratulations to Bansi Pai for that. And as uh, continuing with what uh, Dr. Bridge Makkar had said, that if there was really an award for outstanding contribution to the field of diabetes this year, definitely would have gone to Bansi Bai for doing so such wonderful events. Thank you, Tejas. And thank you, Mithun, for your words. Uh, my dear brother Mithun is also. So starting off with my presentation, yes, my talk is going to be related to glyce managing glycemic variability with. AGIs in the Indian scenario, as Dr. Prejat said, this is an Abbott symposium, and thank you, Abbott, for the same. So, uh, traditionally, we have been talking, we have been uh, always speaking about fasting blood sugars, postprandial blood sugars, and HbA1c as the gold standards for managing or as the gold standards for assessing the diabetes control in our patients, and that is our aim in order to uh, make sure that uh, we avoid the complications. But as the years have gone by, what we now know is that uh, as we are using better drugs, as we are using newer drugs, we get new knowledge in the field of diabetes. What we now also know that there are certain different parameters related to monitoring, which have also overtaken or which are additionally added, we can say, and that is one of them is glycemic variability. Measurement of glycemic variability is something which is now turned very, very important. So SMBG was the traditional approach that we have been using. We are still using. No doubt it's an equally important aspect to manage, especially as Mithun mentioned in his presentations also, that in an Indian scenario, you cannot uh, overtake these traditional methods. Uh, something which tells us about our daily uh, doses of rapid acting and daily doses of bolus that our patient needs to take, looking at the SMBG at a particular time of the day. But what we know is that SMBG does miss out on certain uh, important uh, peaks and troughs which may occur in between the uh, measurement levels that a patient does. Traditionally, like for example, a patient has a severe hyperglycemic peak at night or a severe hypo at 5 o'clock in the morning or a pre-dinner surge which in, or a post-dinner surge which occurs which might not be recorded in the, in the SMBG. And therefore, there are certain limitations which an SMBG may not be able to detect. Similarly, we know that the role of HbA1c is equally important in our management. The correlation of HbA1c with the glycemic control, the correlation of HbA1c with the chronic complications has developed since the time the DCCT and UKPD came, the data came out and it told us that even a 1% change in HbA1c leads to a a decrease of almost 37% of microvascular complications and a decrease of 14% reduction of myocardial infarction. But also what we now know is that HbA1c again cannot tell us everything. There could be certain uh, aspects which HbA1c misses. It primarily displays only an approximate measure of glucose level but fails to address parameters like hypoglycemia and the variability that may happen in an individual. 
its ability is limited per se to reflect short term glycemic changes and it cannot reflect the postprandial hyperglycemias and fasting hyperglycemia separately sometimes traditionally you there may be two people or two patients with the same hb a1c similarly like you see in this graph here with an a1c of 8.8 one patient may have severe changes so severe hypers and hypoglycemias and because of the hypo and hyper peaks the the a1c may still come out to be 8% and a person with a lower glycemic variability may still have the same hb a1c so sometimes it does not differentiate between two patients having the same hb a1c but misses out on the peaks and troughs there are certain conditions where uh, hb a1c may not be uh, give us the correct picture or may not come out right conditions like severe anemia hemoglobinopathies iron deficiencies pregnancies etc sometimes fail to give us the accurate hb a1c's and may uh, again uh, rule out or the acute glycemic excursions of hypo and hyperglycemias so over a period of time gradually from fasting pp and hb a1c we came to cgms CGMS is something which has become an important tool now in measurement again for our patients. The utility of A1C can be enhanced by with the help of a CGMS is what the consensus in 2000s came out with. A CGMS might again uh, help us to detect the difference uh, in between two individuals or between it may tell us the intraday variation, it may tell us the interday variations. Similarly, if you see the CGM here between two patients at an A1C of 7.7, .7, where there may be uh, severe hyperglycemia peaks occurring here, but uh, more stable glucose range in this patient, may, and it will it has the ability to, to tell us more much better about the glucose variability and patterns and trends. So glycemic variability is something primarily, basically, what we mean is the swing in blood glucose. The broad definition of glycemic variability per se accounts for the intraday and interday glycemic excursion that happens between the hyper and hypoglycemias. And the hyperglycemia and the dysglycemia, the peaks and the nadis that lead to various micro and macrovascular complications related to diabetes. There are now studies which have even come up which tells us that it is not the acute or the chronic persistent rise, but the acute fluctuations in blood glucose, which are more uh, responsible for the severe complications that occur in a person with diabetes. The basic mechanisms why glycemic variability lead to complication is simple. It is the basis of hyperglycemia, the dysglycemia, which is persistently there in individuals. The dysglycemia per se, again, leads to the complications of micro and macrovascular mainly by two methods, the oxidative stress and the excessive glycation that occurs in an individual. The oxidative stress primarily generated by the hyperglycemia. There is an increased mitochondrial ROS production, which leads to a chain of reactions leading to activation of various pathways, the BKC pathway, the diacyl crystal, which all lead to increased microvascular complications like neuropathy and retinopathy. On the other end, the hyperglycemia leads to, again, the advanced glycation of end products production. There is the activation of the polyol and the exosamine and the PKC pathways leading to increased orbital production, which leads to further complications and further increased incidence of neuropathy and nephropathy. So when we look at two in, uh, a patient with a, either a persistent hyperglycemia or a patient with a multiple fluctuations of glycemia, we now know that the multiple fluctuations of glycemia in a same individual could be more harmful than a simple episode of severe acute hyperglycemia or a more chronic stable hyperglycemia. And this has been proved in clinical trials with the help of CGMS also and its correlation with its micro and macrovascular complications. There are several important studies which came out, which again uh, gave impact, uh, showed us the evidence regarding the impact of variability and its implications. The, the data from DCCT trial, which when they correlated the SMBG data, the seven point SMBG data showed that there is an increased association with CV risk. The Verona diabetes study, again, which was a study which mainly looked at the epidemiology and the prevalence in a certain group of population from a Verona city, showed that glycemic variability had a greater effect than degree of the metabolic control on, surviving, on survival in elderly group of population here. It looked at around us more than 5,000 population in this. A Dove study, which was again a study done in the elderly group of population, laid stress of importance of hypoglycemia and its relation to glucose variability and its impact on cardiovascular risk. So, 
over a period of time what changed was that in spite of the uh, the data being there with glycemic variability there was still a very different ways of measurement of variability the standardization was not there and many clinical trials still interpreted the variability differently so in 2017 and 19 came out the standard uh, the consensus came out regarding the time in range and it uh, put uh, the the time in range it was identified as a metric of glycemic control that provides more accessible information than a1c alone the time in range mainly it includes three important measurements it includes the percentage of readings and the time per day within the target range it includes the time below the target range and the time above the target range and so the primary goal of therapy or primary goal of good control is to have the maximum amount of time in the time in range or tir while reducing the amount of time below range or the time above range so <clears throat> when we talk about time in range what has been standardized is a, is a level of 70 to 180 is more or less standardized by the consensus as the time in range or what should be the range for most of the group of population sometimes uh, in certain population like pregnancy and elderly that range can change the time in range is the amount time above the target range of 180 again that is split into 3 from 180 to 250 is considered to be a mild top 250 and above is considered to be severely above and uh, and and the stage 3 is where the patient may have complications like ketoacidosis similarly the time in below range is something below 70 where 70 to 54 is considered as grade 1 54 and below is severe and grade 3 is where patients may require an external support or assistant to uh, revive there was some there is some confusion or there was some discussion regarding the importance of time in range and its association with complications because there are not enough studies which showed that the time in range is directly associated with prevention of complications so this was a paper which was published very very recently in 2019 which talked about the which looked at the data from dcct they looked at the incidence of retinopathy and microalbuminuria in patients who had done the smbg profile seven time point smbg profile uh, where in the dcct study they did the smbg profile they did uh, micro retinopathy assessment every six months and microalbumin every year and what they found out that for every 10 per point percent or 10 point change in the time in range the association of myretinopathy increased by almost 64 percent and association of microalbuminuria by 40 percent almost that means the amount of the number of times the person remains about the time in range the chances of retinopathy and microalbuminuria clearly increased over a period of time there was a direct relation between time in range and a1c put forth by consensus if you look at this two studies in type 1 and type 2 individuals where it has assessed that if a person is, say remains in 70% of the time in time in range where it has a correlation to a1c of approximately 7% while if the person is only at 20% time in time in range the so the a1c comes to somewhere around 9.4 so time in range is where more than 70% is what type 1 diabetics and type 2 diabetics should aim for and every 10% increase in time in range is associated with around 0.5% increase in a1c and uh, around 0.8% increase in a1c in type 2 diabetics so in the consensus in 2019 put forth specific levels for special group of people so in type 1 and type 2 70% of the time you should be in time in range where the range time in range is 70 to 180 Uh, approximately uh, the percentage of readings should be less than 4% in the time below range less than 1% for below 54 and for elderly the time in range again differs 50% of the time should be in the time in range of 70 to a180 because of the increased risk of hypoglycemia pregnancy the targets are different the range is brought down to 70 to 140 and almost 90% of the time it should be in the time in range so this is the broad summary of the targets in different population is what has been put forward as you see here pregnancy around more than 90% of the time you in gestational diabetics and type 2 you should be in time in range of 870 to 140 while in elderly the changes are different 50% in time in range here between 70 to 180 this is what a classical agp report should look like where it should give a picture about a percentage of time in range depending on how high or low the patient has remained it should mention about the ambulatory glucose profile with a summary of glucose values to be given and overall the daily glucose profiles also should be mentioned so that the patient can assess 
Now coming to postprandial hyperglycemia, what we know traditionally is that we eat, or we Indians is a carbohydrate-rich country. Now, if you look at the physiologic profile of uh, in a normal person, more or less uh, a postprandial phase is something which lasts from somewhere around from the time of ingestion food to up to four hours, where the, con the where the conversion of oligosaccharides and disaccharides to monosaccharides takes place. The post-absorptive phase is from the end of the postprandial phase, that is from four hours to approximately 10 hours, where the hepatic glucose output takes over and the absorption of glucose uh, in the circulation takes place. And so traditionally, the fasting period actually comes in the last two to three hours of the day only. So if the person is eating, say, more than three meals a day, traditionally he spends almost eight to 12 or more than 14 hours of the time in the postprandial period. And that's why the postprandial period becomes very, very important when we are looking at us controlling the blood sugars. Per se, when a person eats three meals a day, it's the post-breakfast, the post-lunch and the post-dinner peaks or the excursions which happen in an individual that we see normally. And they are the ones which we are trying to bring it down. Glycemic variability and PPG, again, is something which we look beyond a traditional control. The postprandial excursion which takes place keep increasing if the patient is eating especially more carb meals in a day. The duration of postprandial hyperglycemia per se contributes to the chronic hyperglycemia and the magnitude of postprandial rise that happens directly affects the glucose variability. So this is more or less like a vicious cycle where a person if has support if has a higher fasting glucose will traditionally have a higher postprandial peak or high post breakfast and a post lunch peak. So similarly, the, there will be a higher bedtime glucose will ultimately lead to a higher fasting glucose and invariably leading to a higher HbA1c. So the link between glycemic variability and PPG is direct. The reduction in fasting and postprandial blood sugar is what we want to achieve. Reduction in HbA1c is want to achieve. And the third important aspect is the reduction in the glucose variability, which is again an equally important aspect. If you look at our Indian diet, and if you ask the diet history of what a patient eats from morning to night, traditionally from breakfast, lunch and dinner, primarily we are eating more and more carbs. It could be from any part of the country, it could be a North Indian eating a paratha or a South Indian eating an idli or a West Indian eating a chapati or a, from anywhere. It is traditionally carb-rich diet which a person consumes. There is less of multigrain, there is less of low glycemic index food, there is less of uh, high magnesium calcium intake happening in these individuals. And therefore, the rich carbohydrate accounts for the 90% of total variability that happens and that's the reason we get the higher glycemic response. Traditionally, we want to curb this high, uh, surge in blood glucose. By one thing is by changing the diet pattern. Very low carb diets, again, are not recommended as we know in diabetics, and they are not something which are very easy to follow. We need drugs specifically which target postprandial blood sugars better. The conventional anti-diabetic therapies with all the armentarum that we have, uh, the IDF recommends the goal of not to exceed 140. The ADA and uh, RSSDI recommends the traditional patients with uh, the postprandial goal of less than 180, more or less. Uh, reduction of fasting glucose, reduction of A1C, and controlling the PPG, all three are equally important. Alpha glucosidase per se have become an important tool for us to manage or to reduce the postprandial blood sugars. They have a role mainly because they work in a different pattern. They reduce the intraday and interday glucose variability. They have effect. They are effective as monotherapy in especially newly diagnosed patients. Studies have been done with alpha glucosidase in patients even with impaired glucose tolerance, and they have shown to have a reduction in terms of progression to diabetes. They can be easily combined with OHAs and insulin. They have no relation in terms of secretion of insulin, and therefore cannot cause hypoglycemia or weight gain. They, as we know, they work mainly by delaying the absorption of carbohydrates. They can delay the conversion of uh, oligosaccharides and disaccharides to monosaccharides by binding to the alpha glucosidase enzymes. And therefore, in the trend, traditionally in yeah, Indian rich diets, they are the ones which really bring down or the curb the rise in postprandial blood sugars. The, the amount of postprandial reduction that is normally seen is somewhere around 45 to 50 milligrams in most of the patients when we use this drug. Uh, uh, in combination with other therapies. So moglipose per se is a drug we know is used in combination with all oral drugs and insulin. It is a first line drug per se in patients with excess postprandial levels. It causes a greater reduction in PPG and then have shown an additional HbA1c reduction of 0.3 to 0.4 and has a better safety compared 
profile is coming when we compare it to acarbose and miglitol in terms of the side effects like gastrointestinal flatulence and diarrhea that uh, use happens more with acarbose and miglitol one recent study to end with uh, with alpha glucoside is inhibitors done in 2020 this was a study mainly to assess the effects of coclibose as an add on therapy on the daily glycemic excursion in type 2 diabetic patients who are already on metformin and sulfonylureas the primary aim of this study was to look at the uh, glycemic excursions, the effect on, on mage of Voglibos and the reduction of postprandial blood sugars. Uh, patients, around 100 patients were enrolled in this study uh, on a stable dose of metformin or metformin plus sulfonylurea combination with an A1C of more than 7 or had to have two readings of more than 140 of postprandial sugars. CGMS was done at various intervals during before starting the study, during the maintenance phase and the follow-up phase. The patients were called at 14 day and at 14 week interval at the end of, and at the end of the study at the six months. Uh, subjected to Voglibos 0.2 milligrams or 0.3 milligrams two or three times a day. Showed a significant lowering of glycemic excursion at day 14 as well as day week 14 with Voglibos arm when it was added to metformin SUs or with metformin. Overall, it showed a difference in terms of timing range also, a significant increase in percentage time spent with the target glucose range and a significant decrease in percentage time spent with the target glucose range or in the above range. The mean PPG area under curve also was significantly lower in the Voclibos arm during the three hours following mean, which clearly showed the better effect. And the MAGE and the HbA1c, which was assessed at the end of the study, showed a significant difference from baseline from 7.5 to 6.9. And the MAGE was also considerably reduced in the Voglibos plus metformin and SUR. So to conclude, Voglibos therapy was associated with an increase in time spent within the target range of 70 to 180, with no further increase in <laughs> hypoglycemia and weight gain. Voglibos therapy is an add-on to metformin and metformin plus SU. It reduces glycemic variability. It reduces the lowering of fasting and HbA1c and reduced blood glucose level throughout 24 hours as was seen in this study and can be considered as a safe and effective add-on option in type 2 diabetes. Thank you very much. So that was a very lucid presentation. And I think question answer we will keep uh, at the end. And uh, we will proceed for the uh, next uh, session. May I have the uh, bio data of Dr. Fatak, please? Our last uh, overall diabetic care symposium is focusing on our Indian practical aspects. So the speaker, Dr. Sanjeev Pathak, is the founder of Vijayaratna Diabetes Diagnosis and Treatment Center in Ahmedabad. And he is one of the most reputed diabetologists and metabolic physician of Gujarat. He is the first diabetologist in India. He is a director of Juvenile Diabetic Association in Ahmedabad, Joint Secretary of Gujarat Diabetes Association in Ahmedabad, President of PA. Principal Dr. Telly, you, you can skip it. Yes. Okay, so I think Dr. Sanjeev Fatak is quite known to all of us. Over to Dr. Fatak, please. Sanjeev Fatak is nationally known, so no need no, for no, no, no. you know. No, my introduction looks so small in presence of all these big uh, faculties. That's why I deliberately decided not to. No, no, no. <laughs> Come on. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. And my very, very sincere apologies for not being visible, probably because of some problem with my uh, webcam of the laptop. I tried to fix it with Hardik also, but no fault from his end, probably some problem with my laptop. I hope I am audible and I hope my screen can also be shared. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me share my screen. Tell me, my, is my screen visible? Yes, yes, it is visible. It is All visible, right. sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you very much. And congratulations, uh, Dr. Banshi Sabu, a very close friend, just like a brother. And whatever I say for this Diacon conference or for Banshi Sabu, I'm 
sure that it is going to be an understatement because he continues to exceed all the expectations in all the meetings, whether they are real meetings or whether they are virtual or whether they are hybrid meetings and sets the new bar every time only to be broken by Bansi himself. So I'm very glad that uh, we all are here on this virtual platform uh, towards the end of this year. And I'll be talking about management of Indian diabetic dyslipidemia, meeting the goals to save lives. Uh, my disclosure is this is an AstraZeneca sponsored uh, symposium. Uh, and I'm going to talk about rosuvastatin and the impact of lipids on our Indian diabetic patients. Well, we know that there are so many risk factors for our Indian diabetic patients. Male, age, the family history, whether you are uh, living in a city or a small town or in a rural place, how much centrally obese you are, and whether you are having comorbidities like hypertension along with diabetes, and what is your income status? Because income status also governs the amount of stress that you are going to get in your day-to-day -day life. But amongst all this, probably dyslipidemia has emerged and has remained as one of the most important factors that can be modified so as to reduce the cardiovascular risk, not only of the diabetic patient, but also of the non-diabetic population. The typical Indian phenotype we know, we are having high insulin resistance compared to the Caucasians. We have greater abdominal obesity, higher waist circumference, and the characteristic atherogenic dyslipidemia, where we have high TG, low HDL, VLDL also because of high TG and high small dense LDL in spite of a relatively normal looking LDL. This all leads not only to the susceptibility of diabetes but also cardiovascular disease especially the coronary artery disease. So at lower BMI because of high central obesity and other insulin resistance factors we have more cardiovascular disease. Very importantly we have high waist circumference, high waist to hip ratio, low level of adipokine and high plasma leptin, low rate of glucose disposal. And because of all this, we have increased insulin resistance and that is coupled with impaired insulin secretion also. So not only we are having more insulin resistance, but our beta cells are also having problem. And this leads to more susceptibility of diabetes and ultimately cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, in spite of so many new drugs available, still the control of HbA1c remains elusive in our Indian population. Also globally, the HbA1c average is about 8, 8.1. In India, it is about 8.6, the average HbA1c. And uh, in spite of the different new agents available, the overall control has not much improved. The actual target according to ADA is less than seven, according to ACE is less than 6.5. And we have agents which do not cause hypoglycemia. We should be trying to achieve less than 6.5, even six. Normalize the blood sugar, achieve normal glycemia, so as to reduce the cardiovascular as well as the microvascular complications. So there is definite need for appropriate treatment of Indian diabetics, both from the glycemic point of view, as well as the lipid point of view. Needless to say, blood pressure control also plays an extremely important role in governing the cardiovascular risk of our diabetic patients. So in spite of the therapies available, there is a significant inertia. And this article was published by Mohan and Kamlesh Kunti uh, in the uh, last uh, decade that patient-related as well as the clinician-related factors, the inertia because of us as well as by the patients leads to inappropriate control, undesirable control, and that leads to inadequate control that leads to a lot of complications. We very well know the consequences of the delayed intervention. And this is a very important slide you might have seen several times, but I'll take just one minute to describe this. This is one patient population where the HbA1c was brought down within six months and then maintained below seven for next five years. Compared to that, this is a set of population where HbA1c control was not achieved initially, 
and thereafter hbavc was intense treatment was intensified near normal target was achieved about 7 but the difference lies here somewhere here between 6 and 12 months and this is the period which i always call power play of diabetes if there is power play in cricket it is in the first 10 15 overs if there is power play in diabetes it is in the first one year if you do not control intensively you are going to build up a very bad glycemic memory bad glycemic legacy which at the end of 5.3 years in this meta analysis showed significantly increased risk of mi stroke heart failure as well as the composite of all these three so not only blood pressure and lipid control are important but also the blood sugar control is extremely important early on so as to have a better and better uh, cardiovascular outcome let me try again whether i am visible or still i am invisible yes so this bad glycemic legacy is the driver of late diabetes related complications all of us know this very well so early and appropriate treatment is required for both and hypertension also we'll dwell upon dyslipidemia today and the dyslipidemia status in our indian patients you can see that the prevalence of dyslipidemia is about 80% in our study in our clinic coming patient study it is about 90 patient 90% which means abnormal it of one of the three may be elevated ldl or low hdl or elevated triglyceride and that is found in about 80 to 90% of our diabetic patients in spite of giving statin because they are not prescribed in the appropriate dose only about 50% of the patients achieve the ldl goal that is given to them and in spite of combination therapy being given only about 54% achieve the goal which means the things do not improve even if you give another agent along with statin and the best way is obviously to increase the dose of statin or give the proper intensity statin right from the word go so as to achieve the ldl target so we need to understand the appropriate treatment for the indian diabetic epidemic patients in comparison with the europeans we develop cardiovascular disease a decade earlier 10% of the heart attacks occur in indians below the age of 40 years and 52% occur about uh, below the age of 70 years so before the age of 70 about 50% of the cardiovascular events that are going to happen in the lifetime they occur at a relatively young or middle age and not in the old age in the inter heart study also this epidemia appeared to be the strongest contributor of acute myocardial infarction in indians so this epidemia and mainly ldl though there has been some studies done in scandinavia and uh, spain recently published in jcc and lancet i think they have shown the importance of triglyceride and vldl but still ldl because of the robust data available with it remains the most important as well as the modifiable risk factor that can govern the cardiovascular event rate several trials and the meta analysis of these trials have shown that if you reduce ldl by about 39 mg by statin we can reduce 21% risk of the major cardiovascular events if it is a major coronary event 24% reduction revascularization 24% stroke 15% any vascular death 12% any death 9% and overall events 21% so 21% reduction if you reduce ldl by about 39 this figure may be even better if the ldl reduction is done more intensively what do the guidelines suggest well the guidelines now suggest aim to reduce 50% ldl and ldl still remains and is going to remain the primary target of the lipid lowering therapy lower is better and that has been proven in several trials both in diabetics as well as in the non diabetics both emphasize the esc as well as the acc emphasize 50% or more lowering of ldl and also intensify specific value of ldl to trigger further clinical action very importantly we should be calculating one of the score the european score also known as score or the accah agar suggested score that is acvd myself once in dharmendra we published a paper on 
comparison of different scores in our Indian subsets. And we found that not only ASCVD, but probably the Q-Risk or the JBS probably more resembles or more represents our population as far as the cardiovascular risk is concerned. But at least follow one of the scoring system. What do the ESC guidelines say regarding the risk of our diabetic patient? If the score is less than one, it is low risk. If young patient with type 1 diabetes less than 35 years of age or type 2 diabetes less than 50 without any uh, other risk uh, factor, he is a moderate risk. Most of our patients follow fall in this category, either high risk or very high risk. Diabetes with target organ damage or diabetes duration of 10 years or diabetes with any additional risk factor falls into high risk. And diabetes with target organ damage is a very, very high risk patient or extreme risk patient. According to the ESC guidelines, very high risk for diabetes is one. We'll focus on the diabetic portion here. Diabetes with target organ damage or more than three risk factors or more than 20 years of type 1 diabetes is very high risk. And high risk is person is more than 10 years diabetes without target organ damage or another additional risk factor. What do ACC guidelines recommend for 50% LDL reduction to achieve optimal cardiovascular risk reduction? If LDL is more than 190, obviously high intensity statin is recommended. There is a class one recommendation. And if the patient is having diabetes and age 40 to 75, whatever the LDL is, regardless of LDL, moderate intensity statin is recommended. I'm not going into details about the non-diabetic patients here because we are going to talk about mainly diabetic dyslipidemia. This is again a very important article published in European Heart Journal 2016 that if you achieve 20 to 30% LDL reduction, you are not going to achieve a significant cardiovascular risk reduction. But if you achieve more than 50% risk reduction from the baseline, you can have about 50 to 60% risk reduction. You can see that if LDL is reduced by more than 50% from the baseline, the risk from 11.2 goes down to 4.8, which means 57% reduction in the event rate. Compared to only 30% or 40% reduction will lead to a reduction of about 20 to 30% or at most 40%. But if you reduce the LDL by 50%, you can achieve almost 60% reduction of the cardiovascular risk. And this is, I think, a very, very important observation from all the studies done on statin that our target should not be a number only, but 50% or more from the baseline. And that obviously changes the number needed to treat. Routinely in the studies, you would have found that the number needed to treat to prevent one event or mortality is 63 if you achieve just 20% reduction of the LDL from the baseline. But if it is 50%, the number needed to treat goes down to 26. So again, a very important number whenever you are treating any patient with statin. Statin obviously are recommended as the first drug for LDL. Obviously, there's no doubt, no debate in that. How about triglycerides? Well, even with triglycerides, of course, when triglycerides are more than 500, our priority is to prevent pancreatitis. And that stage, probably patient may deserve a fibrate or some other therapy. But if the triglycerides are between 150 and 500, still statin and LDL lowering remains the goal. In 2016, it was stated that statin may be considered as the first drug. 2019 onwards, 2020, 2021, the guidelines clearly recommend statin as the first line drugs, even when the triglyceride is more than 200, even when the LDL is normal. What do ESC guidelines say? Even the ESC guidelines also say that even if the triglyceride remains high, statins are recommended both for type 1 and type 2, and before introduction of any combination therapy, we must first be using the maximally tolerated dose of statin. If it is a atorvastatin, we may use 80 milligram. 
or if it is rosuvastatin, 20 to 40 milligram. And obviously, because rosuvastatin can be used in lower dose, giving more benefit and equal degree of safety, rosuvastatin has become much preferred molecule these days. To the ADA 2020 and now the 2021 revision also recommend less than 40 years and 40 transfers for to 30 for Indians because as we already stated diabetes are uh, the diabetic patients in India develop cardiovascular disease a decade earlier so less than 30 no ASCVD and no other additional risk factor probably you may still go away without setting but otherwise these patients require statin, and especially if they are having cardiovascular disease, high dose statin, high intensity statin. More than 40 years, even in absence of ASCVD score of less than 20, uh, still they are deserving moderate intensity statin. What according to ADA 2020-21, high dose or high intensity statin, and what is moderate intensity? High intensity for Ruzua is 20 to 40, Atorva 40 to 80. And moderate intensity Ruzua 5 to 10, Atorva 10 to 20. We will not discuss about the other statins because we rarely use them in India. What do 2020 and now 21 guidelines say for other combination therapies? Statin plus fibroid not been shown to improve atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease outcomes and generally not recommended. Same thing is repeated in 2021. Statin plus niacin, again, no benefit. The only supplement is about the Ecosa pentoic acid based upon the reduced study that if the triglyceride remains high, addition of EPA may be considered in patients with high triglyceride after uh, the uh, appropriate statin therapy. Now among statin, which statin we should choose? There have been several trials which have compared atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, but I'll discuss just one here, the Uranus study in diabetic patients. Age above 18 years, LDL at baseline more than 127. Patients were randomized either to rosuvastatin or atorvastatin, initially started with 10 milligram of both or either other, and then intensified based upon the LDL reduction. And you can see that with rosuvastatin 10 to 40 milligram compared to atorvastatin 10 to 80 milligram, the median dose was 10 to 20 for rosuva, 40 to 80 for atorva. The LDL reduction was much better with a statistically significant difference of p-value of 0 0.001 or less with rosuvastatin. HDL also went up with rosuvastatin. Triglyceride was similar. LDL-HDL ratio definitely in favor of rosuvastatin and non-HDL also. And according to the Indian lipid guidelines, non-HDL along with LDL is a co-primary uh, modifiable risk factor. So all these are statistically significant. LDL, uh, the LDL-HDL ratio and the non-HDL in favor of rosuvastatin compared to atorvastatin. And the number of patients who could achieve the goal at that time, the goal was 115, 81% in the Rosuva group and 65% in the Atorva group. And if the goal was less than 100, 65% in the Rosuva group, only 33% in the Atorva group. So if your target is lower, and which should be, obviously Rosuva statin is going to give you much more success rate compared to Atorva statin with equal degree of safety. And amongst the rosuvastatin, we now have different brands available in our country, but the innovator brand obviously has the advantage. Not only the efficacy range will be better, but the safety because of the impurities associated in some of the brands may play a key role in increasing the side effects, especially the myelia or some other side effects. Is there an evidence that compared to generics, innovators will have better outcomes. And this is a study from Spain where it was shown that compared to generics, the cardiovascular event rate was less in the uh, patients who were on the innovator agents. Uh, the adjusted all-cause death was significantly higher with generics and lower with the uh, uh, innovator brand, meaning thereby that, especially in the cardiovascular risk reduction, 
the risk of side effects as well as the efficacy probably is towards the use of the innovator brand compared to the generic brand. Why this occurs? Probably in the statins and especially in the Rosua statin, the impurities of lecton, anti-isomer, the phycoito acids are probably not taken care of. And these impurities may be responsible for affecting the stability of the drug, increasing the side effect of the drug, and also reducing the efficacy of the drug. We are very much aware about what happened with the methylated impurity in the generics with atrovastatin. And we are also now aware about the uh, NDMA impurity of metformin. So definitely these impurities play an important role in deciding the efficacy as well as the safety or the side effects of the drugs. So to conclude, we know very well that the risk of CVD is higher in Indian patients. And the most important modifiable factor for that is reduction of the LDL cholesterol. Guidelines recommend setting of LDL goals and setting as the first line therapy to reach these goals set for the specific level of risk. Guidelines also suggest to consider intensification of statin to the maximum tolerated dose before going to the combination therapy. Rosua statin helps reduce LDL by about 52%, TG by 21% in diabetic dyslipidemia patients. And to have optimum efficacy, probably the original statin may have an edge over the generic brands. This I would end here and thank you very much, Diacarcon, all the team, including Hardik. And it's over to you, Chairperson Dr. Rajesh Teli. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fatak. It was indeed a very lucid and uh, uh, important uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to know. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we can. So we have some questions. I think if I could ask a question, Sanjeev, sir. Yes. sir yes. You know, a lot of molecules, a lot of companies have now Rosuva statin. When they walk down in our clinic with uh, Rosuva statin, is there something in the clinic that can help us discriminate or ask him some particular questions that will help us decide that we should prescribe or not prescribe. Because Rosuva statin is, is you know, a lot of companies make it. I don't know how many companies make it. Yes, definitely. The innovator brand, obviously, uh, in our clinical practice also, we have found that uh, switching to the innovator brand when patient is having myalgia mm -hmm. has helped. Whether this also translates into better reduction of LDL, we have no idea. But regarding the myalgia, maybe it is placebo also uh, can cause myalgia. But uh, in my clinical practice, I have seen that switching from another statin to Crestor has helped some of the patients, not all. Okay. So we need a big study for our Indian patients comparing the innovator brand versus the generic. If there is a significant price difference, yes, obviously, then uh, price will play a vital role. But if it is not, then it is better to prescribe the innovator one. Okay. Sir. Dr. Sanjeev, one question from my side. What do you think about the glitazars and the statin combination in a mixed type of a dyslipidemia, particularly in Indian patients? Because high triglycerides are very much common, as Dr. Makkar's study has also shown that high triglycerides are very much common in Indian. Yeah, and... and Statins alone cannot reduce a triglyceride to the level of 150. And glitazars are giving good promising results. What do you think about it? Uh, yes, it's a very good question. Glitazars definitely are very good drugs for reduction of triglyceride, but there is no cardiovascular outcome. We do not have any idea whether by giving saroglitazar there will be reduction of the cardiovascular risk. Uh, Accord lipid also for phenofibrate was partially a failure because even in that trial, reduction of triglyceride 
helped only those patients who had baseline triglyceride of more than 204 and HDL of less than 35. Having said that, I still believe that for our Indian patients, fibrates or glitazars may have some role to play, but the evidence is not in favor of that. The only evidence which is there for triglyceride reduction has come from the reduce it trial, where there was a very, very significant reduction of cardiovascular event rate in statin-treated patients with a p-value of less than 0.00000, I think six zeros and then. So if you want to believe in that, probably EPA is the only agent which has shown that reducing triglyceride has reduced the cardiovascular event rate. Otherwise, in combination with statin, azetamide is probably a very good drug, very cheap also. Very selected patients may need a PCSK9 inhibitor. Otherwise, azetamide, I think, is a very good combination, not only for reducing triglycerides along with statin, but also for robust reduction of LDL. But I would like to have opinion from Dr. Makkar and Dr. Tejas and other, uh, so many experts are here on this panel today. Makkar, sir, your views. See, there is uh, very limited data showing that reducing uh, triglyceride has any direct benefit. It is only the reduced trial which showed that reducing triglycerides using, uh, mm, what is the molecule? I have forgotten the name. Uh, Ecosa pentonyl, which is the constant, yeah, Ecosa pentonyl, which was the very concentrated form and purified form of EPA, right? And doesn't have DHA with this, showed a reduction in the CV outcomes. But if you look at the other trials, combining uh, fibrates did not show any benefit. The um, uh, isonizide, no, not. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, other trials, acid. No, no, other trials using uh, focusing on uh, HDL raising or lowering TGs did not show any CV benefits. In the ACCORD study, where they had combined, you know, statin with the uh, phenofibrate and looked at the outcomes, there was a subset of patients, which is the typical Indian atherogenic dyslipidemia, where people, type 2 diabetes patients who had. Uh, TG more than 203 and HDL less than 34 had a benefit of combining uh, statin and phenofibrate. Outside that class, we have not seen benefits of using phenofibrate. I, I want to ask a question to all the three speakers, uh, just from my you know understanding. Uh, Makkar sir, Sanjeev sir and Tejas bhai. See, most of our patients, we generally do fasting lipid profile and the only parameter that actually changes is the triglycerides. Yes. But the whole day the patient is on postprandial state. Uh, so, you know, 12 hours is on prandial state, but we are actually working on the fasting uh, triglycerides. So he may be running the whole day at 300, uh, we don't know what, uh, you know, or 320 or 250, 280. So should we actually be doing lipid profiles non-fasting? So very important question, uh, Mithun. I, in fact, have done uh, almost uh, uh, for last three years, I have done multiple talks on whether we should be doing a fasting sample for diabetes patients at all, right? Because this uh, puts a lot of burden for patient. They have to visit the lab, empty stomach. For the lab, every patient comes in the morning. So there is a congestion of the patient, right? And for what you need a fasting sample, you don't need, what are the routine tests that you are doing? CBC, you don't need fasting, liver function, kidney function, thyroid profile, uh, blood sugar, you don't need fasting because patient can do with a glucometer, A1C levels, vitamin D, B12, anything, you don't need a fasting sample. So except for lipids, which is, you know, the labs are also hyping that you come 12 hours fasting. There is no use. There is enough data since 2009, which has accumulated. There are there, there was a total population-based study involving more than 3 lakh patients comparing fasting and non-fasting samples from Denmark. And there is a study, I've forgotten the exact number of patients, but multiple patients, huge number of patients, they compared between one hour from fasting to 16 hours from fast, you know, last meal. So one hour post meal to 16 hours po post meal, that means 16 hours fasting also, the difference was only 15% maximum in triglyceride. There was no difference in the LDL level, which is the target for treating our patients. So after that, European society has given a guideline that 
you should know whether the fast you are doing a fasting sample or postprandial sample if it is a random sample then tg cutoff should be 175 not 150 and if the person has tg more than 300 then you ask for a fasting sample again you don't need to do a fasting sample routinely so in my practice i am not doing any fasting samples for last almost 7 years just to add Yeah. Yeah. So to add on that, see, our aim to treat triglycerides, we should remember, is now primarily is only to prevent pancreatitis. Yes. The uh, we are not looking at reduction of cardiovascular disease per se at all. Now we know with enough studies that it the increased triglycerides are not directly related to cardiovascular disease. So a triglyceride level of more than four hundred, five hundred something, which poses an increased risk of pancreatitis, is the level which we are going to target and which we are going to bring it down to by using whatever drugs we want to. And so a patient, whether he comes in a fasting state or a postprandial state, is fine. But if the triglycerides are going to be in that range of about five hundred, we are going to treat it. But below that, we are going to control his blood sugars first. We are going to bring down his blood sugars. That's how the triglycerides are automatically going to come down. And otherwise, we are not going to add a separate drug for triglycerides. And most uh, guidelines recommend first target is LDL, second target is non-HDL, which in any case takes care of TG as well as HDL. Mm-hmm. You don't need to go beyond that actually. So I agree with both. I agree with both the experts. Uh, only thing. uh whenever you are doing non fasting lipid profile which we do routinely yeah. the ldl should not be calculated one it should be yeah. direct ldl should, right? otherwise there would be a lot of errors yes yes we should ask for direct ldl that direct. is important but <clears throat> in that situation also uh, dr fatak non hdl is a very good clue yes absolutely non hdl for our indians is a co primary yes yeah, so so that takes care of most of the issues with lipid profile analysis i think So I think that's a good tip that Makar sir you have given that fifteen percent variation we can accept in a prandial one seventy five. तक ठीक है मतलब so one seventy five is the cutoff for non fasting sample. Non fasting sample. Yes. It is. It, it is. There is a European guideline published in two thousand seventeen. So my question is, sir, if it's three hundred, if non fasting. So is, then it is recommended if it is three hundred more than three hundred, uh, you know, uh, TG and the glucose is already controlled. If the patient then, has then, hyperglycemia, you are not looking at triglyceride. Exactly. Okay. Once you control tri- hyperglycemia, then only you will look at triglyceride. Absolutely. And if it is still more than three hundred, then you repeat a fasting sample. That is indication for doing a fasting lipid profile. Rajesh, sir, any more questions? There is a question uh, by Dr. Hazra from uh, Agra. He has asked that uh, it is for Dr. Makkar. Do you agree that glycoside SR is superior to widely promoted glimepiride? What is your opinion, sir? I think there is no head-on, uh, you know, comparison between these two molecules, and both these molecules, in their independent studies, have enough data to support their efficacy, safety, and uh, long-term durability. And both have, you know, the experimental data showing that they have, you know, benefits like. Uh, oxidative um, uh, reducing oxidative stress or uh, lower risk of hypoglycemia they act through different mechanism one acts through a different receptor other acts through a, a very low affinity for the sur receptor so they also claim that you know the risk of hypoglycemia is low but largely i don't find there is much difference in any of these two molecules and with carolina in place now you know you, you have huge amount of data showing what exactly is the risk of hypoglycemia and i showed you the exact figures 0.5 you know moderate to severe hypoglycemia is only 0.5 per 100 patients here and the severe requiring hospitalization is only 0.2 per 100 patient years so it is not a big risk and we all have been using these molecules now you know so many years and even i am sure you you see around your Uh, self general practitioners using glimepiride and glycoside i think they use more yes. of glimepiride they don't they hardly True. use glycoside they use more of glimepiride most of the time and they don't find any problem there True. Any, thank any, you sir one more important take home message which i feel from dr fatak's talk that just the way we have uh, insulin inertia especially in diabetic patients 
many physicians have stated in inertia because very important message uh, Dr. Fatak has given is irrespective of the LDL level, every patient between 40 to 75 needs a diabetic patient needs a statin. And I think this message we should try to convey to more and more physicians. Dr. Fatak, would you comment on please on this, please? Yes. I remember one statement from David Matthew from Oxford that if you give statin to a diabetic patient in appropriate dose, 50% of your job is done. Yes. Right? I, I the rest of the things will reduce the risk by additional uh, some percentages, but 50% will be done only by the statin. Agreed. Agreed. Very so it is the easiest, most economical, most reproducible and evidence-based practice to and, reduce the cardiovascular risk. Very simple to administer. Simple. You know, you Anyone can. A, you, you just give a pill. Even but if you from use the higher dose. We should reduce it to 30%. 50. Yeah, no, no. So that's what I'm saying. Even risk if you, high risk, it, at least 50%. So the problem is the people are counting that it had come below 100, below 70, no, no, no. below 80. So, so first, thing, first thing is you have to give 30% reduction in LDL which is given by basic dose of step, you know, at Orva statin or Rosua statin very easily. That, after that, you in, have to increase the dose Mr. based you on what you... I am going there. Okay. So, after so, that, you increase the dose. But so, even if you start with the higher dose, you are not doing anything wrong. So, there, it's very exactly. simple to use molecule. Yes. I think one another problem that we face is continuation of statin. The moment the LDL level comes down, the patients are more than eager to stop it. Doctors are more than mm -hmm. eager to stop it. And invariably, you see after two years, again, the LDL level high. So what? that is important. We need to advocate that we need to continue the statin, maybe lifetime, maybe long term, whatever it is. Because so there is worst, no consensus. Worst, how yeah, to I agree. No, no. Worst thing is, you know, what happens is patient goes home, he is improving and somebody tells him, why you are taking so many medications? Then he finds out from the chemist which is sugar medication. So he keeps <laughs> taking sugar medication, stops everything. A usual so problem. In, in practice, now once I give them first prescription, I underline the statin. I tell them if you have to leave any medicine, you leave anything, but don't leave this. Yes. So now they, you know, they they kind of carry that message with them. The problem with the patients that patient used to say Takat ki dawa jahur dena. They don't need anything which will reduce the mortality but Takat ki dawa jahur dena. Dipak sir, Yagdik sir, ye mein aapko apna experience se batata hu. Agar wo kehta hai Takat ki dawa hi. To kuch ho raha hai. और मिथुन सेशन में अपना प्रमोशन करे जा रहा है क्वेश्चन Thank you so much. Good night and happy new year to all of you. And thank you. Many thank thanks you everybody. to everybody. Happy, happy new year. Happy new year. Happy new year. On behalf thank of you. the on behalf of the organizers, I thank everybody, uh, all the speakers, all the chairpersons, all the panelists, and um, happy new year. And I hope next year we'll meet in person. Now, no more virtual yeah. after this. Yeah. We'll meet. We hope person. for the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bye, -bye. So. Bye, bye everybody. Good night. We close the session. Good night. Okay. Thank Have you. happy vaccination. Happy, <laughs> happy vaccination <laughs> as well. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir. I think this is the end of uh, our session and our conference in the day. So we can close our sessions.